Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the OSI model in preparation for your Cisco CCDA exam. First, I will teach you about the OSI model, and then I'm going to give you some challenges within the video so that you can make sure you've absorbed what you need to know for the CCDA exam. Let's just do a quick overview of the OSI model before we dig in. The Open System Interconnection Reference Model is a seven-layer model used in networking. The model specifies layer by layer how information from an application on a network device moves from the source to the destination using a physical medium, and then how it interacts with the software application on that specific network device. So the OSI model defines the network functions required for sending data and divides them into seven unique categories. The physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and then the application layer. You're going to get to know each of these layers in detail in this video. The upper three layers are concerned with application issues such as the user interface for data formatting, and then the lower four layers relate to transport issues such as data transmission and the physical characteristics of the network. The OSI model is a key concept in the networking industry and you must know it by heart in each of the layers in detail because it plays a very important role in the design phase of a network using this modular approach. Obviously you need to know it as well for, for troubleshooting issues as well. So the overall goals of the OSI model are to enhance interoperability and functionality between different applications and vendors. So, for example, a Cisco router can also communicate with a Juniper router or an application that is running on a network that supports IP can communicate to another network that happens to be running, let's say, Apple Talk. The OSI model ensures that everybody can communicate together because it is based on and requires that players on the network adhere to set standards at each layer of the OSI model. So as you can see here, here are the seven detailed layers of the OSI model. And I created this chart for you. And you can download it from howtonetwork.com as well. But this chart will help you study. There are many charts out there, so feel free to Google OSI model and maybe find the one that works best for you. But this one really does lay it out. It shows you all seven layers, one through seven, uh, then the name of that specific layer, so you will need to memorize that for sure, and then the responsibilities for each layer. I give you a high level of overview of each layer's responsibilities, and then the functions. So what is its function? What's it supposed to be doing? Um, what is it supposed to be supporting? And then I give you some examples of how those functions are actually put into use or actually defined. And then next is the data type. Um, the terminology that is used to describe the data then when it's at that level of the OSI model. And then finally the devices that are actually participating at that specific layer of the OSI model. Uh, the fact is, if you memorize this chart, you're going to be well on your way to passing your CCDA exam. But that being said, we still need to dive much deeper so that you have a comprehensive foundation of the OSI model. You'll see how I have it color-coded. The top three layers, five, six, and seven, generally, these are the layers that really tie in with the application itself. And a lot of application-specific information is set here. Now, the lower four layers typically I considered more of the networked layers when you think of actual networking. Although all these layers participate in networking, when you're talking to a network professional, 90% of their job is spent on layers one through four. 95% uh, of their job probably is working at layers one through four. And if there is troubleshooting in the OSI model, oftentimes uh, between layer four and five is where the handoff would would be between the network team troubleshooting versus the application team troubleshooting. 
So if the network team, for example, if they can say, you know what, we can confirm that traffic is passing over the physical layer, we can see that it's being routed at layer three, and we can see it's being received by the TCP port, um, we've done our job, we've transferred your data, you, your port has sent and received it, um, that's where they would hand it off and then the application team would start saying, all right, well now that, we've, now that we've received the data, are we actually handling it correctly? So the color coding there should help you. So let's go ahead and get granular. Let's learn about each of these layers in detail. And let's start with, actually, let's start with the application layer, uh, which is layer seven. Everything at this layer is application specific. That is, this layer supports the application and the end user processes, but also then defines who the communication partners are, uh, quality of service and user authentication, all of these application specific settings are determined here and will be dealt with at the lower layers of the OSI model. This layer provides application services for such thing as file transfers, email, and other networked software services. Next is the presentation layer. This layer provides independence from differences in data representation such as encryption by translating from application to the network format and vice versa. So it's the intermediary between the application and the lower layers of the OSI, OSI model. So this layer works to transform data into the form that the application layer can accept. This layer also formats and encrypts data to be sent across the network which provides freedom from compatibility issues depending on the network you're on. The session layer establishes, terminates, or manages connections between applications. So the session layer will actually set up and then coordinate and then terminate a conversation or dialogue between the applications at each end of the conversation over the network. So it deals with session and connection coordination. Now once we go ahead and scroll over to the examples of each of these layers, I think these are going to look very familiar to you. Examples of applications that run at layer 7 are Telnet or email or a web browser. The presentation layer surely also looks familiar to you in the examples given file types such as JPEG or MPEG or MP4, all of these serve as compression types or ways that the data is actually handled. And then the session layer, these should look familiar to, to you as well, such as SQL communications or Windows operating systems communications. So you can see there are things that you already know about, you just didn't know where they fit in the OSI model. Now all these data types um, are considered a part of the application stream. So when we talk about data type and devices, you know, when we get down to the network layers, these are going to be a bit more unique. But all of these three layers, what they have in common is that they're a part of this application stream, which is why I say this is kind of the demark point between the network and the application. When troubleshooting does occur or when you're designing, oftentimes these higher layers are designed in conjunction with the application team. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the first four layers of the OSI model and these will probably be the ones that look more familiar to you um, in your day-to-day -day job or in your studies because this is where a lot of the very specific network tasks are performed. The transport layer ensures that there is a transparent communication process or transfer of data between the end systems or hosts. So it takes care of error recovery and flow control to ensure that the data transfer has been successfully completed. Layer 4 is the transport layer and that obviously defines uh, ports such as TCP or UDP ports. 
So for example, if we have a PC that is communicating to a website, it's communicating to that website via port 80. And let's say it has multiple browsers, let's say the user has multiple browsers open, they are communicating over and over again over port 80. Now, how does the website or websites know how to communicate back to the user? Well, the user has his own port numbers and they're all different. That way he can maintain three different conversations at the same time to let's say three different servers over port 80 and they can communicate back to the laptop by communicating to individual ports. In this case, we'll just use an example, 65009, 10, and 11. And at this layer two, this is where firewalls participate. So let's say we have a firewall here that's allowing port 80. Any traffic that's coming in for, let's say, port 21, that will be blocked. The firewall will not allow it based on the port number. But any traffic destined for port 80, the firewall will allow it to come in. So, for example, if users need to get to 443, they will not be able to unless the firewall administrator enables port 443 on that firewall. And then when they try to communicate to port 443, it will work. So firewalls play a key role in maintaining security at layer 4. The network layer provides the routing technologies. It uses the logical paths throughout the network to ensure that data is forwarded to the correct location. So such thing as IP addressing and subnetting are handled at this layer. Now the routed layer is probably the most well-known layer, especially if you're in networking. And this actually make sure that packets, for example, here our packet destined for 172.31.1.1 is received by the router, but the router then knows what to do with it at this layer. It then asks, well, what interface do I need to forward this out of? And it will then choose, based on the layer three information of the OSI model, what port to send it out and then forward it accordingly. The data link layer, data packets are encoded and decoded into bits. So it's the intermediary between the network and physical layer. It furnishes transmission protocol knowledge and manages and handles errors at the physical layer, including flow control and frame synchronization. As you know, switches normally participate at layer two and it is broken into two sections, the MAC sublayer and the LLC sublayer. Now you know the MAC sublayer probably very well um, because if you're looking at MAC addresses on a switch, for example, when you're troubleshooting, um, this is the layer that is assisting with your troubleshooting methodology. So for example, we pull up a MAC address and we take a look at the MAC address in the switch. This is the sublayer that we're, we are referring to. The LLC layer is going to allow the communication between layer two and layer three and layer one. It's, the, it's going to allow that communication flow between those two layers. And then finally, the physical layer. This layer conveys the actual bitstream, that is the electrical impulse, light or radio signal through the network at the electrical or mechanical level. So it provides the hardware means of sending and receiving data on a carrier and it includes defining the cable type, uh, network interface cards, and any other physical aspects. So at the physical layer, this is actually where the bits are heading onto the wire. So literally, one, zero, one, zero, et cetera, et cetera, are hitting the wire. So at this layer, all of the other layers from two through seven, all of that information is now transmitted very simply as binary on or off um, over the wire and then when it reaches the destination this will be decoded by the upper layers as appropriate so obviously now that we see these binary numbers hitting the wire we can appreciate what the osi model actually does for us it take it can take this information can pass it all the way back up to an application on a remote system 
So now that you've learned about the first four layers of the OSI model, let's go ahead and take a look at what actually operates at these layers specifically. A lot of it is a lot of this is going to look very familiar, I'm sure. So some examples of what's actually working at layer one is one example would be uh, Cat6 cabling, which surely you've worked with in the past. But again, these are just examples, so it could be a network interface card, it could be um, any type of transport. Uh, that is your physical layer. Next at the data link layer, this should look, next is data link layer, this should look familiar. It's broken into the LLC and the MAC sublayers. Obviously, MAC addresses are something you know about, but now you know where it fits within the OSI model. Next on layer three, um, obviously IP or Apple Talk, but also the routing protocol such as OSPF or BGP. These are all operating at layer three. And then layer four is some examples are your TCP or UDP ports. The many different ports that are used as the channels for communications between applications. Now when data is passing through each of these layers, it does have a unique signifier. So at the physical layer, you've already learned that it's a binary digit. It's one or zero. At layer two, we call them frames. Layer three, we consider them packets. And layer four, it's considered a segment. These are all terms you should know for your CCDA exam. And finally, here are some examples of network devices that run at each of these layers. So at layer one, uh, hubs run at layer one. They're essentially repeaters, uh, network interface cards, Layer 2, switches. Layer 3, routers and firewalls. Um, surely you will do some reading about Layer 3 switches as well, but really this is where the routing functionality comes, or if a firewall is operating at this level, it's filtering on a Layer 3 address only, not the TCP or UDP port number. And then Layer 4 would be typically firewalls are operating at this level, and this is where the filtering has occurred solely on the port. So be prepared to pause the video. Here's your challenge. This chart's going to disappear in about 10 seconds. What I want you to do is, to the best of your ability on a piece of paper, fill out columns 1, 2, 4, and 7. I want to know the layer the name of the layer, the functions within that layer, what it's responsible for, and then the devices that run at that layer. Do your best. Columns 1, 2, 4, and 7. Go ahead and pause the video at this time. So let's pull the chart up again. How did you do? Go ahead and uh, pause the video with this chart up and grade yourself. Now, if you didn't get 100, my advice to you is to keep studying because the OSI model is something you have to know for your CCDA exam, but obviously you need to know it to be a good engineer as well. In this video, which has complemented the CCDA study guide, which How To Network provides for you, you've received a good overview of the OSI model layer by layer. My suggestion to you is do not move on to anything else until you've mastered this because everything else you learn will ultimately in some way shape or form relate back to this model. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we're going to cover the unique attributes of networking devices. This video is the companion to the How To Network CCDA study guide. You will receive instruction on the individual network devices, but you will also be challenged with some exercises to make sure the information is solidified in your memory. 
When it comes to networking technology, it's important to understand the different products that Cisco offers for different solutions, especially when designing LAN and WAN solutions. If you have already watched video 1-1, which covers the OSI model, then you will appreciate how network devices can play a very unique role in a network. If you haven't watched video 1-1, then I encourage you to do so because this information will build off of that video. The three most common network devices in use today are routers, switches, and hubs. But I will also add a fourth, which are firewalls, as they may not necessarily be considered devices used for quote-unquote networking, but they can in fact participate in layer 3 routing of traffic, and they most certainly filter traffic based on layer 3 and 4 qualities. So let's work our way up through the OSI model, starting at layer 1, to learn about the hardware that supports today's networks. At layer 1, we begin with hubs. Hubs became necessary when the need to connect more than two devices first arose, because a cable can only connect two endpoints. Hubs are network devices that operate at this layer and connect multiple devices, which are all on the same local area network. Unlike switches, hubs do not have any intelligence and therefore they do not process packets in any way. They simply forward them. Their main function is to send all the data received on a port to all other ports. So devices receive all the packets that traverse a specific network, even if they are not addressed to them. For this reason, hubs are also called repeaters. Hubs work fine in very small offices or at someone's desk. But imagine if you have 20, 50, or even 100 devices on a network. Using hubs is certainly not efficient. So in order to pr improve performance, especially from a bandwidth and security standpoint, local area networks are divided into multiple smaller LANs called collision domains. And these collision domains are interconnected by a LAN switch. Switches have some intelligence, unlike hubs, because they send data to a port only if the data needs to reach that particular segment. When using switches, only the destination device in a communication flow receives the data sent by the source device. However, multiple conversations between devices connected to a switch can happen simultaneously, as you see here. These are each unique flows that the switch is processing, it's receiving it on one port and forwarding it out the other another and forwarding it out a different port. See the difference between this and hubs is that it's receiving one port, sending it out one port versus all ports. Switching intelligence functions based on the MAC table. The MAC table contains MAC address to port mappings and is populated as traffic traverses the switch. The switch uses that information to build the MAC address table. In this example, a frame is received by the switch, but the switch does not know the location or does not have in its MAC address table the location for this frame. Therefore, it sends the frame out to all ports. Now, ultimately, the server receives it and then forwards it back. And with that information, the switch can then build the MAC table. So the next time that a frame is destined for server C, the switch will know exactly which port it is off of and it will not have to send out the frame to all ports. Now notice that the most important feature of a switch is the separation of collision domains. All the devices on a switch may be on separate collision domains per port, but note that they are all a part of the same broadcast domain. It is routers that separate broadcast domains and switches that separate collision domains. Routers operate at layer 3 of the OSI model and thus they use layer 3 addresses. The primary purpose of a router is to forward traffic to the correct subnet. So a router is consistently looking up destination paths in its routing table 
to understand where to forward the traffic to, that is, out which specific port. Now, as I said earlier, routers break up broadcast domains. Switches do not do that. So, for example, each port on this router is its own separate broadcast domain. This ensures network efficiency so that broadcasts are not forwarded throughout the entire network when they do not have to be. Generally speaking, for each interface you have, a specific subnet is assigned to that interface, and therefore broadcasts for that subnet are limited to that interface only. Now, as a reminder, switches typically connect to routers, and those ensure the segmentation of collision domains. So, for example, if there was an endpoint sending a packet to destination address 192.168.1.10, the router would receive it, and then it would check its routing table. In this case, it looks in its routing table, and it sees that it knows of a subnet 192.168.1.0/24, and that it is located off of Ethernet 0. Therefore, the packet comes in, the router says, I am aware of that destination, and it then forwards it out Ethernet 0, and the host then receives the packet. At a high level, this is the primary function of a router. Now, let's say a router does not have many entries in the routing table, only a default gateway. And that default gateway, in this case, is off of the serial interface, serial 00. That means any packet regardless of destination that is sent to the router will be forwarded to that default gateway. Now this is a very basic description of how routers work. Routers can use static routes, but that's not ideal, especially when you have networks that are quite large. So in this case, we have six routers all interconnected, and to try to manage static routes for all of the possible paths administratively not only would be a burden, but if you had certain static routes pointing to specific routers and beyond that router there was a failure of an interface, due to the static nature of the routes, the routers downstream would not really understand the true topology. Therefore, routers speak to one another and they do that using routing protocols. And the, in this case, the entire routing domain, all six routers, can be a part of a routing protocol such as OSPF, EIGRP, or any of the other routing protocols. And in this way, they are communicating back and forth layer three information. So for example, if an interface went down on a router, that, would, that information would be forwarded to its neighbors, and its neighbors would then forward that information to all of their neighbors. Therefore, the entire domain would quickly be updated with this information. If you effectively have a routing protocol and rolled out to your entire campus, really no static routes should be required. And I want to emphasize one more point. No static routes are desired. Static routes should only be used as a last resort. Next, let's talk about firewalls. Now, please understand, firewalls are not typically considered a networking device when people think of networking devices. They generally think of hubs, switches, and routers. But the fact is, firewalls do operate at layer 3 and layer 4, and they can be used as routed devices, although it's not always the ideal. There definitely are situations where you are going to find firewalls acting as quote-unquote routers. Now, as we talk about firewalls, let's see how firewalls fit in the big picture. Let's just recap everything we've learned. So first, you've learned about the layer one device, which is a hub. Hubs are normally found on desktops or in very small offices. Hubs generally connect up to switches. Switches are your aggregation points. And remember, they segment collision domains. Switches then connect into routers. And routers are your aggregation points for your separate subnets. And they often will connect to, for example, um, exterior networks, or in this case, the internet. So the firewall protects the network from these exterior 
uh, networks. So the, the firewall is the protection point for the networks. One possible way of doing it, there are many ways of doing it, is to simply put the firewall and directly connect it into the router so that all traffic from the router must go through the firewall and then on a separate NIC on the firewall you would connect that to the internal switch. Now again there's many ways you can do this but you'll get the general idea that all layer 3 traffic must go through this firewall. The firewall will have set rules at layer 3 only allowing specific layer 3 conversations through the firewall or what is generally seen more often is layer 4 rules on the firewall only allowing specific ports inbound. So let's say if you had an internal web server that you wanted users on the internet to hit, you could allow only that traffic inbound to port 80 to hit this specific IP, this specific web server. Now, that being said, firewalls do this filtering function, and the reason they're in this video as a network device is that sometimes it can occur where a firewall can actually act as a routed device. So if you had a DMZ off of the firewall, for example, this DMZ would have its own subnet. We'll just say it's 192.168.1.0 slash 24 and its own switch. Uh, you're running an actual e-commerce site and you have your web server here because you have a lot of traffic coming in and you want to make sure that you keep it secure. So you have your web server, um, your IDS, uh, which monitors all traffic, etc. In this case, the traffic's coming into the router. The firewall is actually making a decision here. Um, do I forward it inbound or do I forward it over to a separate NIC over to this DMZ? So although you won't see firewalls listed as network devices per se, the fact is sometimes they very much can play a part in the network and the routing decisions. And actually, there are even times where firewalls can run routing protocols. Uh, it's not the norm, but there are times where you will see um, BGP especially uh, configured to a firewall. Um, security experts would probably take issue with that, but that doesn't mean you won't see it. Um, so therefore, there's your overview of firewalls, understanding that they operate at both layer 3 and layer 4, and then again, they can operate as actual forwarding devices making routing decisions on the network. So why do you see a blank screen? Well, it's your turn. Please get a blank piece of paper and write down vertically one, two, three, and four, and then write down which devices match which layer of the OSI model. Go ahead and do that now. Write down one, two, three, and four on your piece of paper and write down which network devices match each unique layer of the OSI model. So how did you do? As you can see, here are the layers of the OSI model and the network hardware that matches with each layer. Um, you're gonna to need to know this for sure uh, as you proceed in your CCDA studies, but also as an engineer. So just to recap what we've learned, you've gone through layer one, two, three, and four of the OSI model, and specifically you can see how the network devices work within each of these layers of the OSI model. So again, if you are not an expert at the OSI model yet, um, please revisit video 1.1 and study it because as you can see, um, everything you're beginning to learn is based off of that. Hubs are at layer one, switches work at layer two. Um, just a note, switches can also work at layer three. There are such things as layer three switches that have some routing functionality. Um, routers and firewalls work at layer three and then firewalls uh, work at layer four. This provides you a really solid foundation moving forward so that when you do hear about hubs, switches, routers, and firewalls, you understand where they fit in the OSI model and what their primary task is on a network. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you are going to learn about network types, specifically wide area and local area networks. Let's go ahead and dig in uh, and learn about local area networks. Local area networks are local computer networks used to communicate between host systems generally for sharing information such as documents, audio files, video, email. They have limited reach and they connect devices generally in the same building or in the same campus if you're using fiber to extend the local area network. Usually they're private and belong solely to the companies in which they are deployed. Now in the past, the topologies were ring, bus, mesh, and star, but today the most common topology is switched ethernet. The different LAN technologies available today that are the most popular are Ethernet, Fast Ethernet, Gigabit Ethernet, and now 10 Gigabit Ethernet is becoming more and more popular. And then finally, what is obviously very popular at this point is Wireless LAN, where you can reach up to 600 megabits per second under the 802.11n specification. Now, at the higher layers of the OSI model, it's the TCP/IP is the standard which has replaced uh, NetBuoy, IPX, SPX, and Apple Talk, among others. Although, um, if you travel around enough, you certainly are going to see some of these older protocols uh, still out there. So let's just go ahead and draw out a typical local area network. First, you're going to have an access layer switch. And if you remember from typical design, there's core distribution and access layer. Well, we're in the access layer now. And the access layer switch is going to connect out to, let's say, PCs or um, IP-based phones. These are all things that can be connected into the local area network, including wireless access points. So the local area network can be extended, as you can see here, to a wireless access point. And then other systems, wireless systems, can communicate, such as laptops or mobile phones can be a part of, can connect to the local area network as well. Now this access switch connects up to a distribution switch and the distribution switch ultimately connects back into the core and this would all still be considered part of the local area network. But once we connect into a router then we start talking about what the edge is. So we're, we're moving off the edge into the router and then the WAN would be off the router itself. So there's kind of a DMARC point, if you think of local area network, and it's right about here between the router and the core switch. Now this distribution layer switch would often be a layer 3 switch. This would, be, this would be where your gateway is. And I bring this up because systems on your local area network generally are on the same subnet. So in this case, 192.168.1.0.24. Um, and then here we have 1.10, 1.11. Now the wireless access point may be 1.12 for management and maybe that wireless access point extends out another let's say 10 dot network that assigns IP addresses to anything that's wireless these even though these are even though these are different subnets this would all be considered a part of your local area network so as you can see whether it's wired or wireless that is your LAN and then the WAN is anything off of your router and we'll talk about WANs in a minute. Now the wide area network is used to connect LANs or other types of networks together and we'll briefly cover some of the other types of networks as well. It allows users and computers in one location to communicate with users and computers in other locations. These are usually private networks and they're usually built for one particular organization but that being said, if you have an internet connection, and most businesses do nowadays, nowadays, there is a public connection from an organization to the internet. And at the end of each WAN connection, a router connects the LAN on one side with a second router to the LAN on the other. Now again, you can connect over a private network or you can connect over the internet. As you can see, there are five primary types of wide area network technologies. Lease line, circuit switching, packet switching, connection oriented, packet switching, connectionless, and then cell relay. 
Some are still very popular, and some are not used much at all anymore. But that being said, you should be aware of all five for your CCDA exam. Let's begin with discussing least line. Now, least line, very simply, would be connecting two routers over a dedicated circuit. So in this case, let's say Chicago over to Washington, D.C., a wide area network a wide area network connection it is one single circuit purchased by the company no other traffic can go on that circuit except for the traffic from this company and it's connecting two local area networks so yes this is a very secure method of transferring data between Chicago and DC and this connection will be the wide area network next let's talk about circuit switching now circuit switching was once very popular and is still often used for backup solutions. So circuit switching provides temporary data communications over a wide area network, which requires a call setup procedure. But that being said, you will not be charged for using the circuit when it's not in use. So with circuit switching, you would have, again, we have two routers. And then if interesting traffic hit one of the routers and that is traffic destined for the other location it would then place a call or set up the wide area network connection and once that session was initiated the traffic would then flow over the circuit next let's talk about pack packet switched connection oriented some popular types of implementations of this are Frame Relay, um, X25, and more recently MPLS. Now in this case, let's say we have one hub site and three remote sites. You can set up a PVC permanent virtual circuit, which means that that circuit is always up regardless or an SVC, switched virtual circuit, where if there's interesting traffic, it will bring up a virtual circuit and then forward traffic and then tear it down again. Now that being said, all this traffic is floating over a provider network. So making sure that your circuits are secure is going to be key. Working with your vendor to ensure security is a high priority, not only for them, but additional measures that you can take on your end to ensure all data transmissions are secure over their network where many customers are sharing it. Next there is packet switched connectionless. You certainly know of this or you certainly use this already. Uh, whenever you connect to the internet you're using this type of service. The system is relying on the IP forwarding of routers on the network it's not so concerned about the exact path it takes rather it just makes sure it relies on the upper layer protocols to make sure that the traffic reach, reaches its destination so in this case we have an internet edge connecting to an internet service provider and let's say we have another location with an edge connected to another internet service provider now how it gets there we don't know I mean, there are, we, we can't, it can't be guaranteed the path it will take. It'll be going over the internet. And um, certainly we can look up how it's getting there and how it's returning. But it can take many different paths uh, to get there. So that means traffic might not arrive in order. It may not be taking the path you expect. And you don't have ultimate control over that. Now, that being said, if you want more control and you want more security, you can connect two devices into the Internet and create your own little private wide area network connection by creating tunnel interfaces on your routers and then creating a GRE tunnel or an IPsec tunnel, which would encrypt the data. And to you, it would look like a point to point connection. Even though it's going over the Internet, you're not exactly sure which router is going over but according to your systems and your routing protocols it could look like a point-to-point -point connection and that's one very popular way of saving money is by rolling out uh, secure communications um, over the internet 
And then finally, there is Cell Relay. Now, this was very popular about 15 years ago, but due to the increase in bandwidth and availability of Ethernet and other options, this fell by the wayside due to the large overhead. But that being said, you should be aware of it. With ATM, it is a fixed cell technology. So all the cells are the same size and data is then placed inside and is forwarded. So think of a train heading down the tracks. All the compartments are the same size. Data is placed in. It's very efficient that way. But that being said, there is a lot of overhead because you don't always need to use uh, that size of cell. So here's what you learned. You learned about local area and wide area networks. These are the two network types that you are going to need to understand in and out to pass your CCDA exam. So this just got you started in the very basics. And I encourage you to watch the rest of the videos so that you master the knowledge necessary to understand all the components of local and wide area networks. Enough information so that you can pass your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're going to cover TCP IP fundamentals, as well as we're going to discuss UDP and ICMP to bundle it in there for you as you prepare for your CCDA exam. So let's begin. In this video, you will specifically learn about the different types of headers used on the network, the IP, TCP, and UDP header, as well as how they operate on the network. You will then review how routing works and some of the issues faced or tools used when routing. So let's begin. The TCP IP stack maps to the network and transport layers of the OSI model. IP or Internet Protocol has become the de facto standard for network communications at layer 3. What you see before you is the IP header. You will need to know the functions for each of the fields you see before you. Let me cover some of the functions that you will most likely need to know for your exam and in real world troubleshooting. First, there's the version field. The version field indicates that it is IPv4 in this instance with a value of 0100. Then there's the type of service field. This field is re commonly referred to as the type of service byte. It has eight bits used to set quality of service markings and specifically, Within this field is DSCP. The six leftmost bits are used for DSCP, which obviously commonly is associated with quality of service marking. Next is the IP flags field. This is a three bit field. The second bit of this field is the DF or do not fragment, fragment bit. And that indicates that a packet should not be fragmented. Then there's the time to live field. This is an 8-bit field that is decremented by one each time a packet is routed from one IP network to another. If TTL ever reaches zero, the packet is discarded. The protocol field, which is an 8-bit field, specifies what kind of data, uh, type of data is encapsulated in the packet. TCP and UDP are common protocols identified by this field. Finally, the source address field, which is a 32-bit field indicating the source of the IPv4 packet, and then the destination address field, which again is a 32-bit destination, destination address, which indicates the destination for that packet. Next, let's look at the IPv6 header. First, you have the version field, just like IPv4, but in IPv6, the value is 0110. The traffic class field performs the same function as the type of service field in IPv4 header. The flow label field is used by a router to use a specific outbound connection for a traffic flow if a router has multiple outbound connections. 
The hot limit field probably sounds familiar. It's the same as the IPv4 TTL field. And then you have your source and destination address field, which is similar to IPv4's headers 32-bit source address field, but in this case, because it's IPv6, it's 128 bits for both, obviously, source and destination. Next, let's move on to the TCP segment header. Here are some of the fields you will certainly need to know. You have the source port field, which is the 16-bit field indicating the sending port number, and the destination port field, again, a 16-bit field. So, for example, if you connect to howtonetwork.com, you're connecting to a destination port of 80, which is the TCP port for HTTP. The sequence number field is a 32-bit field indicating the amount of data sent during a TCP session. The sending party uses this field to make sure the receiving party actually received the data. The receiving party uses the sequence number from this field as the basis for the acknowledgement number in the next segment that it sends back to the sender. And then the window field, which is a 16-bit field, it specifies the number of bytes a sender is willing to transmit before receiving an acknowledgement from the receiver. And we're going to follow this up in a few minutes as we talk more about TCP window sizes. Now that you've learned about what is in a TCP header, you need to understand the basics of how TCP initiates traffic flows over a network. It's not complex, but you certainly need to know it if you're tested on it. The process of setting up a TCP session involves a three-way handshake. Step one, the session initiator sends a SYN packet or a SYN message to the target host. And then the host, the target host, acknowledges the receipt of that SYN message and sends an ACK or acknowledgement message. And it also sends a SYN message of its own. Finally, the session initiator receives the SYN message from the target. And again, it acknowledges receipt by sending an ACK message. And therefore, you have a TCP session established. You need to know each of those steps, one, two, and three, for your exam. Earlier you learned about the window field, so let's circle back and talk about that a little bit. TCP communication uses windowing. One or more segments can be sent at one time. The receiver acknowledges the receipt of all segments in a window with an acknowledgement. Now TCP can use a sliding window. The window size can begin with one segment, and then if there's a successful acknowledgement of that segment, the window size doubles to two segments. And then if those two segments are received, the next window can contain four segments. This increase in window size continues until the receiver does not acknowledge successful receipt of all segments within a certain time frame, known as the round trip time. The other IP layer for transport protocol is UDP. UDP is considered to be an unreliable protocol because it lacks all of the features of TCP. There's no sequence numbering, no window size, no acknowledgements. You can see here the header is quite simple. It contains only source and destination port numbers, and then a UDP checksum, and then segment length. So why use UDP? Well, it's best for servicing applications that need to maximize bandwidth and do not require acknowledgements such as video streams or audio. And in fact, the primary protocol used to carry voice and video traffic over networks is RTP, Real-Time Transport Protocol. And that's a layer four protocol that is encapsulated inside of UDP. Now that you have a good understanding of the individual headers in the TCP IP stack, Cisco wants you to understand how this traffic actually traverses the network. So let's go ahead and use this basic example. We have a PC that wants to send data over to a server. The first step in this process is that the PC will compare its IP address and subnet mask to that of the destination. The PC, by doing this, is aware that the destination IP address is on a re remote network and it cannot directly reach it, so the PC understands it needs to send this packet now to its default gateway. It doesn't do that automatically yet. It needs to know actually who the default gateway is. The PC needs to know the layer 2 address of the default gateway, so it sends an ARP request for router1's MAC address, and then it receives a response. 
The PC adds router one's MAC address to its ARP cache, and then now it can send the data in a frame destined for server one to the default gateway because it has the matching layer two and layer three information needed to forward that request or to forward that message onto the gateway. Router one then receives the frame sent from the personal computer and looks at the IP header and remember the TTL field, it decrements that field by one. Now, if the TTL field happened to be zero, which it's not, but if it happened to be zero, the router would discard the frame and then send a time exceeded ICMP message back to the PC. The TTL is not decremented to zero here, so router one checks its routing table and then understands that the best path to, re to reach network 192.168.4.0 is the WAN connection or over serial one. So it then forwards that message over to router two. Note that it does not need to do an ARP request because this is a serial interface and serial interface types do not have MAC addresses. So then router two receives the frame and again, it decrements the TTL and the IP header, looks at the IP header and then determines where is this destination network. The destination network is directly connected off the Ethernet interface. So router 2 needs to understand, now that it has the destination, what the MAC address is for that destination. And it sends out an ARP request, receives the information back, the ARP reply from server 1, and then router 2 forwards the frame out its fast Ethernet interface to server one. So that's a really basic example, but Cisco wants you to understand all the individual steps and how routing actually works. Now let's dig even deeper into what's occurring on the network and an important concept that Cisco wants you to know, which is MTU or maximum transmission unit. An MTU refers to the largest packet size supported on a router interface and typically 1500 is the common value. Smaller MTU sizes result in more overhead because more packets have to be sent. But if you're sending data over slower speed links, large MTU values could cause delay for latency sens sensitive traffic. When you have high speed connections, let me give you an example of let's say a private interconnect between two servers. Um, what happens is that administrators often enable jumbo frames. Those are frames over the standard size or the standard MTU size so that more data can be forwarded in fewer number of packets and therefore fewer headers that routers have to process on the network or systems need to process on the network. Now, if you're gonna run a network, you're gonna need to troubleshoot it and ICMP messages are something that you probably are going to be tested on in the CCNP route exam. ICMP is most often associated with the ping utility and you use that obviously you've used that in the past to check connectivity but it has many other roles beyond ping it uses a variety of message types as you can see here but there's two that it appears Cisco wants you to focus on the first is destination unreachable which you probably are already aware of but if a packet enters a router which is destined for an address that the router has no idea how to reach the router will let the sender know by sending a destination unreachable ICMP message back to the sender. The other message that you may not be aware of is the redirect. A host may have routing information that will help it reach a particular destination network. So it'll send it to that next hop IP address, but network conditions can change and a different next hop IP address may need to be used. In that case, the original next hop router can let the host know to use a different path by sending a host redirect ICMP message. So you've learned a lot in this video. When you started it, you probably thought it would be a simple review, but surely you've picked up quite a bit of information. I wish you good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we will be covering the first of two videos on Layer 2 technologies. We will start with Spanning Tree. In this video, you will learn about Spanning Tree BPDUs, or Bridge Protocol Data Units, STP Port States, Cost and Priority, STP Port Types, and then finally, BPDU Timers. All of this information is not only going to help you on your CCDA exam, but will certainly make you a better engineer as well. So let's begin. STP is defined in the IEEE 802.1D standard, and its primary purpose is to make sure that your network is loop-free. It operates by making the following assumptions, that all links are bidirectional, and that they can, in fact, send and receive BPDUs, and that the switch itself is able to regularly receive, process, and send BPDUs. Now, all switches that reside in the same STP domain regularly, regularly exchange these bridge protocol data units, these messages with one another. And ultimately, the, net the network uses the information from these data units to determine the network topology and the flows of traffic. The topology of an active switch network is determined by the following three variables. The unique MAC address or the switch identifier associated with each switch, the path cost to the root bridge associated with each port on the switch, and the port identifier. All of these play a big role in the decision making of how traffic will flow on a network. Some basic facts, uh, BPDUs are sent to the STP multicast destination address, as you see here. And by default, they are sent every two seconds. Now there are two type of data units that we should know of. Configuration BPDUs and TCNs, or Topology Change Notification BPDUs. Now switches determine the best configuration BPDU based on the following criteria which is lowest root bridge ID, which is based on root bridge ID, root path cost to the root bridge, sender bridge ID, and sender port ID. Before we can continue, we should really understand how things work in spanning tree regarding just the ports themselves, so spanning tree ports. So in a typical environment, we're going to have one root switch, and we have three switches connected here, switch one, two, and three, and switch one is the root. And this is going to help us understand how spanning tree designates ports. So in spanning tree, the root never has root ports because root is always the forwarding port that is closest to the root bridge. So this root only has designated ports. Switch 2 and switch 3 both have root ports. That is the forwarding port that is closest to the root bridge in terms of path cost. And then Switch 3 has a designated port. This is one forwarding port on each LAN segment. And then switch 2 is the alternate port. This is the best alternate path to the root bridge on that very same segment. Next to switch 3, we're going to connect switch 4. Switch 3 is going to have a designated port, but it's going to also here have a backup port. A backup port is a backup redundant path to a segment where another bridge port already connects. Uh, the backup port applies only when a single switch has two links to the same segment. Now we can better understand the following slide. At the completion of configuration BPDU exchange, the following results. A root switch is elected for the entire spanning tree domain, and a root port is elected on every non-root switch in the spanning tree domain. As you will remember, a root port is a forwarding port that is the closest to the root bridge in terms of path cost. A designated switch is elected for every LAN segment, and a designated port is elected on the designated switch for every segment. And if, we, and if you will remember, a designated port is a forwarding port for every LAN segment, the chosen forwarding port. And then finally, based on all of this information and all these calculations, loops are avoided in the network.
Uh, top, topology change BPDUs play a key role in handling changes in the active topology. They are proactively originated by any switch and sent upstream toward the root bridge, providing information that would be key to keeping the network loop free. Let's, ne next, let's talk about spanning tree port states. 802.1D has five different port states, disabled, blocking, listening, learning, and forwarding. Let's talk about each of these in depth. When a, when a switch port is in blocking mode, the port is not transmitting or receiving data, and it's prevented from transmitting BPDUs. Packets arriving on the port are not learned by the bridge's filtering database. A block port, though, can receive BPDUs and is included in the spanning tree algorithm calculation. So ultimately, it could be used to transfer data, but it's not. It's blocking at this point. Next, let's talk about the port state of listening. A listening port is not transmitting or receiving data, and packets on the port are not learned by the Bridges filtering database. But it can transmit and receive BBDUs and is included in the spanning tree algorithm calculation. The listening state is a transitional state that will change to the learning state after a settable time of period, which we know as the forward delay timer. Next, let's talk about the learning state. In a learning state, the port is not transmitting or receiving data, but it can receive and transmit BPDUs. It is included in the spanning tree algorithm calculation, and the packets arriving on the port are in fact learned by the bridges filtering database. This also is a transitional state that will automatically change to a forwarding state after a settable period of time, which is called the forward delay timer. And as appropriate, let's move on to the forwarding state. The forwarding state is the only state in which data is being transmitted and received by the port. It can receive and transmit BPDUs and is included in the spanning tree algorithm calculation. The packets arriving on the port are learned by the bridges filtering database. Finally, let's talk about the disabled port state. A port is disabled or in a disabled state when the port is not transmitting or receiving data packets or BPDUs and is not considered in the spanning tree algorithm. So as you can see, once a port is enabled by a network administrator or through initialization, it goes through a process or these different port states. The port will move into a listening and learning and ultimately a forwarding state if the spanning tree algorithm has chosen it as a root port or a designated port. If spanning tree has not chosen the port as a root or designated port, it will put the port into a blocking state. You know that also as an alternate port or a backup port. Now, Spanning Tree uses the bridge ID to uniquely identify each switch, and it's actually used to assist in the election of a Spanning Tree root bridge, unless, of course, the root bridge has been manually configured. In the 802.1D standard, each VLAN requires a unique bridge ID. So, Spanning Tree root bridge election. Following initialization, all switches initially assume that they are root, but the switch with the highest bridge priority is elected this the spanning tree root bridge. Now all things being equal, if nothing's been configured and all things set, are set to default, then the root bridge is chosen by the lowest order MAC address. During root election, no traffic is forwarded over any switch in the same spanning tree domain until things are stabilized and there's a loop free topology. Spanning tree uses cost and priority values to determine the best path to the root bridge. 
in the 802.1D specification, it assigns a 16-bit default port cost values to each port. Now, note this before we dig into the actual port values. The port cost is globally significant and is included in all propagated BPDUs. By default, the lower number, the lower costs are more preferred. So you're going to see this in a second as we draw this out. But in the event that multiple ports have the same path cost, then Spanning Tree will consider the port priority. The default value is 128. But you should note that the port priority is locally significant and not included in Spanning Tree protocol BPDUs. So the spanning tree protocol default port cost, it depends on the interface speed. And you'll notice here from this chart that the higher the speed, the lower the cost. And this comes into play when spanning tree is actually trying to calculate the best path to route. So for example, let's draw out a network with five switches. And we're gonna bring each of these switches online and let spanning tree decide which is the best path and which ports should be root, which ports should be designated ports. So they are all interconnected. And let's pretend we are powering them all on. Now let's say the switches aren't all of the same speed. So for example, we have a 10 megabit switch a 100 megabit switch, and we'll just say all the interfaces on the switch are that speed. A 1 gigabit switch, a 100 megabit switch here, and a 1 gigabit switch. So as you remember from the chart, these numbers should start to look familiar. A cost of two is assigned to a 10 gigabit interface, a cost of four, a one gigabit interface, a cost of a 19, a 100 megabit interface, and a cost of 100 to a 10 megabit interface. And Spanning Tree will calculate, as you can see, it's doing right here. Spanning Tree is calculating best path to, to the root. And let's say we've let's say we've assigned the one gigabit switch as our root. We've manually set it. Spanning tree would then calculate, and as you can see here, from the 10 megabit switch through the 100 meg over to the one gig, it's 100, and the total cost is 123. And then the other path, the total cost is 119. That's the lower cost. That would be the root port, because that would be the preferred path. So as you know, we've already talked about some of these ports, but Spanning Tree elects two types of ports that are used to forward BPDUs, and that's the root port. Now note, the root switch never has any root ports because this is the port that provides the best path to the root bridge. So every other switch is going to have one root port. That's the best path to the root bridge. The root bridge will not have a root port for obvious reasons. The root path cost is calculated based on the cumulative cost to the root. The designated port actually points away from the spanning tree root and it sits in a blocking state. All ports on the root are designated ports because the root path cost will always be zero. The designated port is the best port on a segment. So for example, on a segment, you will have, on a segment where there is no root switch, you will have one designated port and all the other ports will be either alternate or backup ports. We talked a bit, quite a bit about BPDUs in, in video lesson three, module one, but let's build upon that further. BPDUs include several timers that play an integral role in the operation of the protocol. And the mod modification of these timers should always be made at the root bridge. There are three configurable spanning tree timer values, which is hello, forward delay, and max age. The hello time is two seconds by default. Forward delay is 15 seconds by default. And max age is 20 seconds by default.
So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the foundation of spanning tree, which is BPDUs, port states, uh, cost and priority, and the STP port types. So this provides you a solid foundation for designing your networks and your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about the Layer 2 technology, VLANs. So here's what you'll learn. You'll learn about VLANs, and then you're going to learn specifically about what makes voice VLANs unique. So let's go ahead and begin our video with just some of the basics about what VLANs are. What exactly is a VLAN? Well, Cisco says it's a group of N stations with a common set of requirements. Using VLANs allows you to put many different devices in many different locations on the same logical network, on the same layer two network. Um, in the past, without VLANs, uh, you would have had to rely upon uh, simple hardware solutions, but a VLAN allows you to virtualize your layer two segment. VLANs are usually associated by the same subnet. So normally devices on a VLAN are, sh are sharing the same subnet. And, and with this in mind, they're sharing the same broadcast domain. That is the norm. And then VLANs must be routed to communicate with other VLANs. So it is a true layer two segment. Um, a VLAN is not going to be able to communicate with another VLAN unless it is passed through a layer three device which can route it. Now, there are two types of switch port types for VLAN membership that we need to understand. And the first is the access port. Now, access ports can only belong to a single VLAN. Now, when you think of an access port, it's pretty much probably what you think of. It's usually for end devices like a workstation or a server. It is a device that is an end station and again, access port can only belong to a single VLAN, typically used to connect end devices. And there are two methods to assign ports uh, to VLANs uh, for these access ports. The, the first, which is by far the, the most popular, is the static VLAN assignment. So an administrator actually doing it, and then dynamic VLAN assignment which is done by a server. So let's dig a little bit more into that, into those two concepts. So when we have a static VLAN assignment, the network administrator is actually manually configuring a switch port to be a part of a VLAN. The network administrator is saying, is programming the port to say, you are gonna be an access port and you're gonna be associated with this specific VLAN. Now you can do this dynamically and this is not as popular, but there is something called a VLAN management policy server, which can assign a desired VLAN to users connecting to a switch. We don't need to get much deeper than that uh, for your exam, but you, need to do know, you do need to know these two methods. Now there's another type of port that we need to understand to understand the concept of VLANs, and that is trunk ports. And trunk ports are used to carry data from multiple VLANs. So access ports only allow communication from one end device over a specific VLAN. Well, ultimately, if you're hosting many VLANs, uh, this traffic's gonna need to be able to communicate um, throughout your network uh, so that they're not limited, uh, limited by a hardware device. So your, VLAN may, your VLANs may be spread throughout um, many floors or maybe even many buildings. Trunk ports allow you to carry data from all these different VLANs between all your different hardware devices. Now there are some standard VLAN numbers and ranges you should know. Um, specifically, let's focus on 2 to 1001. These VLANs are created and used and deleted on all Cisco Catalyst switches. And another one that you should really focus in on is the range of 1,006 to 4,094. These are 
extended this is an extended range of vlans for ethernet vlans only now you may be asked about these other ranges but uh, i would focus in on vlan ranges 2 to 1001 and 1006 to 4094 Now, we talked a little bit about VLAN trunks earlier, but let's just hit upon let's just hit upon VLAN trunks a little bit more so we can understand it. Now, again, I want to remind you that there is another video that is dedicated solely to VLAN trunks, but let's just get a basic understanding here. VLAN trunks are used to carry data from multiple VLANs, which you already know. Now, there are two methods, two protocols that can be used uh, to build these trunks. And the first is InterSwitch Link or ISL. And that's a Cisco proprietary protocol that is used to preserve the source VLAN identification information for frames that traverse trunk links. And then there is, I would say, the more popular 802.1Q, which is an open standard. And then it performs a little bit differently than the Cisco proprietary protocol. Now, the reason 802.1Q is so popular is you probably understand that for obvious reasons, that if you want to trunk between two devices, let one is Cisco and one is non-Cisco, uh, you're able to do that. So this standard works very effectively, and 802.1Q is very popular. But you will definitely be asked about ISL, and you will definitely be asked about the differences between ISL and 802.1Q. Now, so you've received a lot of information right now. So let's go ahead and kind of draw out some of these concepts that we've been talking about. So when we think of VLANs, we think first of we need to connect endpoints need to connect on a local area network. So here we have four endpoints and we have one switch. And each of these endpoints uh, need to communicate, and not all of them need to communicate with, e with each other. So let's say we have two workstations and two servers. And we're going to put this one workstation in, in VLAN 10 and this other workstation in VLAN 10, and then these two servers in VLAN 2. These two servers are segmented on their own VLAN and as are the workstations. They cannot communicate between each other, um, between VLAN 2 and 10, but anything on VLAN 10 can communicate with VLAN 10. Now here's another dedicated VLAN, we'll say VLAN 3 to a dedicated device. Now, and here is a router. So for any of these VLANs to communicate with one another, they need to pass through a layer 3 device. So this, this workstation that from VLAN 10, if it wants to communicate over to a server, it needs to be routed and go through the router and passed over to VLAN 2. Um, and let's say you want to keep VLAN 3 devices um, not accessible from the network. You can prevent that. So here we have other devices on VLAN 3. And we'll say, let's say this is a back-end connection between two servers that we have no need to route it. VLAN 3 can be segmented from the entire network nobody can reach it. So there's some security built into VLANs as well. Now VLANs can extend obviously over to other hardware platforms. So this router is connected to another switch and on this switch, let's say that's in a different building, we have another device on VLAN 2, another device, another endpoint um, on an access port to VLAN 10. And if they want to communicate over to the other building, let's say VLAN 2 or VLAN 10, they simply go over this trunk port, you know that term, uh, goes over the trunk port and can communicate over to the other sites. Configuring a VLAN is rather straightforward. Uh, you simply go into configuration mode and type in VLAN. And for the sake of this example, we're assigning it number 10. And then normally you would name the VLAN so anybody logging in would understand what that VLAN, what the purpose of the VLAN actually is. So the purpose of this VLAN is actually to host servers. Um, you can name it obviously anything you want, but in this case we'll just say servers. And then you have the VLAN built, but you still need to assign ports to that VLAN. So you assign a port to a VLAN by actually going into interface configuration mode 
And in this example, it's fast Ethernet 02. And then you need to make the Ethernet port an access port. Now remember, those two port types that we're concerned about, access port and trunk port, we're making this an access port. And then you enter in the command switch port access VLAN in the VLAN you want it to participate in. And let's say on fast Ethernet 02, we have a server we're connecting. So we're going to assign it to VLAN 10. And that is it. That is it. Next, let's learn about the unique attributes of voice VLANs. A Cisco IP phone provides a data connection for a user's personal computer in addition to voice data coming from itself. So this allows one single Ethernet connection to be installed per user and makes maximum use of your ports even though several different types of data can pass over that port. The voice and user PC ports always function as access mode switch ports, but the port that connects to the switch, that can operate as an 802.1Q trunk, or it can operate as an access port. Now, when bringing up a trunk between an IP phone and a switch, this is normally negotiated but you can specify that the ports at both ends are brought up as an 802.1Q trunk. Now, you could bring the switch port up as an access port, but that would not allow you to segment voice and data appropriately. The trunk allows you to segment voice and data on separate VLANs, and this would allow you to easily provide quality of service capabilities to the voice traffic since it's already segmented. To configure the IP phone uplink, you just need to configure the switch port where the phone connects. The switch then instructs the phone to follow the mode that is selected. If an 802.1Q trunk is needed, the trunk is automatically negotiated by DTP and CDP. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about VLANs and specifically what makes voice VLANs unique. And all of this information not only will help you with passing your CCDA exam, it will help you design your networks moving forward. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn basic Layer 3 technologies. Specifically, you're going to learn the basics of IPv4 and v6 addressing and routing. So let's go ahead and begin. Network addresses are logical addresses assigned when a device is placed in the network and changed when the device is moved. Network layer addresses have a hierarchical structure comprised of two parts, the network address and the host address. Logical addresses can be assigned manually by the administrator or dynamically via a dedicated protocol such as DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol using a server on the network. All the devices in a network have the same network portion of the address but different host identifiers. Routers analyze the network portion of IP addresses and compare them with entries from its routing table. If a match is found, the packet is sent to the appropriate interface. IPv4 addresses are 32-bit numbers represented as strings of zeros and ones. For a more intuitive representation of IPv4 addresses, the 32 bits can be divided into four octet groupings separated by dots, which is called dotted decimal notation. The octets can be converted into decimal numbers. For example, considering the following, for example, consider the following 32-bit string. If you were to divide it into four octets, it results in the following binary representation. 
This translates into an easy to read decimal representation of 192.168.128.169. IPv4 addresses are categorized into five classes. A, B, and C are used for addressing devices. D is for multicast groups. And E is reserved for experimental use. The first bits of the address define which class it belongs to as illustrated in this chart. Knowing the class of an IPv4 address helps to determine which part of the address represents the network and which part represents the host bits. IPv4 addresses can be classified into the following categories. There are public addresses which are used for external communication, private addresses which are reserved and used only internally within a company, the private address ranges are defined by RFC 1918 and include the following ranges. So far we've been talking about classful networks. Classless addressing allows class A, B, and C addresses to be divided into even smaller networks called subnets. This results in a larger number of possible networks each with fewer host addresses. The subnets are created by borrowing bits from the host portion and using them as subnet bits. An important aspect of IPv4 addressing is separating the network and the host part of the addressing string. This is accomplished by using a subnet mask, also represented by a 32-bit number. The subnet mask starts with a continuous strings of bits with the value of 1 and ends with a string of zeros. The number of bits with the value of 1 represents the number of bits in the IP address that must be considered in order to calculate the network address. A subnet mask bit of 0 indicates that the corresponding bit in the IPv4 address is a host bit. Using the same example that we've used earlier and then add a 255.255.255.0 mask results in the following situation. With a string of 24 bits of 1 in the subnet mask, we're going to consider only the first 24 bits in the IP address as the network portion. This results in the network address of 192.168.128.0 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. The last 8 bits in the IP address are called the host portion of the IP address and can be assigned to network devices. So let's ask the basic question, why even upgrade to IP version 6 other than the fact that you simply get more IP addresses? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to upgrade to IP version 6 and here are a few of them spelled out for you. But please note, you no longer need NAT or PAT. It has inherent IPsec support. These are key and critical updates. Now, once you've committed to using IPv6, you need to understand how these different IP addresses are labeled. There's a global unicast address. These are unicast packets sent through the public internet, with public IP addresses. Unique local, which are unicast packets inside one organization, which is basically e equal to your private IP addressing. Link local, which are packets sent to a local subnet and are not routable across networks. And, and then finally, take note of the loopback address, which you know from IP version 4 is 127.0.0.1. IP version 6 also has a loopback addressing as well. An IP version 6 address has 128 bits broken out into 32 hexadecimal numbers organized into eight quartets. So here is the hexadecimal numbering system, which I'm sure we won't need much of a refresher on, but we do need to use it to understand IP version 6. And here is an IPv6 IP address. And as you can see, it looks quite long, mainly because we're used to looking at IP version 4 addresses. So this ups the game a little bit, and we may begin to wonder how we're going to support this on our network or document this and we get concerned about managing a network with addressing this long well there are built-in mechanisms within IP version 6 to help us manage it and we're going to cover that there's ways you can summarize IP version 6 addresses to make it more manageable not only to read but to understand and explain to other people 
So you can shorten an IP version 6 by, omit, by omitting the leading zeros in any, any given quartet, or you can represent one or more consecutive quartets with a double colon. So here you see an IP version 6 address with many zeros in it. Here's how we can summarize it. On the left hand side, you can see that we use the double colon to represent the first, uh, the second and third quartet, and then we summarize the remaining quartets of zeros. And in the second example, we did the opposite. We summarized the first two quartets with zeros and then used the double colon for the end. You can only use the double colon once in an IP version 6 IP address. So here we see an IP version 6 IP address and this is the subnet. It's the remember it's a slash 64. So we're matching the first 64 bits as you see here. And this also can be summarized. You don't need to write out all these zeros. So to, to explain what the subnet is to somebody, you can simply write it out this way. So IP version 6 is manageable. It gives you tools to manage it. So whether you are reviewing documentation or holding a general discussion about your network or simply logging into a Cisco router to take a look at what's going on, understanding abbreviation is key to IP version 6. Here are some other ways we can understand IP version 6 addressing. In our first example, you'll see that it's 2000 and then a double colon slash 4. The slash 4 would match the first 4 bits. In hex, that would be 0010. So all addresses whose first 4 bits are equal to the first 4 bits of the hex number 2000. In the second example, we're matching all addresses whose first 20 bits match the listed hex number. And you can see in red what match that would be. And in the final example, all addresses whose first 32 bits match the listed hex number. Here's another IP version 6 address. How do we break it out into subnets? Well, here you have it. We're honoring the first 48 bits of this range, and then we are breaking this out into smaller subnets, as you can see here. Each subnet matching the first 112 bits. Now that you've learned about IPv4 and v6, let's learn about IP routing. Every machine in a particular LAN will have the same network address and subnet mask. However, the host portion of the IP address will be different. The process of choosing the best path is called routing. Although routers are the most popular devices that make routing decisions, other network devices can have routing functionality, such as layer 3 switches or security appliances. A router is responsible for sending the packet the correct way, no matter what is happening above the network layer. Routers look at the packet's destination address to determine where the packet is going so they can select the best route to get the packet there. In order to calculate the best path, routers must know what interface should be used in order to reach the packet's destination network. Routers learn about networks by either being connected to them physically or by having a network administrator program the routes, or by learning them dynamically from other routers using routing protocols. Routers keep the best path to destinations learned via direct connections. Static routing or dynamic routing in the internal data structures called routing tables. A routing table consists of networks the router has learned about and information about how to reach them. As mentioned before, dynamic routing is the process by which a router exchanges routing information and learns about remote networks from other routers. Different routing protocols can accomplish this task, including the following, RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, and BGP. The most important information a routing table contains includes the following items, how the route was learned, the address of the neighbor router from which the network was learned, the interface through which the network can be reached, and the route metric, which is a measurement that gives routers information about how far 
or how preferred a network is. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about IPv4 and IPv6 addressing, but you've also learned about how IP routing basically works, which is a good foundation as you move forward in your CCDA studies. Good luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to cover network design principles. Specifically, in this video, you're going to learn about the design of a Cisco ecosystem. Then we're going to talk about the modern organization, specifically organizational IT architecture and the policy cycle. And then finally, we will talk about infrastructure design considerations. And by the end of this video, you will be well versed in all five areas. When building a network, choosing the network hardware and software components must be performed with consideration for design, planning, deployment, and support. All phases have design principles that must be taken into account and which will be covered in this video. Today's modern organizational models try to leverage internetworking power and the benefits of the global internet. The modern approach is different in many ways from the traditional organizational model that was based on an isolated network design. Traditional companies have closed structure and a limited ability to integrate with other organizations and other companies from an IT standpoint, which results in limited access to information. These companies are difficult to both partner and interact with because most of the processes and applications are done internally. Therefore, companies that adopt this model are unable to adapt and take advantage of new technologies. Let me give you an example. If I roll out a network with private leased lines over a specific provider using non-standard hardware such as HP, Juniper, and Cisco, and maybe Dell, and then protocol, a variety of protocols such as OSPF and ISIS. When it comes time to merge with a company or connect with a company, I'm not ready to do that unless they happen to support the same technologies in the same areas or the locations. As you can see, how are we supposed to connect with this new strategic partner using our existing infrastructure with the wide array of technology platforms and private lines is very difficult. This is the old way of doing things. These disadvantages created the need for a new modern networking organizational model based on a network design that allows partnership and collaboration with other entities. It also provides a more focused expertise over the products and services vital to a company's business model. The reality is, is that it's much easier for companies running simply just Cisco with, let's say, OSPF and BGP, and who are already leveraging internet-based technologies to communicate with one another, because the infrastructure that is needed is already in place. As you can see here, because this company leverages internet technologies and standard platforms and protocols, it's very easy to integrate with external entities, whether it's a strategic partner or a customer, anybody you need to communicate with or create private connections to. This can easily be done with the leveraging of internet technologies and standard platforms, which can be implemented with a strong policy governance, which we'll talk about very shortly. The design of an ecosystem must, in must include a scalable and flexible network infrastructure that will be able to leverage enterprise networking and the internet, creating an environment that is highly accessible and collaborative and that can break geographical boundaries and will promote an efficient integration of all stakeholders. The modern organizational model includes the following four entities. Employees who consume HR information, data about such things as benefits and job openings, stock reports, schedules, 
or even expense reporting. These all depend on the corporate intranet. This intranet provides instant access to all of the most recent information and services and application updates used by the employees. The customer related aspects of a company are online support, technical support, or providing different types of customer services. Depending on the situation, customers might need to access some of the company's resources, for example, opening a support ticket. The vendors and suppliers are involved in the process of ordering, billing, and delivery of the products the company uses. These processes can be very time and labor intensive, so organizations can leverage their existing internet works to create links to their suppliers and vendors, which lowers costs per transaction. Strategic partners work to create strategic relationships in order to leverage resources and services to complete in-house expertise and skills. This modern organizational model applies to small, medium, and large companies. Designs that support this model are built around a modular architecture that uses technology consistent with the needs of the organization and allows companies to have a network infrastructure that is better suited for scalable applications. Now, when discussing the architectural components of the network, the architecture that Cisco recommends is divided into multiple layers, which make the processes in the organization easier to expand, implement, and scale. So let's go ahead and cover those now. Applications and services comprise the top layer and include organizational goals, Applications and services offer a concrete set of functions that can be accessed by the network, but only by authorized users. This layer also includes productivity tools, such as word processing, databases, and email. The next layer is intelligence solutions, and then there is structured data and business logic. These comprise this middle layer. These elements make the modern network much more intelligent, and help support applications and services in an efficient manner. This level includes such functions as messaging, such as chat, VoIP, or video conferencing, database structures, and other content networking solutions. The bottom layer is the foundation of the organizational architecture, the network infrastructure. This is composed of the network platform, the connections that work together to provide a highly available, secure, and scalable network. All of these layers are combined to offer a foundation for all organizational policies, goals, and procedures that are put in place by management and then handed down to the other departments in the company to support the overall goals and mission of the organization. Before designing a network, an important aspect must be considered. All organizations have policies at one level or another. Even if the procedures are not written well, there is some kind of understanding at the management level about the goals of the organization. Organizational policy and procedures are generally a collection of very specific guidelines and rules, which are in written form for all to understand and implement and maintain at every level of the organization in order to reach the well-defined business goals. The organizational policy cycle contains the following three components or steps. First, set the policy. Next, enforce the policy. And then the final step is to maintain and or adapt the policy as needed. Now the policy makers include the following from top to bottom. You have your board of directors and other executives, departmental management, Employees, these can be subject matter experts who can be relied upon to formulate procedures. External consultants and strategic partners can also provide outside input to set policy within an organization. Now, a flexible network infrastructure helps the organization and its customer meets the needs, policies, and procedures to help facilitate these information flows. And designing that network infrastructure involves considering the following essential features recommended by Cisco. First, availability. 
Critical business applications must have access to network resources on a 24 by 7 basis. All components of the network infrastructure should be redundant and resilient. Efficiency. The best equipment and software that is tuned for optimal results should be provided. Obviously, this should be accomplished with reasonable costs and investment. Functionality. The network infrastructure must support the business applications and services regardless of what is being rolled out today or tomorrow. Manageability, using management tools such as Cisco Works, should include technology that improves the control of the network, such as SNMP. Performance, obviously important applications need to get the bandwidth they need in order to operate correctly and the latency on the network needs to be within an acceptable range. And finally, scalability. This includes the ability to grow and expand depending on the organizational goals of today and tomorrow. So take three quick challenges for me and pause the video when I say so. On a piece of paper, write down the four primary entities of the modern organizational model. Go ahead and pause the video and write those down now. The four entities of the modern organizational model are employees, customers, vendors and suppliers, and partners. Next, on a piece of paper, draw out the organizational architecture of the network that Cisco recommends. Go ahead and do that now. As you will see here, on the top layer, there's applications and services. On the middle layer, there is intelligence solutions, and then structured data and business logic. And on the bottom layer, there is the network infrastructure. Finally, see if you can list at least four of the essential features recommended by Cisco when considering a network design. F at least four essential features to be considered. Go ahead and pause the video. Let's see how you did. There's availability, efficiency, functionality, manageability, performance, and scalability. So here's what you've learned. You've learned the design of an ecosystem. You've learned about the modern organization and organizational IT architecture, as well as the organizational policy cycle, which can and does play a role in infrastructure design considerations. All of this you will need to know for your CCDA exam, and I'm confident if you've mastered the material in this video, you're going to do very well in this area. Thank you, and good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you are going to learn about Cisco's Intelligent Information Network and Service-Oriented Network Architecture. We are going to cover these two topics in detail so that you are fully prepared to handle these topics when they come up on your CCDA exam. First, let's begin with Cisco Intelligent Information Network. IIN represents a multi-phased architecture that injects intelligence into a network infrastructure. Its single integrated system provides intelligence across multiple layers, as you see here, and aligns the network infrastructure with the rest of the IT infrastructure, integrating the network with applications, software, servers, and services. In other words, the network becomes an active participant in the total delivery of applications and services. Cisco sees this as an evolving environment, or what they would call an ecosystem, that responds to constantly changing business requirements. The Intelligent Information Network is a Cisco ideal where network and application services are integrated allowing for cost savings and improved user productivity. It allows the network to be used as a strategic asset 
and provides capabilities which include some of the following, such as CDP, which is a simple broadcast protocol that network devices use to advertise their presence. It operates in the background and facilitates communication between, for example, a Cisco unified IP phone plugged into a network and the network switch itself. QoS. Cisco provides an end-to-end -end solution with QoS to ensure that packets are serviced the way they need to be. As traffic flows through the access layer, for example, priority queuing and buffer management ensure that real-time traffic is prioritized over less time-critical data. Next is VLANs. With VLANs, the LAN infrastructure can distinguish between a phone, for example, from a PC using VLAN tagging. Wireless. Cisco wireless access points allow Cisco wireless users to roam a campus without losing connectivity. If a user roams to a different site, the system will discover the new physical location of that user. Power over Ethernet. This eliminates the need for local power connections to every phone. And finally, Gigabit Ethernet, which allows voice, video, and data to take advantage of high bandwidth speeds on the LAN infrastructure. As you saw before, the IIN is broken up into three individual phases. Phase one of the IIN is the integrated systems phase. This phase involves the convergence of voice, data, and video into a single transport network or across a system of networks. This phase is facilitated by platforms such as Cisco ISR routers. Phase two of the IIN is the integrated services phase. This phase merges common elements such as storage and data center server capacity. Additionally, virtualization technologies allow for the integration of servers, storage, and network devices. And finally, phase three of the IIN is the integrated applications phase. This phase is the ultimate goal of the IIN in that it allows the network to become application aware. Cisco refers to this as AON, Application Oriented Networking. Now, IIN should not be mentioned without discussing Cisco SONA or Cisco Service Oriented Network Architecture. This framework applies IIN within the enterprise network. SONA divides the IIN ideal into the following three different layers. The network infrastructure layer, also referred to as the physical infrastructure layer, facilitates the transport of services across the network. It refers to a hierarchical converged network that includes servers, storage, and clients. This is where the servers, storage, and clients are located and includes different modular design areas, such as the WAN or Enterprise Edge, Branch, Campus, Data Center, or Teleworker. The interactive services layer, also referred to as the core common services layer, optimizes the communication between applications and services using intelligent network functions such as security, identity, voice, virtualization, and QoS. The application layer contains the business and collaboration applications used by end users. These applications include commercial and internally developed applications such as software as a service and composite applications within the service-oriented architecture. The SONA network is built from the ground up with redundancy and resiliency to prevent network downtime. The goal of SONA is to provide high performance, fast response times, and throughput by assuring quality of service on an application-by-application -application basis. The SONA network is configured in order to maximize the throughput of all critical applications such as voice and video. SONA also provides built-in manageability and configuration management, performance monitoring, fault detection, and analysis tools. SONA provides an efficient design with the goal of reducing the total cost of ownership and maximizing the company's existing resources when application demands increase. 
So now that you've learned about IIN and SONA, let's take two challenges. First, on a piece of paper, please write out the three phases of IIN. The three phases and their names. Go ahead and pause the video now. Let's see how you've done. There's phase one, which is integrated systems. Phase two, which is integrated services. And then phase three, which is integrated applications. Next, on a piece of paper, what I'd like you to try to the best of your ability and as detailed as possible, draw out the Cisco Service Oriented Network Architecture Framework. See if you can draw it out to the best of your ability and try to include some modules within your layers to see how well you do. Let's see how you've done. There's the network infrastructure layer and you can see the modules here. There's the interactive services layer and you can see the submodules here. And then there's the application layer and you can see the submodules here. So in this video, you learned about Cisco Intelligent Information Network and Cisco Service Oriented Network Architecture Framework and how they work together. You will be tested on both of these in your CCDA exam. So if you understand the concepts in this video very well, I'm confident you're going to do well on this portion of your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're going to be covering the Cisco PPD-IOO lifecycle. In this video, you will learn about the benefits of PPD-IOO, as well as its design methodology. You will also learn about how to identify customer requirements for network design and the characteristics of a customer network. And then finally, we'll discuss design approaches, and design documentation. So let's begin. Cisco has formalized a network's life cycle into six phases. Prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. And these phases are collectively known as PPDIOO. The life cycle has four main benefits. It lowers the total cost of ownership. It increases network availability. It improves business agility. And it speeds access to applications and services. Let's discuss the PPDIOO phases in detail. First, the prepare phase. This phase establishes organization and business requirements develops a network strategy and proposes a high-level conceptual architecture to support that strategy. Technologies that support the architecture are identified in this phase, as well as a business case to establish the financial justification for the strategy. The plan phase identifies the network requirements based on goals, facilities, and user needs. This phase characterizes sites and assesses the network, performs a gap analysis against best practice architectures, and looks at the operational environment. In the design phase, the network design is developed based on the technical and business requirements obtained from the previous phases. A good design will provide high availability, reliability, security, scalability, and performance. In the implement phase, new equipment is installed and configured according to the design specifications. In this phase, any planned network changes should be communicated in change control meetings and with the necessary approvals to proceed. The operate phase maintains the network's day-to-day -day operational health, 
Operations include managing and monitoring network components and performing the appropriate maintenances. And then finally, the optimize phase, which involves proactive network management by identifying and resolving issues before they affect the network. Now there is a design methodology for the first three phases of the PPDIOO methodology. And there are three steps to it. In step one, decision makers identify the requirements and a conceptual architecture is proposed. In step two, the network is assessed. The network is assessed on function, performance, and quality. And then in step three, the network topology is designed to meet the requirements and close the network gaps identified in the previous two steps. Let's review these three phases in detail. To obtain customer requirements, you need not only to talk to network engineers, but you need to talk to the business personnel and company managers. Networks are designed to support applications and you want to determine the network services that you need to support, both now and in the future. This, this analysis is broken into five steps. First, identify network applications and services. Then define the organizational goals. Define the possible organizational constraints. And then define the technical goals. And finally, define the possible technical constraints. When you're characterizing an existing network, you need to obtain all of the existing documentation. Sometimes no formal documentation exists, so you need to be prepared to use tools to obtain the information needed and to get access to log into network devices to obtain the information required. Here are the steps you want to take to gather information. First, you're going to identify all existing organization information and documentation. Then you'll perform a network audit that adds detail to the description of the network. And then finally, you're going to use traffic analysis information to augment information on applications and protocols used. When you're designing the network topology and solutions, Cisco recommends that you use the top-down approach for network design. Top-down simply means starting your design from the top layer of the OSI model and working your way down. Top-down design adapts the network and physical infrastructure to the network application's needs. With a top-down approach, network devices and technologies are not selected until the application's requirements are analyzed. Here you can compare and contrast top-down versus bottom-up. A bottom-up design may result in an inappropriate design because the requirements of the organization, that is those requirements of the applications and the users using those applications, are not included in this type of design. Next, the design document itself. The design document should include the following sections the introduction, the design requirements, existing network infrastructure, including layer three topology diagrams, physical topology diagrams, audit results, network health analysis, routing protocols, applications, and a list of routers and switches and other devices, among many other things. Then the design portion, which actually contains the specific design information, such as logical, physical topology, IP addressing, routing protocols, etc. Proof of concept, which results from the live pilot or prototype testing. And then the implementation plan, which includes the detailed steps for the network staff to implement the new installation. And then the appendixes, which will list all the existing network devices configurations, and additional information used in the design of a network. So now it's your turn. Go ahead and on a piece of paper or a whiteboard, go ahead and draw out the PPDIOO methodology. Uh, start with the first step, 
the first P, I guess you could say, and write it out, and then write out the full chart of PPDIOO, uh, what each letter stands for, and also put a sentence next to each word to summarize the activity that occurs at that phase. Go ahead and do that now and pause the video. So let's see how you did. The first phase is prepare. The second phase is plan. The third phase is design. The fourth phase is implement. The fifth phase is operate. And the final phase is optimize. This is a life cycle. That is, it doesn't mean once you hit optimize that it's over. It's a continual process. Going from prepare, plan, over to design, implement, operate, and optimize. And then around again. On a regular basis, you're constantly looking at the network, seeing what can be done to make it run more efficiently and more cost effective. Now, assuming you went ahead and added a sentence or two after each word, here are some good foundational sentences or questions regarding what is going on in each phase. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the benefits and the design methodology of PPDIOO. You've learned how to identify customer requirements and the characteristics of a network. And then you dug into the design approach as far as top down versus bottom up and how to properly document a design. It appears from the study materials that Cisco does want you to focus in on the first three phases of PPDIOO, which is why this video also focused on the first three phases. Wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about SLA resources. Specifically, we're going to talk about how SLA and specifically SLCs affect network design. So many companies, vendors, and service providers must provide service level contract or SLCs to their partners or customers. And an SLA, which is a service level agreement, is a component of the overall service level contract. The SLC designates connectivity and the performance level that the service provider guarantees to its customers and the organization guarantees to its end users. The SLA defines specific parameters and performance measurements between devices, such as routers, servers, workstations or other equipment on the network. So here's an example of a service level agreement. As you can see, things are spelled out in detail regarding service to the customer, but also software updates, customer support, and then even a part of the contract states what the customer responsibility is. So that they're in the event of an outage or just on day-to-day -day disputes, uh, you can refer back to the contract so the customer and the provider are both very clear about what is expected. This protects both the customer and the provider so that roles and responsibilities are very clear. But when there is confusion or when there is a major outage, there is a legal backing for operation procedures and decisions. Now that being said, some of this needs to be measured and Cisco allows you to do that using Cisco IP SLA. Let's do a refresh on how 
Cisco IPSLA works. IPSLA allows you to monitor, analyze, and verify IP service levels. It's comprised of two components, a source and a target. Operations can broadly be categorized into five functional areas. Let's take a look at an example. You can use IP SLAs to monitor the performance between any area in the network, core distribution and edge, without deploying a physical probe. It uses generated traffic to measure network performance between two networking devices. So as we draw this out, this shows how IP SLAs begins when the source device sends a generated packet to the destination device. After the destination device receives the packet, depending on the type of IP SLA's operation, it responds with the timestamp information for the source to make the calculation on performance metrics. It then can communicate with a performance management application via SNMP to provide real-time analysis of the network. It should be noticed that IP SLA can communicate with any IP device on the network that's enabled for these types of measurements. Although this video has covered what you need to know for Cisco SLA, be aware that there are other white papers out there should you want to read more. And here they are. Service level management best practices, deploying service level management in an enterprise, and service level management defining and monitoring service levels in the enterprise. Now again, that being said, within this video and throughout this video series, you will have the information you need to do well on your CCDA exam. But again, we want to apply this to our work environments. So if you want to do additional reading, please refer to this. So here's what you've learned. You've received an overview of Cisco SLA. We talked about SLC service level contracts. So you have a foundational understanding of how this applies to any enterprise campus network. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about the Cisco Hierarchical Network Model. Specifically, you're going to learn about what Cisco calls the core distribution and access layers of a campus network. The information is rather straightforward, but it is information you'll need to know very well to do well on your CCDA exam. So let's begin. The most important idea concerning the Cisco hierarchical network model is the step-by-step -step construction of the network, which implements one module at a time, starting with the foundation. The implementation of each module can be supervised by a network architect, but the details are covered by a specialized team, such as routing or security or voice teams. This modular approach is the key to simplifying the network. Before we cover each module within the network model, let's talk about the main advantages of the Cisco hierarchical network model. There are eight key advantages. Ease to understand and implement, flexibility, cost savings, modularity, it's easily modified, it allows for network growth, it facilitates summarization, of networks and there is also built-in fault isolation. The three-tier model was created in order to make the construction of networks easier to understand. Cisco has always tried to make efficient and cost-effective networks with a modular structure so they can easily be divided into building blocks. The modular network design facilitates modifications in certain modules after their implementation and makes it easy to track faults in the network. The Cisco hierarchical network model is defined by three layers, the core or backbone layer, 
the distribution layer, and the access layer. Now if you're working for a small company, these layers might be collapsed. Core and distribution are often collapsed into a single layer, or sometimes all three layers are collapsed. That being said, let's dive into each of the layers. The access layer is the on-ramp to the network. So for the most part, any end user or device that wants to connect to the network will do so via the access layer. As you can see, access layer switches should have redundant connectivity to the distribution layer. This will ensure network connectivity for the hosts even when there is an equipment failure. You could take it another step further and provide redundant connectivity for the host to the access layer switches, but this is the exception to the rule and certainly not the norm. The access layer is comprised of layer 2 switches, workstations, IP telephones, or any other device that requires access to the network. Here are some specific features you should be aware of at the access layer. It should provide high availability and flexible security features. You can also implement authentication, broadcast control, and it's where you would define QoS trust boundaries. In the access layer, you would also implement rate limiting techniques, and it's where you would often program spanning tree protocol, include power over ethernet for your phones, and configure voice VLAN settings. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to both the access and core layers. The distribution layer is often where the brains of the network resides, since many decisions such as filtering, quality of service, and policy-based routing are performed in the distribution layer. As you can see, the distribution layer has redundant connectivity to the access and core layers. The distribution layer normally has advanced layer 3 switches that can support a wide array of functionality to support the services required from this layer. Here are the attributes of the distribution layer. It gives access control to core devices. It has redundancy to access devices. It's where the boundaries are for routing protocols. You, redistribution occurs at this layer, as well as filtering, route summarization, policy routing, and here you will see your security implemented. It provides separate multicast and broadcast domains using layer 2 and layer 3 technologies and provides routing between VLANs. It is a media translation and provides boundaries for media and also provides redistribution. There is a lot going on in the core layer. The high-speed switching fabric ensures that all modules which connect to the core are serviced immediately. You rarely will put any programming on these switches that could cause them to slow down processing. For example, no QoS, no ACLs. Rather, you want to keep it so that these high-end switches spend their time processing forwarding traffic rather than doing anything else. Although it's not always required to have redundancy to and from the distribution and access layers, redundancy is certainly required in the core. As you can see, the core is the hub for the interconnects in the network. It connects to the server farm, to the distribution layer, and then off to the enterprise edge as well. So having a high performing core is critical. Here are some key features of the core layer that you will want to memorize. The core layer is high speed, it's reliable, it's redundant, it has fault tolerance and load balancing, it has manageability and scalability. In the core layer there are no filters, packet handling, or other overhead that would slow traffic down or the processing of traffic down. It has a limited but consistent diameter and it can provide quality of service. 
The Cisco core distribution and access layer hierarchical model is rather straightforward, but that's the point. Cisco wants you to know this by memory and the features of each of the modules in preparation for your CCDA exam. Not only by watching this video are you prepared for your CCDA exam regarding these areas, you're also a much better engineer now that you understand the basic organization of a campus network. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Cisco Intelligent Network Services. Intelligent Network Services are essential support services that are part of the network and enable applications. This involves a rich set of different processes that enable packet forwarding on an IP network and may include network management tools, quality of service, security mechanisms, high availability, voice transport and content networking. We will cover all of these topics in this video. So let's begin with network management. Network management is an intelligent network service that allows the management and monitoring of the server farm and network devices in different blocks. Also WAN or LAN connections. This also involves system administration for servers with software tools specific to each operating system provider or third-party tools. Network management also includes logging, usually through a syslog server implementation, or security features such as one-time password or OTP. Next, let's discuss quality of service. Quality of service invokes a wide variety of techniques used especially in networks that offer multimedia services, voice and or video. Because these services are usually delay sensitive and require low latency and low jitter. Traffic generated by these applications must be prioritized, which is the role of QoS techniques. In this example, we have voice coming from a telephone hitting a switch. And that's fine, but as soon as it goes upstream, let's say to the distribution layer or the core layer, there's going to be contention other traffic is going to be fighting with this traffic for priority. So we want to move the voice because of its very nature to quote unquote a fast lane or an express lane and therefore through QoS proper marking of traffic and servicing of those markings the voice traffic can be given higher priority. That's just one example of how QoS can be used in your network. Please note, QoS is never supposed to be the first solution to solve problems. It's really supposed to be used as a last resort. Ideally, you have enough bandwidth to service any application that needs to communicate over your network. For the times that you do not have enough bandwidth or you're concerned about performance, then quality of service would be crucial to give priority to the traffic when there is contention, to give priority to the high priority traffic such as voice or video. Next let's talk about network security. Security is an intelligent service and it's vital to the health of a network. Security invokes such features as authentication services such as Radius or TACX, encryption, and filtering. Network security design principles are presented later in the CCDA video series but please note that this is a part of intelligent network services from Cisco. Next is network availability. Network availability and network management are two of the most critical technology areas in network design. These areas impact all other technologies presented to you in the CCDA studies. The focus of this section or this video right now is high availability network design. High availability is often a factor taken into consideration when designing end-to-end -end solutions. This assures redundancy for network services and for the end users and is accomplished by ensuring that the network devices are reliable and fault tolerant. 
Many redundancy options can be utilized in different components of modern networks. Here are some examples. Workstation to router redundancy at the access layer, server redundancy in the server farm, route redundancy, media redundancy in the access layer block. Each of these areas are now going to be covered in detail because you may be tested in detail on any of these in your CCDA exam. The most important topic in the list of redundancy that we've just spoken about is workstation to router redundancy because access devices must maintain their default gateway information. If they don't, most likely they're going to lose network connectivity. As mentioned before, modern networks respect the 80-20 model, which states that 80% of traffic will pass through a default gateway and 20% of the destinations will be local. So this is a perfect example of why a default gateway must be available. Workstation to router redundancy can be accomplished in multiple ways. First, proxy ARP. This involves a workstation that has no default gateway configured, but wants to communicate with a remote host. A request for the address of the host is sent, and the router that hears this request realizes that it can service it. That is, it knows it can reach the client. So it responds on behalf of the client using a proxy ARP. The router actually pretends to be the host, so the workstation can send traffic destined to that specific client to the router. Next is explicit configuration. This allows you to create multiple default gateways within the configuration of an endpoint. Many operating systems allow for this programming of multiple default gateways to be configured. But the most common way of establishing workstation redundancy is to use first hop redundancy protocols. These are HSRP, VRRP, and GLBP. HSRP is a Cisco proprietary first hop redundancy protocol. Two versions of HSRP are supported on iOS software. Version one, and this is the default HSRP version. And this restricts the number of configurable HSRP groups to 255. I don't expect you should be exceeding that anytime soon. And then there's version two. Some updates to version two, it uses a new multicast address, among many other things that you can see here. Finally, HSRP authentication gives you the option of plain text or MD5 authentication. MD5 authentication can be configured with or without keychains. When implementing HSRP, two or more routers are configured with a standby IP address on a broadcast interface, usually an Ethernet segment. So while they will each have a local IP address, in this case dot two and dot three, a passive election is held to determine the active router, which is actually answering for the gateway IP address dot one. The active router answers ARP requests for the standby IP address with a virtual MAC address, so that the host sends packets to the gateway IP address, winds up sending it to the active router. Now, if the active router dies, then another election is held. And in this case, traffic would go out the dot three interface, even though traffic would still be pointing to the virtual dot one IP address. VRRP is an open standard first hop redundancy protocol, which elects a virtual router master and then virtual router backups. You can configure up to 255 virtual routers on an interface. That is if your system is capable of handling it. The default VRRP priority value is 100. And that's important to note because the lower you set it, the less likely it's going to take over as the master. The higher you set it, the more likely it will be. The virtual router master is in charge of sending advertisements to the other routers in the same group. And VRRP, it should be noted, can support both plain text and MD5 authentication. So let's say we have three switches with VRRP, which is non-proprietary, in VRRP, one router is elected as the virtual router master, and the other routers are acting as backups in case the virtual router master fails. So in this case, the master has been elected. 
Dot three and dot four will serve as backups to dot two. Dot two will answer to the virtual IP address, and if it were to fail, then a backup device would take over. In this example, that would be the dot three device. And if the dot three system failed, then the final backup system, dot four, would take over. Next, let's cover GLBP. GLBP allows multiple gateways in the same GLBP group to actively forward traffic. So instead of just one device forwarding traffic, you can have multiple. Gateway, gateways communicate via hellos messages that are sent by default every three seconds. The GLBP group members elect one gateway to be the AVG. Now the AVG answers all ARP requests to the virtual router address and assigns a virtual MAC address to each member of the GLBP group. GLBP has many other features, but you should really focus on the fact that GLBP does provide load sharing and many different load sharing methods, host dependent, round robin, and weighted. And it does support plain text and or MD5 authentication. But the big advantage and the question you're most likely to get regarding GLBP is when would you use it? And you would use it if you would like to load balance between devices. GLBP provides a standby IP just as HSRP, but it also provides multiple virtual MAC addresses. So when a host on the connected network sends an ARP request, one of the routers answers with the virtual MAC address. Now this does allow for load balancing. You can load balance across multiple systems instead of just relying on one system to serve all the traffic. In this case, we're gonna load balance 50% to router one, 20% to router two, and 30% of the traffic to router three. This can be done because you're using virtual MAC addresses, which take turns answering traffic requests. If a router were to fail, the other remaining routers could take over for all the traffic. Next, let's talk about server redundancy. Server-based redundancy technologies can be implemented in server farms or data centers. This is often needed to ensure high availability for key server functions, such as file or application sharing. One way to solve this problem is to mirror multiple servers so that if one server fails, the network can dynamically fail over to another server. With cloud computing, this obviously becomes a non-issue. The servers become more virtual in nature. The only time you would truly need redundancy would be if you're concerned about an entire area or entire city losing connectivity due to a major catastrophe. Then you could make sure that your data is replicated throughout the cloud, maybe even to different cloud providers. Next, let's talk about route redundancy. With WAN configuration, configuring redundancy between the campus infrastructures is a best practice. In order to achieve this, you can implement load balancing at the routing protocols level. This increases availability because in the case of a direct path failure, as you can see here between two sites, these two sites can still reach each other by going via a different location. Next is media redundancy. This is useful in case one link fails. Media redundancy demands the configuration of spanning tree protocol at layer two in order to avoid loops that can bring the network down. Another technology used to achieve media redundancy is ether channel. This layer two logical bundling or channel aggregation technique can be used between switches. The bundled links can appear as one single link between specific devices. Now, should there be a link failure between two switches, data would continue to pass using the existing configuration, even though there would not be as much bandwidth available, but data would still pass because you have this redundant connectivity through ether channel. Next, let's talk about voice transport. Voice transport is a network solution that is implemented on top of the existing network infrastructure. 
When designing voice transport solutions, you must carefully consider the existing enterprise network already in place. And it's very important that you first implement the data solution. After that, you can integrate voice and data on the same network infrastructure. Next, let's talk about content networking. Content networking is also known as CDN, or Content Delivery Networking. It's a service that is used more and more in modern and large enterprise networks, and it offers more sophisticated types of network solutions and applications that accommodate video and voice for online services. Using intranet and internet broadcasts, this can be delivered as training modules using different audio and visual streaming technologies. But content networking demands content-aware technologies from a Cisco environment in the campus infrastructure, including content-aware hardware and content-aware software. So there are three technologies we want to talk about. Content routing, content caching, and content switching. The first component of CDN, content routing, is the process that actually redirects a user to the best device in the network. Based on a set of well-defined user policies, there are specific rules for the different types of content delivered in the network infrastructure. One rule might be the server load. If it is high in one place, the rule may dictate that traffic is forwarded in a different way. Content routing can deliver the contents as quickly as possible using high availability techniques and fast server responses. Next is content caching. From a Cisco standpoint, content caching could be delivered by a CCE or Cisco content engine, and this module can be found on a router. This speeds up the delivery of content for end users because it transparently caches information used on a regular basis, as well as frequently accessed content, so the request can be fulfilled locally. Finally, content switching. The third component of CDN which is known as web switching or content switching. This is used for content delivery to different network modules and is a sophisticated mechanism for load balancing and for accelerating the intelligence of the content. Content switching gives users a much better web experience by delivering the content much more quickly and by customizing the content for individual users. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco Intelligent Network Services, specifically network management tools, quality of service mechanisms, security mechanisms, high availability, voice transport, and content networking. For some of these, we covered them higher level because the information is available for you in other videos, such as network management tools and security mechanisms. All of this information you'll need to do well on your CCDA exam, and I hope this video has been helpful. Good luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about geographical and application considerations in network design. First, let's begin with geographical considerations. The geographical considerations regarding the enterprise campus network design involve locating the entire campus building blocks and the components of those blocks and then determining the distance between them. The geographical structures can be broken down into four different types of geography. Intra-building, which is inside the building. Inter-building, between buildings. Remote building, which is relatively close, which is less than 100 kilometers away. Or a remote building that is greater than 100 kilometers away. First, let's begin with intra-building design. An intra-building structure can be comprised of a single floor or multiple floors, but it's in a single building. The goal is to connect all the different components, such as servers, workstations, printers, and give all of them access to the network resources depending on their type of system. 
The access and distribution layers are typically located in an intra-building area. User workstations are connected either to a wiring closet or directly to an access layer switch that is connected to a distribution layer switches and then ultimately those are connected into the core. In tear building design, now with this network structure, links this links individual buildings in the campus or corporate complex using the distribution layer or it could be at the core layer as well, depending on the size of the organization. The distance between buildings should range from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers, usually less than one mile. The connection between the buildings should provide as high bandwidth and throughput as possible. Now, another issue is ensuring that there is very little environmental interference. So the typical medium used in this case is optical fiber. The optical fiber used can be either multi-mode fiber or single-mode fiber. Multi-mode and single-mode fiber share common characteristics. The cabling uses glass or plastic fibers to move the information from building to building. They're made, the cables are made from a bundle of threads, each of which can transmit messages modulated under light waves. Optical fiber has greater bandwidth than copper cables, so it can carry more data and it is less susceptible to interference. Fiber optic cables are also much thinner and lighter than metal wires, and data can be transmitted digitally, which is the natural way in which computer data moves, rather than through analog singling, signaling. Now the big disadvantage of fiber optic is that the cables are more expensive to install. They're often more fragile and difficult to split up. But despite these disadvantages, fiber optic cabling is becoming more and more popular for local area networking and telecom provider infrastructure. Let's look at the differences between multi-mode and single-mode fiber. Multi-mode has the following characteristics specific installation and performance guidelines. It also has specific connectors. Concurrently transports multiple lightweight waves and modes within the core. Used for relatively short distances. Typical diameter is 50 to 62.5 micrometers. Bandwidth is usually up to 10 gigabits per second. Range is 550 meters when using gigabit ethernet. Used between nodes and between buildings and it's obviously more expensive than copper. Single mode fiber has the following characteristics. Specific installation and performance guidelines, carries a single light laser. Typical diameter of core is two to 10 micrometers. Bandwidth is usually up to 10 gigabits per second. Range is up to 100 kilometers when using gigabit ethernet. But the key to remember is single mode is used between nodes and buildings for longer distances than multi-mode fiber. Next, let's talk about remote buildings. The campus infrastructure can be spread over a metropolitan area or over a larger area than that, so different parts of a city. And if you're dealing with distances within a few miles, you might focus on the physical needs. First, you need to determine whether the company owns any of the copper lines, and if it does, you can build from there. But you also might need to connect an enterprise campus network through the WAN block. Now, if this is the case, you should leverage the existing telecom providers in that specific area. And then you also may want to consider using satellite or various wireless technologies to connect your site as well. But as the distance between the sites grows, the following actions will occur. Connectivity costs increase, required throughput will decrease, and importance of availability will decrease. Next, let's talk about network applications. Another important factor when designing campus switching is considering the network applications that will be used. Once the physical and geographical aspects are clear, the network designer needs to characterize what types of applications will be processed within the network. The first category of applications that must be identified involves the critical or core applications, and the rest of the services fall under the optional intelligence category. 
The network applications can be divided into four types, client to client applications, client to distributed server applications, client to server farm applications, and client to enterprise edge applications. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about design considerations, not only for geography, but also for application types. And then you need to know how to break out systematically what type of design challenges are you facing so that you just aren't trying to design generally, but you're being specific about the geographical issues you're facing, but also the network applications that you need to support. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Layer 2 technologies and Layer 3 switching. Let's begin first with Layer 2 technologies. Layer 2 technologies relate to the OSI data link layer. Now today's modern enterprise, which is a distributed networking world of multimedia and client applications, dictates the need for greater bandwidth and a greater degree of control. Over the past 10 years, almost all organizations have replaced their shared networking technology, such as hubs, with switches to create switched technologies. A concept you need to understand is a collision domain and what exactly a collision domain is. A collision domain is comprised of nodes and devices that share the same bandwidth. And this is called a bandwidth domain. For instance, everything that is connected to a switch port via a hub is in the same collision domain. This means there is always the possibility of a collision in the operations of that particular Ethernet. A broadcast domain, on the other hand, represents a collection of devices that can see each other's broadcast or multicast packets. Nodes that are in the same collision domain are also in the same broadcast domain. For example, all devices associated with the port of a router are in the same broadcast domain. And by default, broadcasts do not traverse a router's port interface. When a shared technology is used, such as hubs, all the devices share the bandwidth of the specific network segment. When using switched technologies, each device in the switch port is its own collision domain. However, all the devices are in the same broadcast domain. Now, here's some of the basics. You know, why LAN switches? Why did they overtake the market? There was a time when bridges were quite popular. Well, LAN switches have quite a few advantages over bridges. Uh, specifically, they have more ports than a bridge would ever be capable of supporting. Micro segmentation allows individual hosts to be connected to individual ports. Um, they operate at hardware speed using ASICs versus software used by bridges. They support layer three and layer four packet switching by using MLS features. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And finally, probably the most important feature of LAN switching nowadays is the, the VLAN. So they can use VLANs to create smaller logical broadcast domains on your network. Now, let's just, get, let's just get back to basics here. LAN switching is a form of packet switching, which is used on local area networks. LAN switches provide, and as you already know, they provide much higher port density and at a much lower cost than traditional bridges did. Now there, are three, now there are three main forwarding techniques that can be used by switches. Store and forward, cut through, and fragment free. Let's just do a basic drawing here to better understand these concepts. So let me draw out first a frame that is passing through a switch. And then after I draw this frame, I'm going to draw a line here and that will designate the memory of the switch. So if the frame is passed into memory, we will designate it by going underneath this line. 
Let's cover cut through switching first. With cut through switching, the LAN switch copies into its memory only the destination MAC address, which is located in the first six bytes of the frame. The, the switch looks up the destination MAC address in its switching table and determines the outgoing interface port and then forwards the frame to its destination through the designated switch port. A cut through switch reduces delay because the switch begins to forward the frame as soon as it reads the destination MAC address. This is in contrast to store and forward switching. Store and forward switching means that the LAN switch copies each complete frame into its switch memory buffers. And then it computes a CRC check for errors. The CRC check uses a mathematical formula to determine whether the frame is errored. And if an error is found, it's discarded. But if it's error free, the switch will forward the frame out the appropriate interface port. Finally, there's fragment free switching, which is also known as runtless switching. Basically, frames that are damaged, which is often happen by collisions, are often shorter than the minimum valid Ethernet frame size of 64 bytes. If a frame is smaller than 64 bytes, the switch will discard that frame. Fragment free is a faster mode than store and forward, but there still exists a risk of forwarding bad frames because you do not have the CRC check. Now, LAN switching can be characterized as either symmetric or asymmetric. Now, symmetric switching provides evenly distributed bandwidth to each port on the switch. And this is typically used in a peer-to-peer -peer desktop environment. Where you see asymmetric switching is when we're talking about endpoints communicating with bandwidth-intensive uh, services such as servers. So this provides unequal bandwidth between ports on a switch. And this is actually the most common type of switching and it's optimized for client server environments. You may have a server that demands a 10 gigabit port where many of your clients obviously don't need that much speed and may only have a 1 gigabit port or if you have an older switch a 100 megabit port. Now in the old days, basic rule of thumb in designing a local area network and wide area network was that 80% of the traffic was going to remain on the local area network. Thus, it was called the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the traffic stays local, and you should plan for that. Well, with the advent and the, with the popularity of the Internet and server farms, uh, this has really resulted in the flipping of those numbers. Now we need to design our networks with, a, with the idea that probably only 20% of the traffic is, is going to stay local on the local area network, whereas 80% is, is going to leave the local area network. So this new paradigm, this new 2080 20, rule, places a much greater burden on the network backbone. Next, let's talk about layer three switching. Historically, LAN switching typically involves layer 2 switching at the access layer and sometimes at the distribution layer. Layer 2 switches forward information based only on the MAC address, that is the layer 2 frame address. Layer 3 switching, however, uses the MAC address in addition to the layer 3 address, which is typically nowadays an IP address. The following three options exist when considering designing a switched environment layer 2 switching throughout the network, a combination of layer 2 and layer 3 switching, and then layer 3 switching throughout the network. Using layer 2 switching, layer 3 switching, or a combination of the two also depends on the available switching platforms, as not all switches support layer 3 technologies. At the heart of a switched network is the concept of VLANs. So what exactly is a VLAN? Well, Cisco says it's a group of N stations with a common set of requirements. Using VLANs allows you to put many different devices in many different locations on the same logical network, on the same layer two network. Um, in the past, without VLANs, uh, you would have had to rely upon uh, simple hardware solutions, but a VLAN allows you to virtualize your layer two segment. VLANs are usually associated by the same subnet. So normally devices on a VLAN are, sh are sharing the same subnet. And, and with this in mind, 
they're sharing the same broadcast domain. That is the norm. And then VLANs must be routed to communicate with other VLANs. So it is a true layer two segment. Um, a VLAN is not going to be able to communicate with another VLAN unless it is passed through a layer three device which can route it. Now, there are two types of switch port types for VLAN membership that we need to understand. And the first is the access port. Now, access ports can only belong to a single VLAN. Now, when you think of an access port, it's pretty much probably what you think of. It's usually for end devices like a workstation or a server. It is a device that is an end station. And again, access port can only belong to a single VLAN typically used to connect end devices. And there are two methods to assign ports uh, to VLANs. Uh, for these access ports. The, the first, which is by far the, the most popular, is the static VLAN assignment. So an administrator actually doing it, and then dynamic VLAN assignment, which is done by a server. So let's dig a little bit more into that, into those two concepts. So when we have a static VLAN assignment, the network administrator is actually manually configuring a switch port to be a part of a VLAN the network administrator is saying is programming the port to say you are going to be an access port and you're going to be associated with this specific vlan now you can do this dynamically and this is not as popular but there is something called a vlan management policy server which can assign a desired vlan to users connecting to a switch we don't need to get much deeper than that uh, for your exam but you, need to do, you do need to know these two methods. Now there's another type of port that we need to understand to understand the concept of VLANs and that is trunk ports. And trunk ports are used to carry data from multiple VLANs. So access ports only allow communication from one end device over a specific VLAN. Well, ultimately, if you're hosting many VLANs, uh, this traffic is going to need to be able to communicate um, throughout your network uh, so that they're not limited uh, limited by a hardware device. So your VLAN may your VLANs may be spread throughout um, many floors or maybe even many buildings. Trunk ports allow you to carry data from all these different VLANs between all your different hardware devices. Now there are some standard VLAN numbers and ranges you should know. Um, specifically, let's focus on 2 to 1001. These VLANs are created and used and deleted on all Cisco Catalyst switches. And another one that you should really focus in on is the range of 1006 to 4094. These are extended, this is an extended range of VLANs for Ethernet VLANs only. Now you may be asked about these other ranges, but I would focus in on VLAN ranges 2 to 1001 and 1006 to 4094. VLAN trunks are used to carry data from multiple VLANs, which you already know. Now there are two methods, two protocols that can be used uh, to build these trunks. And the first is inner switch link or ISL. And that's a Cisco proprietary protocol that is used to preserve the source VLAN identification information for frames that traverse trunk links. And then there is, I would say, the more popular 802.1Q, which is an open standard. And then it performs a little bit differently than the Cisco proprietary protocol. Now, the reason 802.1Q is so popular is you probably understand that for obvious reasons, that if you want to trunk between two devices, let one is Cisco and one is non-Cisco, uh, you're able to do that. So this standard works very effectively and 802.1Q is very popular, but you will definitely be asked about ISL and you will definitely be asked about the differences between ISL and 802.1Q. Now, so you've received a lot of information right now. So let's go ahead and kind of draw out some of these concepts that we've been talking about. So when we think of VLANs, we think first of we need to connect 
endpoints need to connect on a local area network. So here we have four endpoints and we have one switch. And each of these endpoints uh, need to communicate and not all of them need to communicate with, with each other. So let's say we have two workstations and two servers and we're going to put this one workstation in, in VLAN 10 and this other workstation in VLAN 10 and then these two servers in VLAN 2. These two servers are segmented on their own VLAN and as are the workstations. They cannot communicate between each other, um, between VLAN 2 and 10, but anything on VLAN 10 can communicate with VLAN 10. Now here's another dedicated VLAN, we'll say VLAN 3 to a dedicated device. Now and here is a router. So for any of these VLANs to communicate with one another, they need to pass through a layer three device. So this, this workstation that from VLAN 10, if it wants to communicate over to a server, it needs to be routed and go through the router and passed over to VLAN 2. Um, and let's say you want to keep VLAN 3 devices um, not accessible from the network. You can prevent that. So here we have other devices on VLAN 3. And we'll say, let's say this is a backend connection between two servers that we have no need to route it. VLAN 3 can be segmented from the entire network. Nobody can reach it. So there's some security built into VLANs as well. Now VLANs can extend, obviously, over to other hardware platforms. So this router is connected to another switch. And on this switch, let's say that's in a different building, we have another device on VLAN 2, another device, another endpoint, um, on an access port to VLAN 10. And if they want to communicate over to the other building, let's say VLAN 2 or VLAN 10, they simply go over this trunk port, you know that term, uh, goes over the trunk port and can communicate over to the other sites. When designing a full layer 2 environment using VLANs, a router might be used to provide routing between the VLANs. This technique is called router on a stick because only one router interface is used to carry all the VLANs. When exclusively using layer two switches and VLANs throughout the network, all the policies, access lists, and quality of service rules will be managed at the data link layer. The policy capabilities are very limited at the data link layer, but they are greatly enhanced in layer three switches. Another area in which layer two switches are limited is load sharing capabilities used to ensure redundant links, that is multiple paths throughout the network. This is because layer two switches only know about MAC addresses and they cannot perform intelligent load sharing. For example, based on a de destination network, layer three switches can do that. Layer three switches also support dynamic routing protocols. Therefore, with layer two switching, the load can be shared only on a per VLAN basis. In addition, when using layer two switches only, the basis of all failures or the failure domain will be isolated to the VLAN only. On the other hand, in a multi-layer environment, the failures can be better isolated at the access layer, to the core layer, or even particular network segments. In a layer two switched environment, only STP, that is Spanning Tree Protocol, offers convergence and loop control. However, when using layer three switching, this feature can also be implemented at the distribution and core layers using routing protocol technologies such as OSPF or EIGRP. And when considering cost, using layer two everywhere is the cheapest solution, but this is also much less flexible and much less manageable. Using layer three switches throughout the network is the most expensive option, but it's very powerful and flexible. A compromise would be to implement layer three switches only in the distribution layer. And then eventually as the budget allows and the network scales, extend the layer three switches into the core layer for full layer three switching at the distribution and core layers. So in this video, you've learned about layer two technologies and layer three switching. And this, will, this information will provide you with a solid foundation to do well on your CCDA exam. Thank you.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, we're going to be covering the cable specifications for local area networks. Specifically, this video is going to review LAN media and its components. We need to identify some of the constraints you should consider when provisioning various LAN media types. Ethernet is the underlying basis for the technologies most widely used in local area networks today. In the 1980s and early 1990s, most networks used 10 megabit per second Ethernet, defined initially by Digital, Intel, and Xerox, and then later by the IEEE 802.3 Working Group. The IEEE 802.3-2002 standard contains physical specifications for Ethernet technologies up to 10 gigabits per second. The following table is something you should know well for your CCDA exam. It describes the physical Ethernet specifications up to 100 megabits per second. It provides scalability information that you can use when provisioning IEEE 802.3 networks. Of these specifications, the 10 base 5 and 10 base 2 are no longer used but are included for completeness. Fast Ethernet is preferred over 10 base T Ethernet. Let's talk about some of the 100 megabit per second fast Ethernet design rules. IEEE introduced IEEE 802.3U-1995 standard to provide Ethernet speeds of 100 megabit per second over UTP and fiber cabling. The 100 base T standard is similar to 10 megabit per second Ethernet in that it uses carrier sense multiple access collision detect which you probably know as CSMA slash CD. Let's discuss the following specifications for fast Ethernet. 100 base TX fast Ethernet. This specification uses CAT5 UTP wiring. Like 10 base T, fast Ethernet uses only two pairs of the four pair UTP wiring. If CAT5 cabling is already in place, upgrading to fast Ethernet requires only a hub or a switch and any network interface card upgrades. Because of the low cost, most of today's installations use switches. The specifications for this standard are as follows. Transmission over CAT5 UTP, an RJ45 connector, punch down blocks in the wiring closet must be CAT5 certified, and 4B, 5B coding. Let's discuss now the 100 base T4 fast Ethernet standard. The 100 base T4 specification was developed to support UTP wiring at the CAT3 level. This specification takes advantage of higher speed Ethernet without recabling to CAT5 UTP. This implementation is not widely deployed, but here are the specifications. It can transmit over CAT3, 4, or 5 UTP wiring. Three pairs are used for transmission, and the fourth pair is used for collision detection. No separate transmit and receive pairs are present, so full duplex operation is not possible. And the coding is 8B6T. Next, let's discuss 100 base FX fast Ethernet. This is a specification for fiber. It operates over two strands of multi-mode or single-mode fiber cabling. It can transmit over greater distances than copper media. It uses a media interface connector, ST stab and twist, or SC stab and click fiber connectors, defined for FDDI and 10 base FX networks. To make 100 megabit per second Ethernet work, distance limitations are much more severe than those required for 10 megabit per second Ethernet. Repeater networks have no five hub rule. Fast Ethernet is limited to two repeaters. The general rule is that 100 megabit per second Ethernet has a maximum diameter of 205 meters with UTP cabling, whereas 10 megabit per second Ethernet has a maximum diameter of 500 meters with 10 base T and 2500 meters with 10 base 5. Most networks today use switches rather than repeaters 
which limits the length of 10 base T and 100 base TX to 100 meters between the switch and host. Now, the distance limitation imposed depends on the type of repeater. The IEEE 100 base T specification defines two types of repeaters, class one and class two. Class one repeaters have a latency of 0.7 microseconds or less. Only one repeater hop is allowed. Class two repeaters have a latency of 0.46 microseconds or less and one or two repeater hops are allowed. Now let's talk about gigabit ethernet design rules. Gigabit ethernet was first specified by two standards, IEEE 802.3Z-1998 and 802.3AB-1999. The IEEE 802.3Z standard specifies the operation of gigabit ethernet over fiber and coax cable and introduces the gigabit media independent interface, the GMII. These standards are superseded by the latest revision of all the 802.3 standards included in IEEE 802.3-2002. The IEEE 802.3 AB standard specified the operation of Gigabit Ethernet over CAT5 UTP. Gigabit Ethernet still retains the frame formats and frame sizes and it still uses CSMA CD. As with Ethernet and Fast Ethernet, full duplex operation is possible. Differences appear in the encoding. Gigabit Ethernet uses 8 Bravo 10 Bravo coding with simple non-return to zero. Because of the 20% overhead, pulses run at 1,250 MHz to achieve a 1,000 megabits per second throughput. This chart you will definitely want to know in preparation for your CCDA exam. Let's talk about the Gigabit Ethernet standards in detail. The 1000 base LX, that is the long wavelength Gigabit Ethernet standard, uses long wavelength optics over a pair of fiber strands. The specifications are as follows. It uses long wave on multi-mode or single mode fiber. The maximum lengths for multi-mode fiber are 62.5 micrometer fiber, which is 450 meters, or 50 micrometer fiber at 550 meters. Maximum length for single mode fiber is five kilometers. The IEEE 1000 base SX standard uses short wavelength optics over a pair of multi-mode fiber strands. Its maximum lengths are 260 and 550 meters respectively. The IEEE 1000 base CX standard is for short copper runs between servers. It runs over a pair of 150 ohm balanced coax cables. Maximum length is 25 meters, and this is obviously mainly used for server connections. And then finally, the 1000 base T gigabit Ethernet over UTP standard. It was approved in June 1999 and now included in IEEE 802.3-2002. This standard uses the four pairs in the cable. Maximum length is 100 meters. Encoding defined is a five level coding scheme and one byte is sent over the four pairs at 1250 megahertz. The IEEE 802.3AE supplement to the 802.3 standard was published in August of 2002 and it specifies the standard for 10 gigabit ethernet. It is defined for full duplex operation over optical media, UTP, and copper. 10 gig E has several physical media specifications based on different fiber types and encoding. Multimedia fiber and single mode fiber are used. And if you look at this diagram, this is something you will definitely want to memorize in preparation for your CCDA exam. Now, as noted previously in this video, there are several media types that are used for campus networks. 
and this chart is one you'll want to remember because it provides a good summary of the information you'll need to know for the different media types and when you may want to use them. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about campus LAN media types and this is something you will definitely be tested on in your CCDA exam. You've learned about the different Ethernet standards as well as the different campus transmission media types. And I'm confident if you master the material in this video, you'll, you'll do very well in this portion of your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about analyzing traffic in preparation for your CCDA exam. First, let's start with analyzing application traffic. One of the first enterprise campus design issues refers to analyzing the application traffic as it relates to the switched network design. The traffic patterns usually fall into one of the following scenarios local with a segment module and submodule, or distant remote traffic patterns. This implies traversing different segments or crossing submodules or modules in the campus design. Networks were originally designed according to the 80-20 rule, which states that 80% of the traffic is internal, 20% is remote. This concept has changed with the evolution of enterprise networking and distributed server networking in modern campus networks. So the ratio now is 2080, whereas 20% is for local traffic and 80% is for traffic that crosses between modules and segments. This change occurred as a result of servers no longer sitting in the workgroup areas. Generally, the application and backbone servers are placed in a server farm area. This puts a much higher load on the backbone because much of the traffic from the client side is going to the servers in the server farm through the core layer devices. This changes the way you will analyze application traffic. In order to exemplify the 80-20 rule, consider a workgroup area with various devices connected to a basic layer 2 switch using VLANs. The inner VLAN routing is accomplished on the routers that also allow access to an email server. According to the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of traffic stays within the VLAN, where 20, whereas 20% 20 of the traffic is going to the email server. On the other hand, for example, in the modern 2080 rule, consider a situation in which there are multiple logical departments using common resources with applications distributed throughout the organization. This means there are no dedicated servers located within the department, for example, database or file servers. All the data is stored in the server farm block. The end user's devices connect to a series of layer two or low end layer three switches before reaching the distribution layer block, where the high end layer three switches with high availability are located. The data flow finally reaches the server farm block consisting of modern database servers such as email, uh, applications, databases. In this example, the traffic distribution reflects the 2080 rule, meaning 20% of the network traffic stays local, while 80% of the traffic is moving across the distribution layer and backbone of the network. This is the reason you want your distribution and core layer links to be highly available and fast in order to move data across the enterprise quickly. The diagrams presented here represent a single building, but in large campus enterprise, you would have multiple buildings connected by the network backbone module. The network backbone is connected to the edge distribution submodule in order to provide external access from the network. Next, let's discuss analyzing multicast traffic. With the incredible advances of collaboration tools using the World Wide Web and the Internet, it is very likely that the organization will have to support multicast traffic. 
the process of multicasting opposed to the process of broadcasting or unicasting has the advantage of saving bandwidth because it sends a single stream of data to multiple nodes. The multicasting concept is used by every modern corporation around the world to deliver data to groups via the following methods. Corporate meetings, video conferencing, e-learning solutions, webcasting information, distributing applications, streaming news feeds, and streaming stock quotes. Multicast data is sent as a multicast group and users receive the information by joining that group using IGMP or Internet Group Management Protocol. Cisco multicast enabled routers can be used running multicast routing protocols such as PIM, Protocol Independent Multicast, so that they can forward the incoming multicast stream to a particular switch port. Cisco switches effectively implement multicasting using two main protocols, CGMP, which is Cisco Group Management Protocol, and IGMP snooping. CGMP allows switches to communicate with multicast-enabled routers to figure out whether any users attached to the switches are a part of any particular multicasting groups and whether they are qualified to receive the special stream of data. IGMP snooping allows the switch to intercept the multicast receiver registration message, and based on the gathered information, it makes changes to its forwarding table. IGMP snooping works only on Layer 3 switches because IGMP is a Layer 3 protocol. Next, let's discuss analyzing delay-sensitive traffic. If using multicasting or web streaming, e-commerce, e-learning solutions, or IP telephony, the traffic involved in this process will be delay sensitive, and QoS techniques might be necessary to ensure that this type of traffic is treated with priority. In Layer 3 applications, such as frame relay environments, using EIGRP, OSPF, or BGP as routing protocols with the ISP, it is very common to use QoS techniques to shape and control traffic at the IP layer. You can also use QoS at layer 2. When using QoS or analyzing or controlling delay sensitive traffic at layer 2, there are four categories of QoS techniques as follows. Tagging and traffic classification, congestion control, policy and shaping, and scheduling. As you can see in this diagram, you'll see that tagging and traffic classification happen between, have between the end user nodes through the access layer and up to the distribution layer. This is where packets are classified, grouped, and partitioned based on different priority levels or classes of service. This occurs, this occurs by inspecting the layer two packet headers and determining the priority of the traffic based on the traffic type. In this way, the traffic can be tagged and classified. The next three techniques, congestion control, policy and traffic shaping, and scheduling, occur in the distribution layer block and the edge distribution layer submodule, primarily on layer three switches. You want to avoid applying any QoS technique at the core layer because you want as little overhead as possible on the backbone so that they can successfully achieve their goals, which is fast connectivity, high availability, and reliability. Congestion control involves the interfaces of the access layer switches and the queuing mechanisms configured on them. Queuing techniques are used in order to deal with the congestion of packets coming into and out of the switch ports. This method ensures the traffic from critical applications will be forwarded properly especially when using real-time applications. So let's summarize what you've learned. In this video, you've learned about the different types of traffic that can traverse a switched network and how to handle that traffic. And some of this information has been at a higher level, such as QoS. But that being said, this is what Cisco expects you to know for the CCDA exam with the understanding that things will get quite a bit more granular in the follow-up videos, but also as you work your way up to CCDP. 
This is a good foundation for you to begin, and I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about enterprise campus design. Specifically, we're going to go through the questions that you need to ask, or Cisco at least expects you to ask, when you are designing the access, distribution, and core layer. So we're going to work our way up. We'll begin with the access layer. Whenever a network designer is in the process of designing the campus infrastructure's access layer block, the following important questions must be answered, and you may be tested on this in your CCDA exam. What are the current and future needs for end users or node ports in the existing wiring closets of that particular building? What kind of hardware can the company or the client afford? Can it afford modular devices? Uh, this will determine the degree of scalability in the access layer, an important factor that will allow the business to grow. Is the existing cabling adequate? Do you have CAT5 or CAT6 UTP cabling? Can you afford fiber cabling? If you are moving into a new building, you might consider installing fiber optic cabling even at the access layer. What are the performance and bandwidth requirements? What level of high availability is needed at the access layer? Generally, in the access layer block, you will not need as much redundancy. A certain degree of high availability might be needed if using modular network devices. What are the requirements to support VLAN, VTP, and STP? In a large enterprise campus design, you might not need to use multiple VLANs. So you can go straight to using layer three technologies in the access layer to avoid having multiple broadcast domains and to decrease the complexity of STP. What are the layer two traffic patterns for applications? And what multicasting needs and quality of service services are necessary at layer two? Next, we move up to the distribution layer. The distribution layer block combines and aggregates the access layer block components and it uses layer 2 and layer 3 switching to break up the work groups or VLANs and isolate the different network segments as failure domains and it also allows for the reduction of broadcast storms. It acts as a transit module between the access and core layers. Here are some important questions that must be answered before designing the distribution layer block. Should layer 2 or layer 3 switches be used? Cost is a big issue in this decision. The available budget will dictate the hardware that's going to be used. How many total users will you have to support? With a high number of users, such as greater than 500, layer 3 switching will be essential in the distribution layer. What are the high availability needs? Are the distribution layer switches modular and scalable? What type of intelligence services will be used in the distribution layer? You must consider different features that will be implemented in the distribution layer, such as security, quality of service, or multicasting. If any of these features are implemented, layer three switching is mandatory. Is the company prepared to manage and configure the distribution layer block? Should training or consultancy be added to the project budget to ensure that this particular blot will be properly managed. Will advanced SCP features be implemented? You should think about features such as RSTP, Backbone Fast, or Uplink Fast when connecting to the backbone layer, when connecting to the backbone block via layer two. These kinds of features can be found on almost all high-end modern switches and can help optimize and speed up the STP process. If a complete layer 3 switching model is used, you do not have to think about STP or additional features. Finally, 
the campus backbone block or core layer. The campus backbone design occurs very early in the overall infrastructure design process. As such, what follows are a few important questions you should ask yourself and your customers when it is time to design the campus backbone block. Do you have three or more separate locations, that is buildings, in the campus that are connected through an enterprise campus infrastructure? If you only have two buildings, you might not need a separate backbone block. A possible solution in this scenario would be to use high-speed fiber connections between the two buildings, distribution layers. Based on the present infrastructure, will the solution to the campus backbone be a layer two, layer two and three, or just a layer three switching solution? In the case of a large enterprise campus, do you have the budget for a full multi-layer backbone solution throughout? Is the organization ready for a high performance multi-layer switching environment? Things to consider here are training, personnel, budget, applications, support services, and intelligent services. Does the customer want to simplify and lower the number of links between the distribution layer switches and the server farm block edge distribution submodule? If so, you could make changes to or augment the present network infrastructure and redesign the campus backbone. What are the performance needs? The bandwidth needs for all the applications and services should be analyzed. How many high capacity links or ports are necessary for the campus backbone block? And what are the high availability redundancy demands? Multiple aspects should be taken into consideration, such as redundant connections, modules, and hardware platforms. Obviously, in this video, there's been a lot of questions asked, but all of them are very important questions to ask. We do not design in ivory towers. We must communicate with the customer and understand the needs. All of the questions you've learned today are not only questions you need to know to perform your job well, they could be questions that you would be expected to select if Cisco were to ask you on the CCDA exam, how would you prepare to design the enterprise campus network? Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we are going to cover data setter design considerations. We are going to walk you through each of the components of the data center so that we can talk about the individual questions and the individual considerations that need to be taken into account when planning out a data center. All of this is fair game for the CCDA exam, so let's go ahead and dig in. The data center concept has greatly evolved over the last few years, passing through many phases because of evolving technology. At the time of their appearance, data centers were centralized, and they used mainframes to manage the data. Mainframes were then managed using terminals, which are still used in modern data centers because of their resiliency, although they are definitely considered legacy components of data centers now. The third generation data centers are focused on modern technologies such as virtualization, which further reduce costs. These factors make this approach more efficient than the distributed data center model. Virtualization results in higher utilization of computing and network resources by sharing and allocating them on a temporary basis. The top layer of the data center topology includes virtual machines that are hardware abstracted into software entities running a guest operating system on top of a hypervisor. Below this layer are the unified computing resources which contain the service profiles that map to the identity of the server. The identity of the server contains details such as the following, memory, CPU, network interfaces, storage information, and boot image. The next layer, which is consolidated connectivity, contains technology such as 10 gigabit ethernet, fiber channel over ethernet, and fiber channel. And all of these are supported on the Cisco Nexus series. 
Next, let's talk about server considerations. Some very important aspects to consider when deploying servers in a data center include the following. The required power, the rack space needed, server security, virtualization support, and server management. The increasing number of servers used necessitates more power, and this has led to the need for energy efficiency in the data center. Rack servers usually consume a great deal of energy, even though they are low cost and provide high performance. An alternative to standalone servers are blade servers. They provide similar computing power but require less space, power, and cabling. Server virtualization is supported on both standalone and blade servers and provides scalability and better utilization of hardware resources. Next, let's talk about data center facility spacing considerations. Facility spacing and other considerations help to size the overall data center and decide where to position the equipment in order to, in order to provide scalability. The available space defines the number of racks that can be installed for servers and network equipment. An important factor con to consider is the floor loading parameters. Estimating the correct size of the data center has great influence on costs longevity, and flexibility. Several factors must be considered, including the following. The number of servers, the amount of storage equipment, the amount of network equipment, the number of employees served by the data center infrastructure, space needed for non-infrastructure areas, such as storage rooms, office space, and other areas, the weight of the equipment, loading, heat dissipation, and power consumption and power type. Physical security is another important consideration because data centers contain equipment that hosts sensitive company data, which must be secured from outsiders. Access to the data center must be well controlled. Next, let's talk about data center power considerations. The power in the data center facility is used to power server, storage, network equipment, cooling devices, sensors, and other additional systems. Estimating necessary power capacity involves collecting the requirements for all the current and future equipment, such as the following, servers, storage, network devices, UPS, generators, HVAC, and lighting. Next, let's discuss data center cooling considerations. Based on the type of equipment used, careful heating and cooling calculations must be provided. Blade server deployments allow for more efficient use of space, but increased the amount of heat per server. Some cooling solutions to address increased heat production include the following. Increase the space between the racks. Increase the number of HVAC units. Increase the airflow between devices. Next, let's talk about data center cabling considerations. A passive infrastructure for the data center is essential for optimal system performance. The physical network cabling between devices determines how these devices communicate with one another and with external systems. The cabling infrastructure type chosen impacts the physical connectors and the media type of the connectors. This must be compatible with the equipment interfaces. Two options are widely used today, copper and fiber optic cabling. The advantages of fiber optics are that they are less susceptible to external interfaces and they operate over greater distances than copper cables do. Cabling must remain well organized in order to maintain the passive infrastructure easily. Cabling infrastructure usability and simplicity is influenced by the following. The number of connections, media selection, and type of cabling termination organizers. As with any enterprise network, the enterprise data center architecture follows the multi-layer approach and can be structured in the core, aggregation, and access layers. I won't repeat all of the information for the data center core as you will find much of that information in the other videos. And the same is true for the distribution layer or what the, in the data center what is considered the aggregation layer. Where we want to focus in this video is the data center access layer. The main purpose of the data center's access layer is to provide layer two and layer three physical port access to different kinds of servers. Remember, 
we're talking about a data center here. So we're not talking about PCs or phones per se, but the actual servers that support them. This layer consists of high performance and low latency switches. Most data centers are built using layer two connectivity, although layer three is also available from a design standpoint. Pos possible physical loops that might be presented at layer two are managed by a spanning tree. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the important subtopics within data center design. It's not just about passing packets anymore. It's literally about providing the proper environment and space and power to support all of your network infrastructure. So in this video, you've learned some key categories or key topics within data center planning that you definitely will be asked about in your CCDA exam and you definitely will use should you plan out a data center for yourself. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about data center components. Specifically, you're going to learn about all the components you see here that you can find in a data center. Much of this may look new to you, especially if you do not work in a data center, but you're expected to know all of it for your CCDA exam, especially the new version of it, which seems to have more of a focus on data center technologies. So we're going to go ahead and cover fiber channel over ethernet, data center bridging, unified ports, intercloud fabric, fabric path, overlay transport virtualization, fabric management, and extended SAN. So let's go ahead and begin. First let's begin with fiber channel over Ethernet. A classic data center design features a dedicated Ethernet LAN and a separate dedicated fiber channel SAN. With fiber channel over Ethernet, it is possible to run a single converged network as a standards-based protocol that allows fiber channel frames to be carried over Ethernet links. Fiber channel over Ethernet obviates the need to run separate LAN and SAN networks. Fiber channel over Ethernet allows an evolutionary approach to I.O. consolidation by preserving all fiber channel constructs, maintaining the latency security and traffic management attributes of fiber channel while preserving investments in fiber channel tools, training, and SANs. Based on lossless reliable Ethernet, fiber channel over Ethernet networks combine LAN and multiple storage protocols on a converged network. Next, let's talk about data center bridging. IEEE 802.1 Data Center Bridging is a collection of standards-based extensions to classical Ethernet. It provides a lossless data center transport layer that helps enable the convergence of LANs and SANs onto a single unified fabric. In addition to supporting fiber channel over Ethernet, Data Center Bridging can enhance the operation of iSCSI, network attached storage, and other business critical storage traffic. Next, let's discuss unified ports. As a part of the network foundation of unified fabric, the Cisco Nexus switches, specifically the Nexus 5548UP switch, delivers innovative architectural flexibility, infrastructure simplicity, and business agility with support for networking standards. For traditional virtualized unified and high performance computing environments, it offers a long list of IT and business advantages. This includes architectural flexibility such as unified ports which support traditional Ethernet fiber channel and fiber channel over Ethernet has a common high density high performance data center class fixed form factor platform and can consolidate LAN and storage. Business agility, it meets the diverse data center deployments on one platform. Next, let's talk about intercloud fabric. You can build a highly secure hybrid clouds and extend your existing data center to public clouds as needed on demand 
with consistent network and security policies. With Cisco InterCloud Fabric, you can do all this. Cloud providers can now provide a complete hybrid cloud solution. Cloud providers can differentiate their offerings as a premium service and provide a robust set of cloud deployment options. Next, let's talk about Cisco Fabric Path. Cisco Fabric Path is a Cisco Nexus operating system software innovation combining the plug and play simplicity of Ethernet with the reliability and scalability of Layer 3 routing. Using Fabric Path, you can build highly scalable Layer 2 multipath networks without using the Spanning Tree protocol. Such networks are particularly suitable for large virtualization deployments, private clouds, and high performance computing environments. When deployed across multiple Cisco Nexus chassis, the Fabric Path creates a flat data center switching fabric with high switching capacity, high cross sectional bandwidth, and low predictable latency. Overlay Transport Virtualization OTV, or Overlay Transport Virtualization, on the Nexus 7000 is an industry-first technology that significantly simplifies extending Layer 2 applications across distributed data centers. You can now deploy data center interconnect between sites without changing or reconfiguring your existing network design. With OTV, you can deploy virtual computing resources and clusters across geographically distributed data centers, delivering transparent workload mobility, business resiliency, and superior computing resource effectiveness. Next, Fabric Management and Operations. Cisco Dynamic Fabric Automation, or DFA, boosts network flexibility and efficiency. DFA innovations simplify fabric management optimize fabric infrastructure, and automate provisioning across physical and virtual environments. You gain unsurpassed operational simplicities through superior integration. DFA offers customers a number of significant advantages. Optimize fabric infrastructure for enhanced efficiency and scale. Optimize spine leaf topologies provide enhanced forwarding in a distributed control plane and integrated physical and virtual environments. The topologies help enable any network anywhere, supporting transparent mobility for physical servers and virtual machines, plus network extensibility. You benefit from extensible resiliency with smaller failure domains and multi-tenant scale. Simplified fabric management with open APIs for ease of operations, the Cisco Prime Data Center Network Manager offers centralized fabric management across both physical and virtual machines. Automated provisioning for greater agility. Having complete mobility access across the fabric, DFA uses network automation and provisioning to simplify physical server and virtual machine deployments. Network admin defined profile templates are used for both physical and the virtual machine. When a server administrator provisions a virtual machine and physical servers, instances of network policies are automatically created and applied to the network leaf switch. As virtual machines move across the fabric, the network policy is automatically applied to the leaf switch. Extended SAN Extended SAN service to any device. Storage network managers have long been challenges. Extended SAN service to any device. Storage network managers have long been challenged to deliver services such as encryption, data migration, compression, and acceleration. The best way to optimize data center resources is to deploy high-performance storage network services using the Cisco MDS 9000 products as the platform. 
The benefits of MDS 9000 services oriented SANs are services are integrated into the SAN fabric without wasted ports. The benefits of MDS 9000 services oriented SANs are services are integrated into the SAN fabric without wasted ports, recabling, SAN reconfigurations, or deployment disruption. Deployment times are dramatically reduced because performance is added by adding service engines. Automatic load balancing and traffic redirect failure help ensure high availability. And consolidating important tasks into the fabric supports transparent extension of any SAN service to any device. Intelligent fabric applications. Optimize your data center resources by providing integrated high performance applications to Cisco storage networks. Support disaster recovery, security, data mobility, and other heterogeneous storage requirements without adding appliances or using host or array resources. Cisco MDS 9000 Family Service nodes provide network hosted services to Cisco storage networks such as SAN extension, IO acceleration, XRC acceleration, storage media encryption, or data mobility manager. Network assisted applications are enabled through the Open Intelligent Services API. Cisco makes this development platform available to original storage manufacturers and independent software vendors who want to develop storage applications on the Cisco Storage Networks platform. Storage network administrators get flexibility to extend any service to any device in the storage network. IO intensive data path processing tasks at wire speed transparent to host and array applications and much more. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about key components of the data center. All of this you'll need to know for your CCDA exam. We covered fiber channel over Ethernet, data center bridging, unified ports, intercloud fabric, fabric path, overlay transport virtualization, fabric management and extended SAN, you can expect questions on any of these technologies in your CCDA exam, and I'm confident because you've watched this video that if you know it well, you will be prepared to answer any question they may pose to you. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Cisco virtualization. In this video you're going to learn about the advantages of virtualization, its drivers, the types of virtualization, and finally the platforms that support virtualization. So let's begin. The official definition of computer virtualization is the pooling and abstraction of resources and services in a way that masks the physical nature and boundaries of those resources and services. A good example is a VLAN because it masks the physical nature of resources. The concept of virtualization dates all the way back to the 1970s with IBM mainframes. These mainframes were separated into virtual machines so that different tasks could run separately and to prevent a process failure that could affect the entire system. One of the issues that IT departments face today is called server sprawl. This concept implies that each application is installed on its own server and every time another server is added issues such as power space and cooling must be addressed. These are just a few of the many issues and none of them are cost effective. However, these challenges can be mitigated with server virtualization that allows the partitioning of a physical server to work with multiple operating systems and application instances. The most important advantages are improved failover capabilities, better utilization of resources, and a smaller footprint. Virtualization is a concept that applies to many areas in modern IT infrastructures and it's not limited to servers. It can include networks, 
storage, applications, and desktop. Network virtualization refers to one physical network supporting a wide array of logical topologies. This allows actions such as outsourcing by the IT department where a logical topology can be created that can be accessed by external IT professionals. Network virtualization with Cisco products is typically classified into four areas. Control plane virtualization. This is making sure processes like routing are separated and distinct so routing process failure will not affect the entire device. Data plane virtualization. This is done every time different streams of data traffic are multiplexed. That is, different forms of traffic are placed on the same medium. The simplest example of data plane virtualization is a trunk link between two devices. Management plane virtualization. This implies the ability to make a software upgrade on a device without rebooting that device or having it lose its capabilities to communicate on the network. And then pooling and clustering. This, for example, is used on the Cisco Catalyst 6500 virtual switching system and it works by creating pools of devices that act as a single device. Another example is the Nexus VPC or virtual port channel which allows ether channels to be created that span across multiple devices. Virtualization has become a critical component in most enterprise networks because of modern demands in IT, including increasing efficiency while reducing capital and operational costs. Virtualization is a critical component of the Cisco Enterprise Network architecture. Virtualization can represent a variety of technologies, including extracting the logical components from hardware or networks and implementing them into a virtual environment. Some of the drivers behind implementing a virtualized environment are as follows. The need to reduce the number of physical devices that perform individual tasks. The need to reduce operational costs. The need to increase productivity. The need for flexible connectivity. And the need to eliminate underutilized hardware. Virtualization can be implemented at both the network and the device level. Network virtualization involves the creation of network partitions that run on physical infrastructure with each logical partition acting as an independent network. Network virtualization can include VLANs, vSANs, VPNs, and VRFs. On the other hand, device virtualization allows logical devices to run independently of each other on a single physical machine. Virtual hardware devices are created in software and have the same functionality as real hardware devices. The possibility of combining multiple physical devices into one single logical unit also exists. The Cisco Enterprise Network Architecture contains multiple forms of network and device virtualization, such as the following. Virtual machines, virtual switches, virtual LANs, virtual private networks, virtual storage area networks, virtual switching systems, virtual routing and forwarding, virtual port channels, and virtual device contexts. Device contexts allow the partitioning of a single partition into multiple virtual devices called contexts. A context acts as an independent device with its own set of policies. The majority of features implemented on the real device are also functional on the virtual context. Some of the devices in the Cisco portfolio that support virtual contexts include the following. Cisco ASA, Cisco ASE, Cisco IPS, and Cisco Nexus series. Server virtualization allows the server's resources to be extracted in order to offer flexibility and usage optimization in the infrastructure. The result is that data center applications are no longer tied to specific hardware resources, so the applications are unaware of the underlying hardware. 
server virtualization solutions are produced by companies such as VMware, Microsoft, and Citrix. Now all this being said, there are unique design considerations to network virtualization. Network solutions are needed to solve the challenges of sharing network resources but keeping users totally separate from one another. Although the users are separate, we need to ensure that the network is highly available, secure, and can scale along with business growth. Network virtualization offers solutions to these challenges and provides design considerations around access control, path isolation, and services edge. Regarding access control, access needs to be controlled to ensure that users and devices are identified and authorized for entry to their assigned network segment. Security at the access layer is critical for protecting the network from threats both internal and external. Path isolation. This involves the creation of independent logical network paths over a shared network infrastructure. MPLS VPN is an example of path isolation technique where devices are mapped to a VRF to access the correct set of network resources. Other segmentation options include VLANs and vSANs, which logically separate LANs and SANs. The main goal when segmenting the network is to improve the scalability, resiliency, and security services as with non-segmented networks. Services Edge. The Services Edge refers to making network services available to the intended users and devices with an enforced centralized managed policy. Separate groups or devices occasionally need to share information that may be on different VLANs, each with corresponding group policies. In such cases, the network should have a central way to manage the policy and control access to the resources. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco virtualization, the different types of virtualization, but also the platforms that support this type of virtualization. The fact is this type of software-defined networking is radically changing how engineers are going to design their networks. And to understand this is not only important for your CCDA exam, but as you go forward in your career. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about network programmability. Specifically, we're going to talk about Cisco's implementation of SCN, Cisco ACI, and we'll discuss its benefits and its attributes. All of this you should know for your CCDA exam. So let's go ahead and begin. IT departments and lines of business are looking at cloud automation tools and software-defined networking architectures to accelerate application delivery, reduce operating costs, and greatly increase business agility. Cisco Application-Centric Infrastructure, or Cisco ACI, is a comprehensive SDN architecture. This policy-based automation solution supports a business-relevant application policy language, greater scalability through a distributed enforcement system, and greater network visibility. These benefits are achieved through the integration of physical and virtual environments under one policy model for networks, servers, storage, services, and security. Through Cisco ACI, customers are reducing application deployment times from weeks to minutes. It also dramatically improves IT alignment with business objectives and policy requirements. Cisco ACI is built on the application-centric policy based on Cisco Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, or what is known as APIC. The Cisco ACI fabric 
which is based on the Cisco Nexus 9000 series switches and the Cisco application virtual switch and the Cisco ACI partner ecosystem. ACI provides a network that is deployed, monitored, and managed in a way that benefits different teams in the IT organization, including SDN network, cloud and DevOps, and security. It supports rapid application change by reducing complexity with a common policy framework that can automate provisioning and resource management. You can facilitate rapid systems integration and customization for network services, monitoring, management, and orchestration. Cisco ACI is a comprehensive SDN solution, making the application the focal point. It is delivered in an agile, open, and highly secure architecture, and its application-based policy model offers speed through automation, reducing errors and accelerating application deployment and IT processes from weeks to minutes. Application-based policies decouple high-level application connectivity needs from the complicated details of network configuration. This results in automated IT processes that simplify operations. ACI provides transparent support of heterogeneous physical and virtual endpoints, such as bare metal servers and virtual servers on any hypervisor, with layer 2 to 7 network services using consistent policy. This provides faster troubleshooting through increased visibility of the entire infrastructure. Cisco ACI supports open APIs, open source and open standards to optimize customer choice and flexibility. In fact, Cisco contributes technology specifications to open source and standards communities. The open integration with existing data center management tools and comprehensive open partner ecosystem helps to ensure flexibility while decreasing costs and increasing innovation. Provisioning applications has become easy with programmable infrastructure, yet onboarding them is still difficult. Cloud architects have to know what infrastructure design will support frequent application changes to performance, security, availability, and scale. DevOps has to work with both application and admin teams to understand how numerous application changes affect the configuration of switches, ports, VLANs, firewalls, security appliances, load balancers, and other application delivery functions. All changes must work within a shared production in infrastructure without affecting existing attendance and applications. Cisco ACI introduces a simple application-level policy-based approach. Application intentions are automatically translated to infrastructure design without requiring knowledge of devices or the effort to translate to configurations. This helps to enable policy-aware resource orchestration, real-time governance, and open choice in cloud software. Cisco ACI and the APIC SDN controller allow for security policies down to the individual tenant, application, or workload. They provide protection that meets the most stringent business and compliance requirements. The whitelist model permits the communication only where explicitly allowed helping to ensure that policy omissions do not leave security vulnerabilities. Through Cisco ACI, all security device provisioning and configuration can be automated according to the centrally managed application policies and requirements. This simplifies IT security tasks and accelerates application deployments. The Cisco Nexus 9000 series switches bring new industry-leading performance, power, port density, and open programming innovations. The products that support Cisco ACI are the Cisco Nexus 9000 series. In addition, the Cisco Application Virtual Switch, which provides a consistent virtual switch infrastructure between ACI fabrics and the Cisco Nexus 1000V Virtual Switch. The Cisco Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, which prog programmatically automates network provisioning and control based on application requirements and policies, and the Cisco application-centric infrastructure security for data centers solves many complexities in customer environments. It treats firewalls as a pool of resources and intelligently stitches them according to application network policies. ACI security offers full acceleration dynamically in hardware and directly integrates into Cisco ACI. When considering Cisco ACI, it's important to define desired business outcomes and plan each stage of the journey. 
Then you'll want to know how to accelerate the benefits of ACI while mitigating the risks. You need to develop an ACI adoption strategy based on business and technology needs. You need to provide a migration strategy and operational readiness. You need to deploy proof of concept to gain experience and reduce the deployment risk. And then design application-centric data centers based on the ACI fabric pods and policy templates. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about Cisco's deployment of software-defined networking, which is Cisco ACI. This you'll need to know for your CCDA exam. But more importantly, you will need to know this if you're going to work in the future of network engineering. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about network resiliency and fault domains in preparation for your Cisco CCDA exam. Specifically, you're going to learn about network, device, and operational resiliency, and also the concept of fault domains. So let's go ahead and begin. There are three major resiliency requirements which encompass most of the common types of failure conditions. Depending on the LAN design tier, the resiliency option appropriate for the role and network service type must be deployed. There is network resiliency, which provides redundancy through physical link failures, such as a fiber cut. Device resiliency, which protects the network during abnormal mode failure triggered by hardware or software and then operational resiliency, which enables resiliency capabilities to the next level, providing complete network availability even during planned network outages. We'll talk about all of these in this video. First, we'll talk about network resiliency. The most common network fault occurrence in the LAN network is a link failure between two systems. Link failures can be caused by issues such as a fiber cut, miswiring, line card module failure, etc. In the modular platform design, the redundant parallel physical links between distributed models in two systems reduces fault probabilities and can increase network availability. It is important to remember how multiple parallel paths between two systems also affect how higher layer protocols construct into adjacencies and loop-free forwarding topologies. Deploying redundant parallel paths in the recommended borderless campus design by default develops a non-optimal topology that keeps the network underutilized and requires protocol-based network recovery. In the same network design, the routed access module eliminates such limitations and enables full load balancing capabilities to increase bandwidth cap capacity and minimize application impact during a single path failure. To develop consistent network resiliency service in the centralized main and remote campus sites, the following basic principles apply. Deploying redundant parallel paths is a basic requirement for network resiliency at any tier. It is critical to simplify the control plane and forwarding plane operation by bundling all physical paths into a single logical, logical bundled interface, such as Ether Channel. Implement a defense in-depth approach to failure detection and recovery. An example of this is configuring the UDLD protocol, that's unidirectional link detection, which uses a layer 2 keep alive to test that the switch-to-switch -switch links are connected and operating correctly and acts as a backup to the native layer 1 unidirectional link detection capabilities provided by 802.3z and 802.3ae standards. Ensure that the network design is self-stabilizing. Hardware or software errors may cause ports to flap, which creates fault, false alarms and destabilizes the network topology. Implementing route summarization advertises a concise topology view of the network, which prevents core network instability. Next, let's talk about device resiliency. 
Another major component of an overall campus high availability framework is providing de device or node level protection that can be triggered during any type of abnormal internal hardware or software process within the system. Some of the common internal failures are software triggered crash, power outages, line card failures, etc. LAN network devices can be considered as a single point of failure and are considered to be a major failure conditions because recovery may require a network administrator to mitigate the failure and recover the system. The network recovery time can remain undeterministic, causing complete or partial network outage depending on the network design. Redundant hardware components for device resiliency vary between fixed configuration and modular Cisco Catalyst switches. To protect against common network faults or resets, all critical borderless campus network devices must be deployed with a similar device resiliency configuration. Let's talk about the basic redundant hardware deployment guidelines at the access layer and collapse core switching platforms in the campus network. Redundant power system. So redundant power supplies for network systems protect against power outages, power supply failures, and so on. It is important not only to protect the internal network system, but also the endpoints that rely on power delivery over the Ethernet network. Redundant power systems can be deployed in the following two configuration modes. Modular switch. This is where dual power supplies can be deployed in modular switching platforms such as the Cisco Catalyst 6500 or 4500E series platforms. By default, the power supply operates in a redundant mode, offering one plus one redundant option. In modular Catalyst and Nexus switching systems, the network administrator must perform overall power capacity planning to allow for dynamic network growth with new line card modules. The other option is fixed configuration switch. Depending on the switch that you're running, fixed configuration switches offer a wide range of power redundancy options. Cisco stack power can be one of them, especially in the Cisco Catalyst 3750X series platform. To prevent network outages on fixed configuration Catalyst switches, they must be deployed with power redundancy. Next, redundant control plane. Device or node resiliency in modular Cisco Catalyst 6500E or Nexus 7000 4500E in Cisco StackWise Plus platforms provides one plus one redundancy with enterprise class, high availability and deterministic network recovery time. The following subsections provide high availability design details as well as graceful network recovery techniques that do not impact the control plane and provide constant forwarding capabilities during failure events. So, to minimize the amount of time the network is unavailable to users, following a switchover from a primary to a secondary device. The main goal is to continue forwarding IP packets after the route processor switchover. NSF is supported by a wide variety of dynamic routing protocols. If a router is running one of these protocols, it can detect the internal switchover and take the proper steps to continue forwarding network traffic using and leveraging the forwarding information base while recovering route information from its peer devices. Cisco NSF with SSO is a mechanism of supervisor redundancy that is part of the iOS software and provides extremely fast supervisor switchover at layer 2, 3, and 4. SSO allows the standby route processor to take control of the device once a hardware or software fault occurs on the active route processor. SSO synchronizes the following parameters. Startup configuration, startup variables, the running configuration, layer 2 protocol states for ports and trunks, layer 2 and layer 3 tables, access control lists, and QoS tables. Next let's talk about operational resiliency. Designing the network to recover from failure events is only one aspect of the overall campus nonstop design. Converged network environments are continuing to move forward requiring true 7x24x365 availability. 
The borderless campus network is a part of the backbone of the enterprise network and must be designed to enable standard operational processes, configuration changes, and software and hardware upgrades without disrupting network services. The ability to make changes and upgrade software and or replace or upgrade hardware becomes challenging without a redundant system in the campus core. Upgrading individual devices without taking them out of service is similarly based on having internal component redundancy. The Cisco in-service software upgrade ISSU and enhanced FAST software upgrade EFSU leverage NSF SSO technology to provide continuous network availability while upgrading critical systems. This helps to greatly reduce the need for planned service downtime and maintenance. Next, let's talk about fault domains. Each network tier can be classified as a fault domain, with the deployment of redundant components and systems increasing redundancy and load sharing capabilities. However, this introduces a new set of challenges, namely higher costs and increased complexity in managing a greater number of systems. Network reliability and availability can be simplified using several Cisco high availability and virtual system technologies such as VSS, which offers complete failure transparency to end users and applications during planned or unplanned network outages. In this sense, minor or major network failures are considered broad terms that include several types of network faults which must be taken into consideration in order to implement a rapid recovery solution. Cisco high availability technologies can be deployed based on whether platforms have critical or non-critical role in the network. Some of the high availability techniques can be achieved in the campus network design without making major network changes. However, the critical network systems that are deployed in the center of the network to provide global connectivity may require additional hardware and software components to offer non-stop communication. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about network, device, and operation resiliency. This is a key part of your CCDA exam. And then you also learned about the terminology of fault domains. And again, this is something you could be asked on your exam. So now that you've watched this video, I'm confident if you're asked any questions regarding resiliency or fault domains on your CCDA exam, you'll do very well. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. In this video, you're going to receive an overview of WAN design. We're going to cover some of the basics of wide area networking so that you can properly lay a foundation uh, for the topics that come up after this video uh, so you can understand what specific WAN technologies are out there and where they fit within the enterprise campus. WAN technologies operate at the enterprise edge in the modular Cisco Enterprise infrastructure. WANs span across large geographical distances in order to provide connectivity for various parts of the network infrastructure. Unlike the LAN environment, some WAN components are not owned by the specific enterprise. Instead, WAN equipment or connectivity can be rented or leased from service providers. Most service providers are well trained in supporting not only traditional data traffic, but also voice and video services. In addition, unlike LANs, WANs typically have an initial fixed cost and thereafter periodic recurring fees for services, which is one reason you never want to over provision your wide area network because it's money down the drain. This cost and fee structure requires implementing effective quality of service mechanisms in order to avoid buying additional WAN bandwidth when it's not necessary. WAN technologies design requirements are typically derived from the following. Application type, application availability, 
application reliability, the costs associated with a particular WAN technology, and usage levels for the application. All of these will dictate what type of WAN technology you're going to want to use. The enterprise edge represents a large block, or it could be several blocks, of equipment. This large module is typically split into smaller blocks, each with a specialized functionality. Here are the following components you will find in an enterprise. The WAN block for branch offices and remote access connectivity. The e-commerce block, which is a part of the organization and obviously serves the business customer facing business applications. The internet connectivity block, which offers robust internet access with some level of availability and redundancy. And also you'll find within this block um, often your DMZ services. And then the remote access or VPN block, which provides secure connectivity for a large number of employees who work out of a home office. An important topic when considering CCDA certification is the common categories within various WAN technologies. An essential concept is circuit switched technology. The most relevant example of this is the PSTN or public switch telephone network. One of the technologies that falls under this category is ISDN. The way circuit switched WAN connections function is by being established when needed and terminated when they are no longer required. Another example that reflects the circuit switching behaviors is the old-fashioned dial-up connection. You may remember, or maybe you don't, using a dial-up modem analog access over the PSTN to access the internet in the late 1990s. The opposite of circuit switched option is the leased line technology. This is a fully dedicated connection that is permanently up and owned by the company. Examples of lease lines include TDM or time division multiplexing based leased lines. And these are usually very expensive because a single customer has full use of the offered connectivity and you're paying for that bandwidth whether you're using it or not. Another popular category of wide area networking technology involves packet switched concepts. In a packet switch infrastructure, shared bandwidth utilizes virtual circuits. The customer can create a virtual path, which is similar to a leased line, through the service provider's infrastructure cloud. This virtual circuit has a dedicated bandwidth, even though technically it's not a real leased line. Frame Relay is an example of this type of technology. Some legacy WAN technologies you may have heard of, such as X25. That's the predecessor of Frame Relay. An example of cell switch technology is Asynchronous Transfer Mode, or ATM. This operates by using fixed sized cells. Cell switch technologies form a shared bandwidth environment from the service provider standpoint that can guarantee customers some level of bandwidth through their infrastructure. Broadband is another hugely growing category for wide area networking and this includes technologies such as DSL cable and wireless. Broadband involves making a connection such as an old-fashioned coax cable that carries TV signals and figuring out how to use the different aspects of that bandwidth. For example, by using multiplexing, an additional data signal could be transmitted along with the original TV signals. And obviously wireless continues to expand at a rapid pace. As detailed so far, there are many options when discussing WAN categories. All of these technologies can support the needs of modern networks that operate under the 80-20 rule. That is, 80% of the network traffic uses some kind of WAN technology to access remote resources. Next, let's talk about WAN topologies. There are three you should know of. First, let's talk about full mesh topologies which for obvious reasons require a large number of nodes and added extra overhead. Referring back to the formula n times n minus 1 divided by 2 where n denotes the nodes
this obviously can get very expensive very fast. That being said, the full mesh topology is the best option when considering availability and reliability. Failover will occur on the other links and devices, assuming you have your routing protocols programmed correctly. The downside of full mesh topology, obviously, is the extra overhead associated with building and maintaining all of the connections and the high costs required to install all of the links. A more popular design is the hub and spoke topology. The hub router is usually located at the headquarters location and connects to branch office routers in a hub and spoke fashion. The hub and spoke topology is not the best topology as far as redundancy and availability are concerned as the hub device is the most common point of failure. So obviously in the hub area you're going to want to have redundant systems with redundant power supplies, redundant route processors, etc, etc. Hub and spoke topologies are obviously less complex and less expensive than full mesh topologies, so the added investment in the hub site is well worth it. Next, there's partial mesh. This involves a combination of full mesh and hub and spoke. The partial mesh topology falls in the middle of full mesh and hub and spoke topologies in terms of availability and costs. This topology is useful when a high level of availability and redundancy is required only in some areas. So it's a good time to begin discussing network architecture types. The first network architecture type is point to point. Now this is rather self-explanatory. As you can see, we have two network devices connected by a single network link. The typical point-to-point -point connection is a serial link. The next architecture type is broadcast network. A broadcast is sent from one of the routers and then propagated to all other routers on that segment. Ethernet networks, like the one you see below, are common examples of a broadcast network. The next architecture type is NBMA, or non-broadcast multi-access. As the name implies, it does not support broadcasts. Therefore, when an interface on a router needs to send out data to all other routers, it must send individual messages to each router. NBMA also doesn't support multicast. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the basics of WAN topologies and wide area network types. All of these things will help you in laying this foundation you need as you begin to learn about how to design for wide area networks. Laying a foundation for the terminology that you'll need to understand, such as hub and spoke, um, full mesh. But also, as you begin to design wide area networks or you're asked questions about wide area networks in the CCDA exam, this information is going to be in any question you would receive because they're going to assume you understand the topics that are covered in this video very well. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you're going to learn about dial-up technology. We're going to do an overview of ISDN technology and then dig into some of the details, such as ISDN BRI and PRI. So let's begin. Although dial-up technologies are not very common in today's modern network, it is a topic you can expect to see on the CCDA certification. Dial-up falls under the category of circuit switching, and it uses the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN. A connection is established when a user wants to use the dial-up option, and the connection ends when the user is done using the link. Considering dial-up connections use an analog signal, users need to use a modem in order to take the digital signal from the computer and then convert it into analog communication on the PSTN and vice versa. Dial-up access offers very limited bandwidth capabilities, but its advantage is that it's available just about everywhere, 
because obviously PSTN span across almost every geographical location. The technologies used over the PSTN should not utilize much bandwidth. Modern networks may use dial-up technology as a backup connection that can be activated in an emergency when no other WAN connection type is available. And this is one of the most popular uses of ISDN, or was in the past especially, was as a backup connection should the WAN connection fail. Now ISDN is a technology that allows digital communication over a traditional analog phone line so that both voice and data can be transmitted digitally over the PSTN. ISDN never reached the level of popularity it was expected to because it emerged when alternate technologies were also being developed. The two flavors of ISDN include ISDN BRI basic rate interface and ISDN PRI primary rate interface. ISDN BRI connectivity contains two B bearer channels for carrying data and one D delta channel for signaling and is abbreviated as 2B plus D. Each of these bearer channels in the ISDN operates at a speed of 64 kilobits per second. Multi-link PPP can be configured on top of these interfaces to allow the user to reach a bandwidth total of 128 kilobits per second. This bandwidth is considered very low, obviously, according to modern network requirements. The delta channel in ISDN BRI is a dedicated 16 kilobit per second traffic control. There are also 48 kilobits per second overall for framing control and other overhead in the ISDN environment. Therefore, the total ISDN bandwidth for PRI is 192 kilobits per second, 128 kilobits per second from the B channels, plus 16 for the D channel, plus 48 of overhead. ISDN PRI has 23 B channels and one D channel in the United States and Japan. The bearer channels and the delta channels all support 64 kilobits per second, including overhead. The total PRI bandwidth is 1.544 megabits per second. In other parts of the world, like Europe and Australia, the PR connection is 30 B channels and 1 D channel, and therefore you have more bandwidth as well. The ISDN technologies we've been describing are called TDM, or Time Division Multiplexing Technologies. TDM refers to being able to combine multiple channels over a single overall transmission medium and using these different channels for voice, video, and data. Time Division refers to splitting the connection into small windows of time for various communication channels. ISDN speaking devices are called terminal emulation equipment and they can be categorized as either native ISDN or non-native ISDN equipment. Native ISDN equipment is comprised of devices that were built to be ISDN ready and they are called TE1 devices, Terminal Equipment 1. Non-native ISDN equipment is comprised of TE2 devices. Non-native ISDN equipment can be integrated with native ISDN equipment by using a special TA or terminal adapter, which only TE2 devices require. The ISDN service provider uses termination devices called NT1s or Network Termination 1 and NT2 Network Termination 2. These are translation devices for media transforming five wire connections into two wire connections. The local loop is the two-wire connection. It's a two-wire link for users. In North America, the customer is responsible for the NT1 device, while in other parts of the world, this falls under the service provider's responsibility. Because of this issue, some Cisco routers provide built-in NT1 functionality that features a visible U under the port so the user can see this capability quickly. The U notation is found in the ISDN reference point terminology. These reference points are important for troubleshooting or maintaining issues in an ISDN network. The ISDN switch is usually located at the service provider's location. 
The different ISDN reference points are as follows. The U reference point is between the ISDN switch and the NT1 device. The T reference point is between the NT2 device and the NT1 device. The S reference point is between the terminals TE1 or the TA and the NT2 device. The R reference point is between non-ISDN native devices and TAs. So here's what you've learned. You've learned a basic overview of ISDN. You've gotten also granular enough with learning about ISDN BRI and then PRI and the different types of ISDN equipment that you should be able to answer correctly any ISDN related question on the CCDA exam. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Frame Relay. In previous videos, you learned about non-broadcast multi-access technologies. Well, Frame Relay is a NBMA technology, and it requires dealing with address resolution issues, except for situations in which point-to-point -point interfaces are used. The local layer 2 addresses in Frame Relay are called Data Link Connection Identifiers, or DELCs, and they are only locally significant. So, for example, in a hub and spoke environment, the hub device should have a unique DELC to communicate to each of its spokes, as you can see here. The DELC number at the end of each link may or may not be identical. The DELCI is the frame relay address, so this needs to be resolved to a layer 3 IP address. Another fundamental frame relay component is the LMI, or local management interface. The service provider operates a DCE frame relay device, and this is usually a switch, and the customer provides a DTE frame relay device, and this is usually a router. The LMI is a language that permits these two devices to communicate. One of its duties is to report the status information of the virtual circuit that makes up the frame relay communication. The LMI also provides the DELCI information. The LMI is enabled automatically when frame relay is initiated and when it's enabled on a Cisco device interface. So when you inspect the frame relay PVC or permanent virtual circuit on a Cisco device, you will see a status code defined by the LMI that there will be one of the following. Active, which is what you would hope for, that everything is working correctly. Inactive, which means there's no problems on the local node, but there are possible issues on the remote node. And then deleted, which means there is an issue on the service provider network. The three types of LMI are Cisco, ANSI, and Q933A. Cisco routers are configured to try all of these LMI types automatically, starting with the Cisco LMI type, and then uses the one that matches whatever the service provider is using. So in this aspect should not be that much of a concern in a design phase for Frame Relay. One of the most popular aspects that must be considered in the design phase is the address resolution methodology. If you are using multipoint interfaces in your design, you need to find a way to provide the layer 3 to layer 2 resolution. There are two options that can help you achieve this, and you can do it dynamically, as you can see here using inverse ARP, one router stating my IP address is 199.17.28.200, and then asking for the IP address of router B, who then answers back or statically using the frame relay map command. And you can see the specific programming for that right here. In order to verify that layer three to layer two resolution has succeeded, use the show frame relay map command. On a multipoint interface, inverse ARP happens automatically. 
This functionality is enabled right after adding an IP address on an interface configured for Frame Relay. At that moment, requests are sent out all the circuits assigned to that specific interface for any supporting protocol the interface is running. The request process can be disabled with the no frame relay inverse ARP command, but you can never design a network that will stop responding to requests. By design, inverse ARP replies cannot be disabled, so the frame relay speaker will always attempt to assist anybody who attempts to perform a layer 3 to layer 2 resolution via frame relay inverse ARP. The inverse ARP behavior in frame relay design assists automatically with broadcasts through the replicated unicast approach discussed earlier. Therefore, when using inverse ARP broadcast support exists by default. When connecting two routers to the frame relay cloud using physical interfaces, the specific interfaces are multipoint from a frame relay perspective because a physical frame relay interface by default is multipoint. Therefore, even though the connection between the two routers appears as a point-to-point, -point, it is a frame relay multipoint connection. Because they are using multipoint interfaces by default, the two devices will handle the layer 3 to layer 2 resolution dynamically using inverse ARP. If you would like to design a solution that does not use inverse ARP, then you can turn off the dynamic mapping behavior on each device and then configure static frame relay mappings. You can do so by entering in frame relay map the protocol address to the DELC. The protocol is usually the IP, the address is the remote address, and the DELC represents the local ID. The broadcast keyword can be added optionally in order to activate the replicated unicast behavior to support broadcast functionality. Static mapping must be configured in order to override or turn off the, the default dynamic inverse ARP behavior. This helps the administrator maintain full control over the layer 3 to layer 2 resolution process in Frame Relay. A huge error that can appear on Cisco equipment is that the physical interfaces have come up and inverse ARP starts to operate you can find that there are dynamic mappings to 0.0.0.0. .0. These mappings occur because of a clash of two features, and that is inverse ARP and Cisco Auto Install. To discard these mappings, you issue a clear frame relay in ARP command, and then the device should be restarted. This mapping can create a failure in the communication path from frame relay environment. Point-to-point -point configurations are the ideal choice when it comes to layer 3 to layer 2 resolution because the process in multipoint configurations does not occur when such on such interface types. When configuring point-to-point -point frame relay, use point-to-point sub-interfaces, which will not get the DELC assignments from the LMI as in the multipoint situation. The DELC must be assigned manually to the sub-interfaces with the frame relay interface DELC command. There is no concern about the layer 3 to layer 2 resolution because each router has only one remote device to which it sends data and it does this by using the sub-interface associated with the DELC. Another option would be creating sub-interfaces and declaring them as multipoint. These types of interfaces behave exactly like the physical multipoint interfaces, but you need to decide on the resolution me method to be used, inverse ARP or static mappings. A combination of these can be used, for example, by implementing inverse ARP on one end of the com connection and then defining static maps on the other end. The interface type settings and the selected layer 3 to layer 2 resolution method is only locally significant, so this means there can be all kinds of variations in your frame relay design. With frame relay environments for quality of service, packets can be marked with the DE bit, and this informs a service provider that those specific packets are not that important and can be discarded if there is congestion. This behavior will prioritize packets that do not have the DE bit set. Other parameters that can be configured in the frame relay environment are fecken and beckon. So 
beckons our forward explicit congestion notifications, beckons our backward explicit congestion notifications. The frame relay equipment, if configured to do so, can notify devices of congestion and slow down the sending rates as illustrated here. In summary, if you have a chain of frame relay nodes that supports feckens and beckons, the first device can forward a fecken that informs about existing congestion and about the need for transmitting at a slower rate. The fecken marking is then moved backward, but this can cause problems when there is no return traffic sent backwards. To make sure everybody knows about the congestion, use beckons with empty frames that carry the beckon bit backward. This notifies the return path about the congestion. Devices respond to feckens and beckons by slowing down in terms of transmission rates in order to, to avoid further congestion. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the basics of frame relay, DE, beckon, and feckon, and then the different types of interfaces, and also the design considerations you need to think about when you're designing frame relay. Uh, it's a very important topic, although frame relay certainly is not as, as uh, popular as it once was. Um, it is still something you need to understand for your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about MPLS. MPLS leverages the intelligence of the IP routing infrastructure and the efficiency of Cisco Express forwarding. MPLS functions by appending a label to any type of packet. The packet will then be forwarded through the network infrastructure based on this label's value instead of any layer 3 information. The ability to label a packet for efficient forwarding allows MPLS to work with a wide range of underlying technologies. By simply adding a label to the packet header, MPLS can be used in many physical and data link layer WAN implementations. The MPLS label is positioned between the layer 2 header and the layer 3 header. In MPLS, overhead is added a single time when the packet goes into the service provider cloud. After entering the MPLS network, packet switching is performed much faster than in traditional layer 3 networks because it only needs to swap the MPLS label instead of stripping the entire layer 3 header. MPLS capable routers are also called LSRs or label switch routers and they will come in the following two flavors Edge LSR, which is the PE router, or LSR, the P router. PE routers are provider edge devices that ensure label distribution. They forward packets based on labels and are responsible for label insertion and removal. P routers are provider routers and they are responsible for label forwarding and efficient packet forwarding based on labels. MPLS separates the control plane from the data plane. This leads to a great efficiency in how the LSR routers work. Resources that are constructed for efficient control plane operations include the routing protocol, the routing table, the exchange of labels, and these are completely separated from resources that are designed only to forward traffic in the data plane as quickly as possible. Ceph contains a FIB or forwarding information base that is a copy of the routing table information in the cache memory and is used for quick forwarding. MPLS contains a label forwarding information base, LFIB, which is for label-based traffic exchange. The term forwarding equivalence class describes a class of packets that receives the same forwarding treatment, that is, traffic forwarded based on a specific quality of service marking through the service provider cloud. The MPLS label has a length of 4 bytes and it is, consists of the following fields. A 20-bit label value field, 3-bit experimental field such as QoS marking, 
one bit bottom of the stack field, which can be used when multiple labels are used. It's set to one for the last label in the stack. And then the 8-bit TTL field. This helps you to avoid loops. You might need to use a stack of labels when dealing with MPLS VPNs. MPLS VPN is the most important technology that uses MPLS, which was developed to serve the MPLS VPN technology. An example of an MPLS VPN application would be an ISP that offers MPLS VPN services. The PE routers connect to different customers, with the same customer having multiple sites, each connected to a different PE router. With the MPLS approach, two sites with the same customer receive transparent secure communication capabilities based on the unique customer labels assigned. The ISP uses MPLS to carry the traffic between the PE routers through the PE devices. An important advantage of MPLS VPN technology is that its secure connectivity is assured without the customer having to run MPLS on any device. The customer only needs to run a standard routing protocol with the ISP because all of the MPLS VPN logic is located in the ISP cloud. When using MPLS VPNs, a stack of labels is used to identify the customer. This is the VPN identification. And another label is used to initiate the forwarding through the ISP cloud. Layer 3 MPLS VPN technology is very powerful and a flexible option that allows service providers to give customers the transparent WAN access connect connectivity they need. This is very scalable for the ISP because it is very easy for them to add customers and sites. MPLS comes in the following two flavors, frame mode MPLS and cell mode MPLS. Frame mode MPLS is the most popular MPLS type. And in this scenario, the label is placed between the layer two header and the layer three header. This is why MPLS is often considered a layer 2.5 technology. Cell mode MPLS is used in ATM networks and uses fields in the ATM header that are used as the label. One important issue that must be solved with MPLS is determining the devices that will ensure the insertion and removal of labels. The creation of labels is performed on the ingress edge LSR and label removing is performed on the egress edge LSR. The LSRs in the interior of the MPLS topology are only responsible for label swapping in order to forward the traffic on a specific path. The MPLS devices need a way in which to exchange the labels that will be utilized for making forwarding decisions. This label exchange process is executed using a protocol. The most popular of these protocols is LDP or Label Distribution Protocol. LDP is a session-based UDP technology that allows for the exchange of labels. UDP and multicast are used initially to set up the peering, and then TCP ensures there is a reliable transmission on the label information. A technology that improves MPLS efficiency is penultimate hot popping. This allows for the second to last LSR in the MPLS path to be the one that pops out the label. This adds efficiency to the overall operation of MPLS. The RD or route distinguisher is a way in which the ISP can distinguish between the traffic of different customers. This allows different customers who are participating in the MPLS VPN to use the exact same IP address space. For example, you can have both customer A and customer B using the 10.10.100.0/24 range with the traffic being differentiated between customer RDs. Devices can create their own virtual routing tables called VPN routing and forwarding or VRFs. So a PE router can store each customer's specific data in a separate and isolated table providing increased security. Prefixes are carried through the MPLS cloud by relying on MPBGP or Multi Protocol BGP. This carries the VPN version 4 prefixes, the prefix that results after the RD is prepended to the normal prefix. 
you can filter customers access to each other's prefixes with import and export targets so in this video you've learned the basics about MPLS and how to design it these are the basics you'll need to know for your CCDA exam and I'm confident if you've mastered the topics in this MPLS video you will do well on the MPLS questions in your CCDA exam good luck in your studies Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we are covering WAN design considerations. We're going to talk about, at a granular level, things you need to consider when designing a wide area network. Also, we'll do a refresh of a few items that you'll need to remember in order to best understand the material that's presented in this video. It's important to know this information, not only to be a strong engineer, but obviously to pass the CCDA exam. So let's begin. Now for your CCDA exam, you must be aware that the Enterprise Edge design process must follow the PPD IOO process, which is prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. The designer should carefully analyze the following network requirements using this methodology. The types of applications and their WAN requirements, traffic volume, and traffic patterns, including possible points of congestion. Let's do a quick refresh of the PPDIOO methodology. Cisco has formalized a network's life cycle into six phases. Prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. And these phases are collectively known as PPDIOO. Let's discuss the PPDIOO phases in detail. First, the prepare phase. This phase establishes organization and business requirements, develops a network strategy, and proposes a high-level conceptual architecture to support that strategy. Technologies that support the architecture are identified in this phase, as well as a business case to establish the financial justification for the strategy. The plan phase identifies the network requirements based on goals, facilities, and user needs. This phase characterizes sites and assesses the network, performs a gap analysis against best practice architectures, and looks at the operational environment. In the design phase, the network design is developed based on the technical and business requirements obtained from the previous phases. A good design will provide high availability, reliability, security, scalability, and performance. In the implement phase, new equipment is installed and configured according to the design specifications. In this phase, any planned network changes should be communicated in change control meetings and with the necessary approvals to proceed. The operate phase maintains the network's day-to-day -day operational health. Operations include managing and monitoring network components and performing the appropriate maintenances. And then finally, the optimize phase, which involves proactive network management by identifying and resolving issues before they affect the network. Now there is a design methodology for the first three phases of the PPDIOO methodology and there are three steps to it. In step one, decision makers identify the requirements and a conceptual architecture is proposed. In step two, the network is assessed the network is assessed on function, performance, and quality. And then in step three, the network topology is designed to meet the requirements and close the network gaps identified in the previous two steps. Let's review these three phases in detail. To obtain customer requirements, you need not only to talk to network engineers, but you need to talk to the business 
personnel, and company managers. Networks are designed to support applications and you want to determine the network services that you need to support both now and in the future. So an example of design flexibility is VoIP. Considering the strict requirements of this technology you want to make sure that VoIP can function over the design solution at any given time even if this is not an initial requirement from the customer but maybe a year or two or possibly even three years later you will want to be able to support voice over IP. Flexibility in enterprise edge design consists of the ability to incorporate other technologies easily at any given time. Other key design criteria when considering WAN design include the following response time, throughput, reliability, window size and data compression. Response times are of great importance to the wide area network as well as to its supported applications. Many modern applications will give an indication of the necessary response times and again VoIP is an excellent example. When a VoIP call is made over many network devices you should know what the necessary response time must be for proper voice communications. Generally speaking, one-way latency should not exceed 120 milliseconds. You can test a response time using a feature on Cisco devices called IPSLA. Let's do a quick overview of IPSLA for you. IPSLA allows you to monitor, analyze, and verify IP service levels. It's comprised of two components, a source and a target. Operations can broadly be categorized into five functional areas. Let's take a look at an example. You can use IP SLAs to monitor the performance between any area in the network, core distribution and edge, without deploying a physical probe. It uses generated traffic to measure network performance between two networking devices. So as we draw this out, this shows how IP SLAs begins when the source device sends a generated packet to the destination device. After the destination device receives the packet, depending on the type of IP SLA's operation, it responds with the timestamp information for the source to make the calculation on performance metrics. It then can communicate with a performance management application via SNMP to provide real-time analysis of the network. It should be noticed that IP SLA can communicate with any IP device on the network that's enabled for these types of measurements. Another important design parameter is overall available bandwidth, or what many call throughput. This measures the amount of data that can be sent in a particular time frame through a speci specific WAN area. Reliability is another aspect to consider. This gives information about the health of the WAN connection and its resources, so whether this connection is actually up or down, as well as detailed information about how often the WAN functions as, efficient, as efficiently as possible. Window size influences the amount of data that can be sent into the WAN in one chunk. TCP uses a sliding window concept that works by sending an amount of data, waiting for an acknowledgement of receipt, and then increasing the amount of data until it reaches the maximum window. In the case of a congested WAN link, everyone in the network that is sending data via TCP will start increasing the rate at which they send until the interface starts dropping packets, causing everyone to back off and use the sliding window. After the congestion disappears, everyone will start increasing the rate at which they send at the same time until a new congestion event occurs. This process, which repeats again and again, is called TCP global synchronization. This leads to a waste in bandwidth during the periods that all hosts decrease their window size simultaneously. And finally, another key WAN factor is whether traffic can be compressed. If the data is already highly compressed, any additional compression mechanisms are inefficient. But that being said, especially today with SANS or other 
high capacity systems. Compression and compression over the WAN is critical to ensure that failover and backup services are ready to go live with the most accurate data possible. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about some unique WAN design methodologies, specifically a refresh of the PPD IOO process, and then reviewing the key design criteria of WAN design, such as response time, throughput, and reliability. Then another refresh of IP SLA. All of this information is fair game for the CCDA exam. If you know the information in this video well, you will do excellent on this portion of your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about designing quality of service. Specifically, we're going to be going over the following categories of quality of service classification, congestion management, link efficiency mechanisms, and then traffic shaping and policing. Now it's obvious from the CCDA study materials that Cisco does not expect you to be an expert on quality of service. It is a huge topic. They just want you to understand the basics. So do not spend too much time digging into the intricacies of quality of service because there will be time for that in your advanced studies. For now, let's talk about quality of service at a higher level and then discuss the quality of service concepts that Cisco wants you to know for the CCDA exam. Quality of service is a tool for managing a WAN's available bandwidth. Now, quality of service does not and bad, add bandwidth, but it helps you make better use of what you have. If you have chronic congestion issues, quality of service should not be the primary answer to resolving that problem. You need to add more bandwidth. However, by prioritizing traffic using quality of service, you can make sure that your most critical traffic gets the best treatment and available bandwidth in times of congestion. One popular quality of service technique is to classify your traffic based on a specific protocol type or matching access list and then giving a policy treatment to that specific class. You can define many classes to match or identify your most important traffic classes, for example, video or voice. And then the remaining unmatched traffic then uses a default class, which is the traffic that can be treated as best effort. So let's begin with classification. For a flow to have priority, it must first be identified and marked. Both of these tasks are referred to as classification. The following are popular technologies which support classification. NBAR, it's a technology that uses deep packet content inspection to identify network applications. So an advantage of NBAR is that it can recognize applications even when they do not use standard network ports. Also it matches fields at the application layer. Before NBAR, classification was limited to layer 4 TCP and UDP port numbers, but NBAR has changed that. Next is CAR, Committed Access Rate, and uses an ACL to set precedence and allows customization of the precedence assignment by the user, uh, source, or destination IP address, or even application type. Next, let's talk about congestion management. There are two types of output queues that are available on routers, hardware and software. The hardware queue simply uses FIFO, first in, first out. But the software queue schedules packets first and then places them in the hardware queue. Now keep in mind that the software queue is only used during periods of congestion. The software queue uses quality of service techniques such as priority queuing, custom queuing, weighted fair queuing, 
class-based weighted fair queuing, low latency queuing, and traffic shaping and policing. Let's go through each of one of those. Cisco does not expect you to know each of these in detail. Again, that would be later in your CCDP studies. But that being said, they want you to understand what each of these are. Priority queuing is a queuing method that establishes four interface output queues that serve different priority levels, which are high, medium, default, and low. Unfortunately, priority queuing can starve other queues if too much data is in one queue, because higher priority queues must be emptied first before lower priority queues. Next, there is custom queuing. It uses up to 16 individual output queues. Byte size limits are assigned to each queue so that when the limit is reached, it proceeds to the next queue. The network operator can customize these limits. And custom queuing is obviously fairer than priority queuing because it allows some level of service to all traffic. But this is really a legacy solution because there are improvements in the queuing methods, which we'll talk about next. Weighted fair queuing ensures that traffic is separated into individual flows or sessions without requiring that you define access lists. Weighted fair queuing uses two categories to group sessions, high and low bandwidth. Low bandwidth traffic has priority over high bandwidth traffic, and high bandwidth traffic shares the service according to assigned weight values. Please know that weighted fair queuing is the default quality of service mechanism on interfaces below 2 megabits per second. Next is class-based weighted fair queuing. It extends weighted fair queuing capabilities by providing support for modular user-defined traffic classes. Class-based weighted fair queuing lets you define traffic classes that correspond to match criteria, including ACLs, protocols, and input interfaces. Traffic that matches the class criteria belongs to that specific class, and each class has a defined queue that corresponds to an output interface. So after traffic has been matched and belongs to a specific class, you can modify its characteristics such as assigning bandwidth, maximum queue limit, and weight. As you see in the picture here, certain classes receive higher priority than other classes. As you see in the diagram here, certain classes receive more bandwidth than other classes. And also, as you see here, this is a form of class-based weighted fair queuing, but actually this is called low latency queuing because it has a priority queue. And that's the big difference. The strict priority queue allows delay-sensitive traffic, such as voice, to be sent first before other queues are serviced. That gives voice preferential treatment over other traffic types. Unlike priority queuing, low latency queuing provides for a maximum threshold on the priority queue, and this will prevent lower priority traffic from being starved by the priority queue. Now without low latency queuing, class-based weighted for queuing would not have a priority queue for real-time traffic. Now that we've talked about queuing, let's talk about traffic shaping and policing. Traffic shaping and policing are mechanisms that inspect traffic and then take action based on the traffic's characteristics, such as DSCP or IP precedence bits set in the IP header. Traffic shaping slows down the rate at which packets are sent out an interface by matching certain criteria. Traffic shaping uses a token bucket technique to release the packets into the output queue at a pre-configured rate. So this helps eliminate potential bottlenecks by throttling back the traffic rate at the source. Traffic shaping is used on larger networks to smooth the flow of traffic going out to the provider. This is desirable for a few reasons. In provider networks, it prevents the provider from dropping traffic that exceeds the contracted rate. Now, policing is a little bit different because it tags or drops traffic depending on the match criteria. Generally speaking, policing is used to set the limit of incoming traffic into an interface, and then it will drop traffic that exceeds what the settings were. One example of using policing is to give preferential treatment to critical application traffic 
by elevating to a higher class and reducing best effort traffic to a lower priority class. The best way to compare shaping with policing is to remember that shaping buffers packets. Policing does not. It can be configured to drop packets. Our final topic is link efficiency. Within Cisco IOS, there are several link efficiency mechanisms available, as you can see here. There's LFI, which is used to reduce delay or jitter on slower speed links. Multi-link PPP, which bonds multiple links together between no two nodes, which can increase available bandwidth. And then RTP, real-time transport header compression, which, compro which provides increased efficiency for applications that take advantage of RTP on slower links. So here's what you've learned. You've received a high-level overview of quality of service. And then you learn about quality of service functions, such as classification, congestion management, link efficiency mechanisms, and then traffic shaping and policing. If you know this video well, you'll do well on your QoS portion of your CCDA exam. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're going to cover the remaining WAN technologies or considerations that you need to know for your CCDA exam. We're going to cover remote access design, then VPNs, wide area network backups, and then finally enterprise branch module design. Let's start with remote access design. When designing the remote access block, you must ensure that the network users have transparent access to the network from wherever they are, just as they are connected to the actual network. The users must be able to reach the resources they are authorized to use as they would from the enterprise campus. In order to provide these services, the connection requirements must be analyzed carefully in order to ensure they are fulfilled. Typical requirements include VoIP support, VPN support, high volume traffic or low volume traffic, permanent connection, is it needed or not, and the type of flows. Now VPN concentrators have often been used to accept these external sessions, but Cisco's multi-function ASA platform is now the standard platform for providing both security and VPN services to the RAS block. The RAS block is normally comprised of firewalls and systems that can provide VPN and security solutions all in one, or they can be broken out, such as VPN concentrators, dial-up networking services, and of course you still want to have your security, so IDS and IPS solutions to actively monitor any unwanted traffic or activity. So let's get more granular and talk about VPN network design. Even though the VPN concept involves security most of the time, Unsecured VPNs exist. A very basic example of this would be Frame Relay. VPN troubleshooting is difficult to manage because of the lack of visibility into the provider infrastructure. The service provider is usually seen as a cloud that aggregates all the network locations connections. So when performing VPN troubleshooting, you should first take a look at the problem on your end and make sure it does not reside on your devices and then, if you are sure, or as sure as you can be, reach out to your ISP. Types of VPN technologies include the following. Site-to-site -site VPNs. These are used to connect different locations over a public infrastructure. Now, when using peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, you can communicate seamlessly between sites without worrying about IP addressing overlap. Remote access VPNs, such as in the older days, uh, VPDN, Virtual Private Dial-Up Network, although you may still see that here and there. Or surely you're aware of a VPN software that you can run on your laptop nowadays to connect into your corporate network. 
And then there's extranet VPNs to connect to business partners or customer networks. With VPNs, traffic is often tunneled in order to send it over an infrastructure. Now the tunneling methodology for layer three is called GRE or generic routing encapsulation. GRE allows traffic to tunnel, but it does not provide security. So let's talk about GRE and then also the options you can use to provide security over a GRE. GRE was developed as a tunneling methodology which can carry layer three protocols over an IP network. In essence, GRE creates a private point-to-point -point connection like a VPN, except GRE does not provide secure communications, but we'll deal with that a little bit later. GRE works by encapsulating payload traffic inside an IP packet. GRE tunnel endpoints send payloads through tunnels by routing encapsulated packets through IP networks. Here's what makes it work. The IP routers along the way do not look at the payload. They look only at the outer IP packet as they forward it towards the GRE tunnel endpoint. And upon reaching the tunnel endpoint, GRE encapsulation is removed and the payload is forwarded along to its ultimate destination. Now this is obviously very useful since a GRE tunnel can encapsulate almost any type of data you want to send out a physical router interface. So let's just walk through an example of GRE tunneling. Here you have a cloud and let's say you have two routers and they communicate over a provider network so there are multiple hops over this network and you need to you need to tunnel traffic that the provider does not allow. The, tr the tr provider does not allow certain traffic over their network. So what you do is you create two tunnel interfaces, one on router one and one on router two. And these are your endpoints for your GRE tunnel. Now over this GRE tunnel, you can send whatever you want over it because it has an IP header. The provider pr provides support for IP, but you can send whatever you want um, over this over this tunnel. Um, by by encapsulating it in an IP header and you are adhering to their standards but you're also able to send traffic that you need to send over your tunnel even if it's not permitted by the provider on a normal basis uh, GRE gives you that flexibility when you hear the word encapsulate now you may think of security but GRE by itself does not provide any security for the data it transmits so again, let's take another look at GRE tunneling with, from a secure perspective. We have two routers, and we're going to create a GRE tunnel between both of them. The traffic that is traversing the, the provider is encapsulated, but it's still not secure. It could be viewed if, uh, if somebody wanted uh, to view it. Um, it's still in the open. So you could run IPsec and encrypt the data on, let's say, router 1, and as it's sent over to router 2, it stays encrypted over the provider network, and then router 2 would unencrypt that data and then send it. So again, from router 2 to router 1 would work as well. Again, the encryption is on the routers on our end, so anytime it traverses the provider, uh, that data is secure. So IPsec and GRE often play hand in hand. The limitation of IPsec is that it can only protect unicast IP packets. So this causes issues for routing protocols that use IP multicasts. GRE allows you to get around this problem because GRE, a GRE tunnel can encapsulate IP multicast packets. So the resulting GRE packet is an IP unicast packet, but which can then be protected by an IPsec tunnel. Next, let's talk about WAN backup design. Now WAN connectivity can achieve backup through the following approaches. Dial-up backup activated when a primary link fails used to be very popular due to costs and bandwidth requirements. It's just simply not as popular today. Secondary WAN link, which is used for backup and or load balancing. This tends to be more popular. Or a shadow VPN, and this is used when the ISP establishes a second PVC or permanent virtual circuit, but the user is only charged for its usage. So this can be a, a very useful when the main PVC fails or in situations where more bandwidth is needed. Finally, let's talk about the enterprise branch module. 
branch modules are sized based on the number of users it needs to accommodate. For example, the enterprise teleworker, which is generally one user, single tier, tens of users, dual tier, hundreds of users, and multi tier, thousands of users. As the number of users in the branch modules grows, additional layers might be needed. The internet block generally serves as the gateway for your internal users to the internet. If they want to browse, perform file transfers, or stream audio or video presentations, their flows would go in and out of this block. Now notice how the internal traffic from your users is not using the same block as those who are coming in from the internet. This ensures that no external users are trying to hijack internal flows. That being said, oftentimes the internal and e-commerce blocks can share the same internet pipe. But if you prefer not to do that, you can use what is called a dual homes connection to two separate internet service providers to make sure that that traffic is segmented. Now, if one internet service provider did fail, you could then allow all traffic over the same circuit as a fail safe. The internet block is comprised of firewalls, routers, HTTP servers, SMTP servers, FTP servers, and DNS servers, to name a few. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the remaining items you need to know for wide area network considerations and technologies for your CCDA exam. Some of it is granular and some of it we stayed high level, but we definitely covered it to the level you will need to know for your CCDA exam. If you know what's in this video, you should do very well. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering branch office design. Specifically, in this video, you're going to learn about designing for a very small office, the small office, a medium-sized office, four-hour versus extended service, a medium-sized office layer two, and then a large size office. All of these are types of branch offices that you'll need to know for your CCDA exam. The Cisco Enterprise branch architecture takes into account services such as voice data, video, and security that customers want to deploy at their endpoints, no matter how far away the endpoints are or how they are connected. Using borderless networks, the Cisco Enterprise Branch Office architecture should provide seamless connectivity. An effective network design for enterprise branches and teleworkers requires knowledge of campus technologies. The Cisco Enterprise Branch architecture is an integrated, flexible, and secure framework for extending headquarter applications in real time to remote sites. It uses the Cisco network architecture for the enterprise framework, but it applies it to the smaller scale of a branch location. Common network components that can be implemented in the branch include routers that provide WAN edge connectivity, switches that provide the LAN infrastructure, security appliances that defend the branch offices, wireless access points for device mobility, call processing and video equipment for IP telephony and video support, and end-user devices including IP phones and computers. Cisco has developed six topologies to meet remote office requirements. Each design is based on a set of requirements which we will discuss now. First, size. The primary classification criteria is the size of the remote site. The size of the remote site is based on the number of ports required, which is dependent on the number of employees at the site and any special application supported in the remote site. Some sites allocate two to four ports per employee, 
while others allocate fewer than one port per employee. In addition to headcount, other factors that may impact the total port count, this can be such things as meeting rooms, public areas, reception, and other IT devices or security cameras. Next, wiring closets. Different buildings may require only one or more than one wiring closet. Since some cabling can only carry, for example, 100 megabits per second fast ethernet for about 100 meters, any building longer than 200 meters should have more than one wiring closet. Multi-storied buildings should also have more than one wiring closet. Please note that while large and multi-storied buildings often house more users and more ports, that's not always the case. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the office types. The very small office model covers offices servicing approximately one to five people where service level agreements can be negotiated around the lack of redundancy for data and voice networking. Examples of small offices include the convenient office, a small office with a client company, or a small Cisco leased office with shared facilities such as phones and internet connection. A very small office is defined as having one or all of the following characteristics. The maximum number of access ports to be supported at the remote site is 23. The site does not require any redundancy in terms of leased switches or devices on the network. Voice enabled Cisco ISR 3845 router would be a good example of the hardware you would use using an ether switch service module IP phones and access points. The site can be supported by a traditional lease line based WAN or VPN connection over the public internet with reduced SLA. The next site we'll discuss is the small office. The small office model is designed to support offices with a total port count not exceeding 288. The design is flexible enough to be used in implementations where either all access ports are aggregated into a single wiring closet or where the access ports are broken into different wiring closets up to the total of five. A small office is defined as one that has the following characteristics. Maximum number of access ports, 288. Redundancy is achieved by deploying dual WAN gateways, each with their own WAN circuit or more than one switch is present in the same wiring closet, the switches are deployed in a stack. At minimum, two switches should be stacked together in the core. Hardware, a typical hardware you'd find, would be a Cisco 3845 router and up to six switches using IP phones and wireless access points. It is the preference for this site to be deployed using a permanent WAN service, but if that is not possible, then a VPN connection over the public internet can be used. The next branch office model is the medium-sized office. This design covers medium-sized offices where critical service is required. And this is where we talk about the Cisco SmartNet contract or support contract. This design is classified into two separate models which Cisco specifically refers to as 4-hour and 4-hour extended. 4-hour extended model includes an additional switch to support sites with a secondary communication room or wiring closet. A medium office 4-hour extended is defined as one that has the following characteristics. Up to 336 switch ports for 4-hour model and 672 ports for the extended model one or two communication rooms or wiring closets. Redundancy is achieved by deploying dual WAN gateways, each with their own WAN circuit. Each LAN switch is deployed with dual supervisors and dual power supplies. The site would have a Cisco router with an ether switch service module supporting IP phones and access points. It is the preference for the site to be deployed using a permanent WAN service, but if that is not possible, then a VPN connection over the public internet can be used.
The next model is the medium-sized office. This design caters for medium-sized offices where the total port count does not exceed 1,344 ports and where there are no more than three wiring closets. Typically you'll find higher powered dual switches that are deployed in the core even though they already have dual power supplies and dual processors. This is done for offices where shipping and local customs may cause replacement equipment to be delayed or where the potential impact to the client is far too great to implement a four-hour model. A medium-sized office is defined as one that has the following characteristics up to 672 switch ports for layer 2 and 1,344 ports using the extended model. Between one and three wiring closets, redundancy is achieved by deploying dual WAN gateways, each with their own WAN circuit. Each LAN switch is deployed with dual supervisors and dual power supplies. Voice-enabled router with up to four high-powered switches with dual supervisors and dual power supplies. The Cisco Catalyst 6500 series is the typical switch you would find in the core. And this is supporting IP phones and access points. It's the preference for this site to be deployed using a permanent WAN ser service, but again, if that's not possible, then a VPN connection over the public internet can be used. The next model we'll talk about is large size office. The large office model caters to all remaining sites exceeding the specification for the preceding models. Typically, the sites have a requirement of greater than 1,344 ports and or more than three wiring closets. The large size office has a distribution layer to support the extended network. These sites differ from earlier topologies because the switches are redundant. The port capacity is larger and the business supported at these sites is critical. Within Cisco IT, this model is typically referred to as the complex model. A large size office is defined as one that has the following characteristics. 1,344 access ports and beyond. No restriction on the number of wiring closets. Redundancy is achieved by deploying dual WAN gateways, each with their own WAN circuit. Each LAN switch is deployed with dual supervisors and dual power supplies. The hardware would be a voice-enabled Cisco router with typically higher-end Cisco switches like the Catalyst 6500 using dual supervisors and dual power supplies, also supporting IP phones and access points. It is a requirement for this type of site to be deployed using a permanent WAN service, and Cisco does not suggest or it would not qualify for this type of deployment using a VPN solution over the internet.
So here's what you've learned. You've learned about branch office design, specifically the six different models. That is the very small office, small office, medium-sized office, four-hour versus extended service, medium-sized office layer two, and the large size office. All this information you'll need to know for your CCDA exam, but also certainly to make you a stronger design engineer in your enterprise. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about IPv4 addressing. Specifically, you're going to learn about IPv4 addresses, subnets, and then we'll finish it off with TCP, UDP, and IP headers. So let's go ahead and begin with a basic introduction to IPv4 addresses. An IP address is a unique logical number to a network device or interface. It is 32 bits in length, and to make the number easier to read, the dotted decimal format is used. The bits are combined into four 8-bit groups, each converted into decimal numbers. For example, as you will see here, this address is 10.128.0.1. The first octet dictates which class the IP address is in. As you see in this diagram, the beginning bits of the first octet will dictate what class the IP address is. There are five classes, A, B, C, D, and E, and let's go ahead and talk about each of those at this time. Class A addresses range from 0 to 127 in the first byte. Network numbers available for assignment to organizations are from 1.0.0.0 to 126.0.0.0. By default, for Class A addresses, the first byte is the network number, and then the three remaining bytes are the host number. Class B addresses range from 128 to 191 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to companies or other organizations are from 128.0.0.0 to 191.255.0.0. By default, for Class B addresses, the first two bytes are the network number, and the remaining two bytes are the host number. Class C addresses range from 192 to 223 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to companies are from 192.0.0.0 to 223, 255, 255 255.0. The format is the first three bytes are the network number and the last byte is the host number. Class D addresses range from 224 to 239 in the first byte. Network numbers assigned to multicast groups range from 224.0.0.1 to 239, 255, 255, 255. Please note that these addresses do not have a host or network portion. Class E addresses range from 240 to 254 in the first byte. These addresses are reserved for experimental networks. Network 255 is, reverse, is reserved for the broadcast address, such as all 255s. Again, take a look at this table, and you will see the summary of the IPv4 address classes. Each address class can be uniquely identified in binary by the high order bits. Now, subnetting plays an important role in IPv4 addressing since you want to be able to break down the networks into smaller ones. 
As you can see here, we have a class A IP address. And if we were to use its default subnet mask, it would be a slash eight. That is the first eight binary bits would be ones and the rest would be zeros. But this would mean we have hundreds of thousands of IP addresses in this one subnet. Let's say we want to use this IP address on our internal network and simply assign it to one small portion of our network where there are 100 users. In that case, we would want to assign a smaller subnet, let's say a slash 24. So subnetting allows us to put it on a smaller network with fewer hosts. So the subnet mask is a 32-bit number in which the bits are set to 1 to identify this network portion of the address. And the 0 then identifies the host portion of the address. As you can see here, we will now set to 1 the first 24 bits, and that will mark off the subnet, which is now a slash 24, which means that 10.128.0 slash 24 is a dedicated network that can host 254 hosts. Next, let's briefly cover the headers for TCP, IP, and UDP. What you see before you is the IP header. You will need to know the functions for each of the fields you see before you. Let me cover some of the functions that you will most likely need to know for your exam and in real world troubleshooting. First, there's the version field. The version field indicates that it is IPv4 in this instance with a value of 0100. Then there's the type of service field. This field is re commonly referred to as the type of service byte. It has eight bits used to set quality of service markings. And specifically within this field is DSCP, the six leftmost bits are used for DSCP, which obviously commonly is associated with quality of service marking. Next is the IP flags field. This is a three bit field. The second bit of this field is the DF or do not fragment, fragment bit. And that indicates that a packet should not be fragmented. Then there's the time to live field. This is an eight bit field that is decremented by one each time a packet is routed from one IP network to another. If TTL ever reaches zero, the packet is discarded. The protocol field, which is an 8-bit field, specifies what kind of data, uh, type of data is encapsulated in the packet. TCP and UDP are common protocols identified by this field. Finally, the source address field, which is a 32-bit field indicating the source of the IPv4 packet, and then the destination address field which again is a 32-bit destination, destination address, which indicates the destination for that packet. Next, let's move on to the TCP segment header. Here are some of the fields you will certainly need to know. You have the source port field, which is the 16-bit field indicating the sending port number, and the destination port field, again, a 16-bit field. So, for example, if you connect to howtonetwork.com, you're connecting to a destination port of 80, which is the TCP port for HTTP. The sequence number field is a 32-bit field indicating the amount of data sent during a TCP session. The sending party uses this field to make sure the receiving party actually received the data. The receiving party uses the sequence number from this field as the basis for the acknowledgement number in the next segment that it sends back to the sender. And then the window field, which is a 16-bit field, it specifies the number of bytes a sender is willing to transmit before receiving an acknowledgement from the receiver, known as the round trip time. The other IP layer for transport protocol is UDP. UDP is considered to be an unreliable protocol because it lacks all of the features of TCP. There's no sequence numbering, no window size, no acknowledgements. You can see here the header is quite simple. It contains only source and destination port numbers, and then a UDP checksum, and then segment length. So why use UDP? Well, it's best for servicing applications that need to maximize bandwidth and do not require acknowledgements, such as video streams or audio. And in fact, the primary protocol used to carry voice and video traffic over networks is 
RTP, Real-Time Transport Protocol. And that's a Layer 4 protocol that is encapsulated inside of UDP. So here's what you learned. You learned about the basics of IPv4 addressing and subnets. And then you received a brief overview of TCP, UDP, and IP headers. All this information will come in handy on your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we will be discussing IP version 6 addressing. So let's ask the basic question, why even upgrade to IP version 6, other than the fact that you simply get more IP addresses? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to upgrade to IP version 6, and here are a few of them spelled out for you, which I think you'll need to know for your CCNP router exam. But please note, you no longer need NAT or PAT. It has inherent IPsec support. These are key and critical updates. Now, once you've committed to using IP version 6, you need to understand how these different IP addresses are labeled. There's a global unicast address. These are unicast packets sent through the public internet, with public IP addresses. Unique local, which are unicast packets inside one organization, which is basically e equal to your private IP addressing. Link local, which are packets sent to a local subnet and are not routable across networks. And, the, and then finally, take note of the loopback address, which you know from IP version 4 is 127.0.0.1. IP version 6 also has a loopback addressing as well. An IP version 6 address has 128 bits broken out into 32 hexadecimal numbers organized into eight quartets. So here is the hexadecimal numbering system, which I'm sure we won't need much of a refresher on, but we do need to use it to understand IP version 6. And here is an IPv6 IP address. And as you can see, it looks quite long, mainly because we're used to looking at IP version 4 addresses. So this ups the game a little bit, and we may begin to wonder how we're going to support this on our network or document this, and we get concerned about managing a network with addressing this long. Well, there are built-in mechanisms within IP version 6 to help us manage it, and we're going to cover that. There's ways you can summarize IP version 6 addresses to make it more manageable, not only to read, but to understand and explain to other people. So you can shorten an IP version 6 by, omit, by omitting the leading zeros in any, any given quartet, or you can represent one or more consecutive quartets with a double colon. So here you see an IP version 6 address with many zeros in it. Here's how we can summarize it. On the left hand side, you can see that we use a double colon to represent the first, uh, the second and third quartet, and then we summarize the remaining quartets of zeros. And in the second example, we did the opposite. We summarized the first two quartets with zeros and then used the double colon for the end. You can only use the double colon once in an IP version 6 IP address. So here we see an IP version 6 IP address, and this is the subnet. It's the remember it's a slash 64. So we're matching the first 64 bits, as you see here. And this also can be summarized. You don't need to write out all these zeros. So to, to explain what the subnet is to somebody, you can simply write it out this way. So IP version 6 is manageable. It gives you tools to manage it. So whether you are reviewing documentation or holding a general discussion about your network or simply logging into a Cisco router to take a look at what's going on, understanding abbreviation is key to IP version 6. Here are some other ways we can understand IP version 6 addressing. In our first example, you'll see that it's 2000 and then a double colon slash 4. The slash 4 would match the first 4 bits. In hex, that would be 0010. So all addresses whose first 4 bits are equal to the first 4 bits of the hex number 2000. In the second example, we're matching all addresses whose first 20 bits match the listed 
X number, and you can see in red what match that would be. And then the final example, all addresses whose first 32 bits match the listed hex number. Here's another IP version 6 address. How do we break it out into subnets? Well, here you have it. We're honoring the first 48 bits of this range, and then we are breaking this out into smaller subnets, as you can see here. Each subnet matching the first 112 bits. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about some basic IP version 6 concepts and why you may want to upgrade to IPv6 beyond just for the reason of obtaining more IP addresses. You've also learned about the addressing and how that addressing can be abbreviated. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we're going to cover routing protocol concepts to introduce you to routing protocols for your CCDA exam. Cisco wants you to be able to identify the attributes of routing protocols so that you can make the correct design decisions. The fundamental question is, which routing protocol should you use? When answering that question, you must keep in mind the following characteristics of routing protocols. And Cisco wants you to remember all of these. First is scalability. How large is your network now? How large will it become? This is important because there are versions of RIP, or actually all versions of RIP, have a maximum hop count of 15 routers. OSPF and EIGRP scale much better, and BGP is the primary routing protocol used on the internet, so obviously it scales very well. And many companies, in fact, use BGP internally for that reason. Vendor interoperability. Will you be using all Cisco routers on your network or will it be a blend of Cisco and non-Cisco? Why is that important? Well, RIP and OSPF work fine regardless of vendor. And now even Cisco has taken steps to ensure EIGRP can be used by any networking vendor. The question is, do they support it? RIP and OSPF and BGP most likely. EIGRP maybe or maybe not by non-Cisco vendors. IT staff's familiarity with the protocol. You and the IT staff at your company might be much more familiar with one routing protocol over another. I worked at a company where we had an internal debate over EIGRP versus OSPF. And the tipping point for the conversation was what protocol do the engineers already know or want to learn better? It was OSPF. And therefore, that's what we went with as far as our design decision. That was the tipping point. You will have the same debates internally and should be prepared for this in your decision-making process. Speed of convergence. A benefit of dynamic routing protocols over static routes is the ability for dynamic routing protocols to reroute around network failures. When this failure occurs, the network recalculates and reaches a steady state condition. This is called the state of being a converged network. The amount of time for the failover to occur is called the convergence time. Now, some routing protocols have faster convergence times than others. This is important because when a network is not in a steady state, data can be dropped or looped within the network. You should know that because RIP and BGP might take up to a few minutes to converge. By contrast, OSPF and EIGRP can converge in just a few seconds. The capability to perform summarization. Large enterprise networks can have routing tables with many route entries and network summarization allows multiple routes to then be summarized into a single route advertisement. So it reduces the number of entries in a router's routing table that eats up less memory and also CPU because it reduces the number of network advertisements that need to be sent. And that can obviously increase convergence time as well. Here's a perfect example. Let's say we're looking at the routing table of a core router and it knows about all the branch offices. And let's say there are 255 branch offices and each are allotted a slash 24 and they're assigned a 192.168.x.0 slash 24 network. Now sure, the core router has 
individual entries for all of these routes and knows how to reach all of them through separate interfaces or tunnels. But all of these routes do not need to be passed individually throughout the network onto a neighbor through a route advertisement. They can be summarized using one summary route, 192.168.00 slash 16. So as you can see, using summarization, we're saving a lot of memory and CPU by simply summarizing all of these routes um, into one single route. Interior or exterior routing. A key term you need to understand is AS, which stands for Autonomous System, and this is a network under a single administrative control. A network might be a single AS, and when it connects to, let's say, another network, let's say an internet service provider, then it's connecting to a separate AS. When you're selecting a routing protocol, you need to determine, is it running inside your network, or will you be running it with somebody outside of your network? To answer the question as to what routing protocol you should run, you need to understand if you need an IGP, an interior gateway protocol, or a EGP, an exterior gateway protocol. An IGP exchanges routes between routers in a single AS. Common IGPs are EIGRP or OSPF, and then RIP and ISIS are also used, but not as much. Today, the only EGP in use is BGP. But please note that BGP is sometimes also used as an interior gateway protocol as well. There are two types of routing protocols. The first type is distance vector. Distance vector routing protocols send a full copy of the router's routing table to directly attach neighbors. Now, obviously this is not very efficient because it's sending information to a neighbor even if the neighbor already has that information. This can lead to slower convergence time. With slow convergence time, you then can introduce routing loops. The routing protocols that are considered distance vector are RIP and EIGRP. There are two mechanisms that you can use to deal with routing loops that Cisco wants you to know. The first is split horizon. This prevents a route learned on an interface from being advertised back out that same interface. I'll show you a diagram in a minute so this makes more sense. And then there's poison reverse, which causes a route received on one interface to then be advertised out the same interface with an infinite metric so that nobody actually wants to use it. But let's go ahead and take a look at the diagram so we can better understand the issue with routing loops and distance vector routing protocols, and then what we can do about it with split horizon or poison reverse. As you can see here, we have a basic point-to-point -point network, router one connecting to router two over serial interface and then a network 192.168.1.0 slash 24, which is then advertised out serial zero over to router one. Router one then learns that route and places it in its routing table, as you can see here, with a metric of one, one hop. Now what if ethernet zero on router two were to go down and the network were no longer available? The problem with distance vector routing is that Router 1 is going to send its full routing table over to Router 2. Well, Router 2 does not know about 192.168.1.0 anymore, so when it receives the subnet advertisement from Router 1 of 192.168.1.0, it's going to accept it and place it in its routing table with a metric of 2. And this is where we introduce routing loops. Router 2 will then forward traffic over to Router 1, Router th 1 thinks it can reach that network via Router 2, and traffic will then loop between the two routers. This obviously is not ideal. Now you've already learned about the two solutions to deal with that, and you'll need to know it for your CCMP exam. Split Horizon will prevent a route learned on an interface from being advertised back out that same interface, and then Poison Reverse, which causes a route received on one interface to be advertised out that same interface with an infinite metric. The next type of routing protocol you need to be aware of is the link state routing protocol. Routers send link state advertisements, or LSA, to advertise the networks they know how to reach. So they don't send the full routing table, just the networks they know how to reach, and only when there is a change in the topology. They only exchange full routing information when two routers initially form their adjacency, but from there on out it's on a need-to-know basis. The routing protocols that are link state routing protocols are OSPF and ISIS. 
And the final type of routing protocol you need to know is path vector. BGP is path vector, and it includes information not just about the neighbor, but the exact path that packets take to reach a specific destination network. So when you do look at BGP advertisements, you can see exactly over what autonomous systems that traffic is flowing over. So you've learned about the role of routing in an enterprise network and the different layers of enterprise network design. And then you learn the basic characteristics of routing protocols, which is really going to help you as you solidify your foundation and now you move forward in your CCMP studies. I'm sure you're going to do great and continue on with the video series and good luck to you in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about RIP design. Specifically, we're going to first learn about RIP version 1, so you can lay a foundation for understanding uh, RIP version 2. Since that is the version most commonly used today, and if you were to design a network using RIP, uh, most likely that would be the version you would choose. So let's begin with RIP version 1. Now, the major drawback of RIP version 1 and why many don't use it today is that it has classful behavior, meaning that it does not send back subnet mask information. Now, if there is no subnet mask information in the updates, then it assumes that any network is staying within its classful boundary, which, in, as you know, in most networks today, that's rare. As you can see here, each class has a range of IP addresses that it would support. And if it were to remain on classful boundaries, that would mean that you would not be able to provide VLSM or break down these assigned subnets into smaller subnets. So for example, if you were assigned a network in the class A range, let's say a 10 dot network, you would not be able to break your 10 dot network down into smaller subnets. So later in this video, we will talk about auto summarization and that if it summarizes on a classful boundary, specifically with 10 dot networks, you can have routing problems. So often you will find that you will want to turn off auto summarization in RIP version 2. Another issue with RIP version 1 is that it broadcasts updates. So it uses unnecessary bandwidth, but it also means that routers that are not even running RIP will constantly receive RIP updates even though they won't process them because routers that run RIP will broadcast them out all interfaces. Modern routing protocols use a multicast approach in order to solve this issue by sending updates only to routers that really need to receive them. RIP version 1 does not allow authentication so there is no element of security that can be added to the routing protocol to ensure that it is not sending information to devices that should not receive it. When examining RIP version 2, you can see that many of RIP version 1's shortcomings have been addressed. RIP version 2 has a classless behavior, meaning that subnet mask information is sent in updates so VLSM can be achieved. RIP version 2 also supports authentication to ensure that the person you are sending the information to is the person authorized to receive that information. Now, in addition to plain text passwords, the Cisco implementation provides the ability to use MD5 authentication. MD5 is a, is a hashing algorithm that takes a variable length string of text and produces a fixed length 128-bit output. The advantage of hashtag plain text is that the original message cannot be reconstructed even with the knowledge of the hash algorithm. Now with regards to advertisements, RIP version 2 multicasts routing updates instead of broadcasting them as RIP version 1 does. So this allows for the efficient exchange of routing updates. Another special feature of RIP version 2 is automatic summarization feature which is applied to prefixes on classful boundaries. 
This behavior is a double-edged sword because it can induce problems in real-world scenarios. Let's look at the following example. Router 1 connects to the following networks, 10.10.10.0 .10 .10 and 10.10.20.0 and 10.10.30.0. Router 1 connects to Router 2 and then on to Router 3, which has connectivity to the 10.40.0 and 10.10.50.0 networks. There are also other networks between the routers, such as 172.16.0.0 and 192.168.0.0. Notice the change in classful boundaries that makes RIP automatically summarize the networks behind router 1 and router 3 as 10.0.0.0 slash 8 toward router 2. This can lead to a problem, or it will lead to a problem. Router 2 will receive the same route from both directions. If it receives a packet destined for 10.10.10.0, it can send it in both directions based on the automatically summarized prefixes it received. This problem is called discontiguous subnets, and it's generated by the automatic summarization behavior of the routing protocol that aggregates those subnets. Solutions for this problem involve not using discontiguous subnets in different areas in the network topology, or disabling auto summarization. Let's take a look at the RIP version 2 message format. The RIP version 2 message format takes advantage of the unused fields in the RIP version 1 message format by adding subnet masks and other information. Let's go through some of the key attributes of this message. The command field indicates whether the packet is a request or response message. The request message asks that a router send all or part of its routing table. Response messages contain route entries. The router sends the response periodically or as a reply to a request. Version specifies the RIP version used, 2 for RIP version 2 and 1 for RIP version 1. AFI field specifies the address family used. RIP is designed to carry routing information for several different protocols. Each entry has an AFI to indicate the type of address specified. The AFI for IP is 2. Route tag. Route tags provide a method for distinguishing between internal routes, which are learned by RIP, and external routes, which are learned from other routing protocols. You can add this optional attribute during the redistribution of routing protocols. IP address specifies the IP address of the destination. Subnet mask contains the subnet mask for the destination. Now if this field is zero, no subnet mask has been specified for the entry. Next hop indicates the IP address of the next hop where packets are sent to reach the destination. And metric indicates how many router hops to reach the destination. The metric is always going to be between one and 15 for a valid route, since 16 would indicate an unreasonable, unreachable or infinite route. Another aspect about RIP that you need to know is that it relies on a series of timers for its operations, as described here. The update timer, this is where updates are sent, and they're sent every 30 seconds by default. Invalid, the route is invalidated if no update was received before this timer expires. Flush timer determines the time a route gets flushed from the RIP table. And hold down timer, updates are not accepted for a route that keeps getting a bad metric. And finally, the sleep timer, which can add delay to triggered updates. The hold down and sleep timers are Cisco specific and are used to enhance the RIP functionality. They were not originally specified in the RFCs for RIP. In summary, here are some key points about RIP version 2 that you need to memorize for your CCDA exam. It's a distance vector protocol, which uses UDP port 520. It does not scale well, since the maximum hop count is 15. Periodic route updates are sent every 30 seconds to a multicast address. 25 routes are allowed per RIP message, or 24 if you're using authentication. And obviously it supports authentication. Subnet mask is included in every route entry. It's a classless protocol. It does support VLSM, and the metric for 
version two is router hop count. Now all of these points you need to memorize for your CCDA exam. This video has given you a good base foundation for preparations for your CCDA. If you can memorize what you've learned in this video, you should do very well when asked questions about RIP and how and when you would use it in a network design. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about EIGRP design. We're going to do a high-level EIGRP overview uh, in this video, and then we're going to talk about the EIGRP components. You're going to see this constant theme of these four components. So first there are EIGRP messages that are unique to EIGRP. There's a unique EIGRP algorithm. Um, there are tables that are, again, unique to EIGRP that you need to know about. And then finally, you need to know that EIGRP supports uh, independent modules. So there are multiple, there's multiple support for uh, multiple different network layer protocols. Now, the way we're going to approach this is, again, it's a high-level overview of concepts that are unique to EIGRP. So we all know that EIGRP can support VLSM, for example, but many routing protocols can. So we're not going to dig into VLSM and EIGRP. We're going to talk about things that are unique to EIGRP. Now, for to understand EIGRP, we first need to understand IGRP. IGRP came out in 1986. It is an interior gateway protocol that was once very popular. Uh, distance, vector, uh, distance vector routing uh, protocol. And it used four key attributes to develop um, this distance information on how to choose the best path. So it looked at the link and then it said how much available bandwidth is there, um, how much delay, how much load, and how much link reliability is there on this link path or on the multiple links to my path. Well, EIGRP is still an interior gateway protocol. And it is still a distance vector protocol, although it, many times in the past it had been referred to as hybrid, but those days are pretty much gone. Uh, distance vector is what it's classified as, but it has con improved convergence in operations. So it uses the dual diffusing update algorithm, and I'll show you about that in a few minutes. And then again, it has multiple unique tables to EIGRP, which assists in the operations and enhances the operations. And then again, it supports multiple network layer protocols. So how does EIGRP actually work? Well, I tell you what, let's go ahead and open up the hood and take a look underneath. EIGRP has four basic components, and these should already start looking familiar to you. It has messages. So messages flow to and from neighbors, EIGRP neighbors. There's five different types. We'll dig into that in a little bit. EIGRP has the dual algorithm. The dual algorithm takes the information from those messages and then processes best path and possible best path. Then all the information from the messages and the algorithms get put into tables. So these EIGRP tables hold the data from the algorithm and the messages. And then finally, the modules. These protocol dependent modules support a variety of network layer protocols. So we're not limited. EIGRP is not limited to just IP. So with regards to messages, there are different types of packet formats. There's five different types of packet formats. First, there's the hello message. A hello message is basically a query out to anybody who'll listen, asking if anybody's out there. So a router running EIGRP sends hello packets by default, and it will send those packets out and hope for a return reply. And when it gets a return reply, it'll get that update. And that update contains all of the messages or all of the routes that want to be shared via EIGRP. Update messages are messages with a lot of routing information in them. 
And then there's the acknowledgement message, which surely you know about from other protocols, but it's simply acknowledging that, yes, I've received your message. And that's key to the reliable nature of EIGRP, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's a query message. So if EIGRP loses a route and does not know how to get there anymore, it will query its neighbor saying, do you have any information about this route? Because I'd like to get that information. And then if a router does have information on that route or on that path, it will reply back saying, yes, I do have information and here it is. So these five messages can be broken out into two categories, some that are reliable and some that are not reliable. The reliable messages are use reliable transport protocol. And this is unique to EIGRP, but RTP basically makes sure that packets um, get to where they're supposed to go in order. So an unreliable packet is a hello message. Um, that message is not reliable, but the update message from an EIGRP router does use RTP. So it is sequenced and there are acknowledgements. So there is an acknowledgement to that message, but the acknowledgement itself is not reliable. Then there's the query message. Remember the query is to ask, do you have information about this route? And that is that uses RTP and the response to that query, the reply also uses RTP. So three different types of messages use RTP, the update, the query, and the reply. And I think that's critical to know for your exam. Now let's talk about the EIGRP algorithm, which is dual. Now to understand dual, you need to understand what successor and feasible successor routes are. Think, when you think of successor, just think of success. That's the best path. So if EIGRP loses connectivity to the best path, it will then run the dual algorithm and ask, is there a feasible successor? Is there a second best path? And if the dual algorithm states, yes, there is a feasible successor, a second best path, it will then promote that second best path to the, to, to the best path. So that becomes the successor. Once it's, a, it's the successor, it is then installed into the routing table. So for example, it would be installed into the IP routing table. And then the router would begin to use that new path. So this chart gives you an overview of, of base, a high level overview of how the dual algorithm runs. But it's important to know these concepts of successor and feasible successor as you move forward with EIGRP and how dual uses that information. Now EIGRP uses specific tables to help make it run. And one of the tables that EIGRP uses is called a neighbor table. Now a neighbor table is exactly what you think it is. It's a table that is comprised of a listing of all the EIGRP neighbors. So for example, we have a hub and spoke design here. We have router A, uh, router B, and router C. And router A and router B are both running EIGRP. Router A sends out a hello packet and router B responds back as well. And they've established a neighbor relationship and router A sends out a hello packet. Router C does the same, and they've established their EIGRP neighbor relationship. So once that happens, Router A begins to build out its neighbor table by identifying each router, that each neighbor by IP address. So for example, Router B is 172.16.1.1, and he gets placed into the neighbor table. And then Router C is 192.168.10.2, and he is placed in the router table as well. So router A now has two neighbors and they are both listed in its neighbor table. But there's also other information in the neighbor table as well. And it, the router A also wants to know what interface are these routers um, off of. So router B is off of serial one, router C is off of serial two. So should I need to forward them uh, traffic or I know exactly which interface they will be exiting and then finally there's other information that is entered into the neighbor table there's quite a bit actually but for the sake of this high-level overview let's just talk about hold time because this is a key concept when you program hold time on a router it's not local you're not changing the hold time locally that information is actually forwarded over to your neighbor routers. So here we have router C 
who's changed his hold time to 10 seconds. He forwards that over to router A. And here we have router B. And let's say he's going to change his hold time. This information that they're changing from the default, it gets inserted into the neighbor table on router A. And remember, hold time is basically telling the router, if you don't hear from me in this amount of time, consider me down and flush the routes that you receive from me. So it's important to remember, hold time is configured on router C and router B, but the actual numeric change occurs on router A in the neighbor table. Now there's definitely other attributes that are in the neighbor table, and we will definitely go over those in future videos, but on a high level overview of EIGRP, you need to know about um, the IP, the interface, and the hold time counter. And just remember, hold time defaults are, is 180 seconds for low bandwidth links and 15 seconds for T1 or higher. So that'll come up again and again, and you'll probably be asked about that as well. But there are other EIGRP tables that you should also be aware of. And a key table to know about is the topology table. Topology table contains all destinations advertised by neighboring routers. This includes, remember, the successor and feasible successor routes, the best path to a destination, and the next best path, respectively. So a topology table is key for EIGRP to run. Now remember, within topology table, you can see the route tag. So in EIGRP, you can actually perform route tagging. And all you really need to know for now is that you can identify routes by their origination, which allows for custom routing. So you can tag those routes with a manual entry. So that's all you really know, need to know for now. But getting back to EIGRP tables, now, here, here's an example. We have, again, a hub and spoke design, router A, router B, and router C. Now, router A is going to build out, as soon as it enables EIGRP, it's going to build out these EIGRP tables. And one of the tables, again, is going to be this topology table. The topology table is going to contain critical information for EIGRP to run and make the choices upon what the best path is going to be. So in the topology table, it's going to insert routes that it learns from router B and router C. And then it's going to ask, now that I know about this route, which neighbor did I learn it from? And then finally, it's going to say, all right, I know the route. I know the neighbor I learned from. What metric should I assign to it? Which way should I send traffic or forward traffic? So in this example... The route itself, let's say, we'll do a 10.1.1.0 slash 24. And let's say we learn this route from both router B and from router C. So this topology table is filled out with two entries for the same route. Again, this is not the routing table yet. This is the topology table. And it has a metric, so let's keep it simple. So the metric to router B is 10, and the metric to router C is 20. So for this simple example, let's just say that the router now realizes that the successor route, the best route, is going to be the path through router B. Now, once the dual algorithm has run and it realizes this, it then takes that route or that path and it places the successor route into the routing table in this case the IP routing table so now we know the successor is to router B and the feasible successor path is to router C so as we can see it's going to choose the path out to router B now what happens if this route information is lost and router A no longer learns about this this route from router B or from router C and it gets flushed. Well router A what he's gonna do is he's gonna send a query to router B and to router C asking do you know about this route because I've lost it and I'm hoping you have information on it. And 
the neighbors will respond back, but specifically, let's say in this case, that router C is the only one that knows about it. Router C will respond, yes, I'm aware of it, and it will send the information over, and router A will say, thank you very much, and router A will then insert it into the topology table. It will become the successor, and once it's the successor, it will be placed into the routing table, and then router A will then begin using the path through router C to reach that subnet. And last, but certainly not least, we have protocol dependent modules. So EIGRP and the dual algorithm function in a way that protocols can run and use EIGRP independently of one another. So IP builds out its own neighbor and topology tables, IPX and Apple Talk. They all build out their own neighbor and topology tables and dual can work with any and all of them. So you've learned a lot in this video that will help you with EIGRP design. We've done an overview and we've talked about the individual components of EIGRP, messages, algorithms, tables, and modules. You'll need to know all this information not only to design EIGRP, but obviously to do very well on the CCDA exam. If you study what's in this video and know it well, I'm confident you'll do really well in the EIGRP portion of your CCDA. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering OSPF design. We're going to begin with some concepts you need to understand, a baseline I guess you could say, prior to designing OSPF. And then we're going to get a bit more granular in this video and dig into OSPF concepts, such as administrative areas, virtual links, router types, designated routers, neighbor exchange states, link state advertisements, and best path selection. If you're going to design OSPF properly, you need to understand all of these concepts. We will not go into configuration examples. That you can learn in the CCNP route exam. But for the CCDA, you will need to understand these concepts. So let's begin. OSPF is one of the most complex routing protocols that can de be deployed in modern networks. OSPF is an open standard protocol, that is, it should be able to run on Cisco and non-Cisco equipment. OSPF is a classless routing protocol, and this allows it to support VLSM. Similar to EIGRP, which uses dual, OSPF uses SPF algorithm to select loop-free paths throughout the topology. OSPF is designed to be very scalable because it's hierarchical routing protocol using the concept of areas to split the topology into smaller sections. So it is a very popular protocol in today's enterprise networks because it can scale so well. OSPF takes bandwidth into consideration when calculating route metrics. In OSPF, it's considered the cost. A higher bandwidth generates a lower cost, and lower costs are preferred in OSPF. OSPF supports authentication, just as EIGRP does in RIP version 2. OSPF is also very extensible. It's similar to BGP and ISIS, meaning that the protocol can be modified in the future to handle other forms of traffic. OSPF discovers neighbors and exchanges topology information with its neighbors, acting much as EIGRP does in that way. Based on the collected information and the link costs, OSPF calculates the shortest paths to each destination using, as we mentioned before, the SPF algorithm. The formula for calculating the interface cost is reference bandwidth divided by link bandwidth. The default reference bandwidth is 100 megabits per second, but this can be modified, just as the link bandwidth can be modified using the bandwidth command. Please note that the reference bandwidth should be modified in networks that contain a combination of 100 megabits per second and 1 gigabit per second links, because by default, all of these interfaces will be assigned the same OSPF cost. That's obviously a big design consideration and something you certainly could be tested on. Another aspect that adds to the design complexity of OSPF is that it can be configured to behave differently 
depending on the topology in which you are implementing it. OSPF recognizes different network types and this will control following actions such as how updates are sent, how many adjacencies are made with the OSPF speakers, and how the next hop is calculated. OSPF supports the following network types broadcast, non-broadcast, point-to-point, point-to-multipoint, point-to-multipoint non-broadcast, and loopback. OSPF automatically selects the network type that is the most appropriate for the given technology. So for example, if you configure OSPF in a broadcast-based Ethernet environment, it will default to the broadcast type. If you configure it on a frame relay interface, it will default to the non-broadcast type. And OSPF configured on a point-to-point -point serial link will default to the point-to-point -point network type. The only network types that you need to manually assign would be point-to-multipoint or point-to-multipoint non-broadcast. These obviously are most appropriate for the partial mesh, which is hub and spoke environments, and these must be configured manually. So now that you have a high level understanding of OSPF, let's go ahead and dig into OSPF concepts, all of which you will need to know for your CCDA exam. We're going to go through these one by one to the level of detail you need to know for the CCDA exam. And we're going to begin with administrative areas. An autonomous system is broken out into areas. So areas are a group of routers that share a same area ID. And these different areas these different groupings have different functions and and they know different types of information so you have backbone area standard area etc etc and each of these areas perform different functions so let's talk in detail about what some of these areas know and maybe what some of these areas do not know but also how OSPF is designed around these these concepts of areas so remember we're talking at a higher level here but as, as, a, as a good rule of thumb um, your backbone area in OSPF if anybody ever refers to area zero you know they're talking about the backbone area in OSPF and this is probably the most well-known area because uh, it is required. And all other areas must connect to the backbone area. So if for area to area communication, let's say you have an area one communicating to an area three, both of those areas must connect to the backbone. So let's start here with a standard area. Now a standard area you know, you know, what does that really mean? Well, standard areas can be thought of as equal opportunity employers, I guess you could say, because um, they know about every route in the autonomous system in the OSPF network. And they share their routes, but they also learn all their routes uh, from other areas uh, through the backbone. And this is just fine. All of this route sharing is just fine if routers are high powered enough to store every route, but also to run these uh, complex SPF calculations. Um, but just know the standard areas contain LSAs of type one, two, three, four, and five. Now next, you know, if you think of a, a stub area, which we'll talk about next, if you think of a network, you know, you have leaf nodes on networks. Well, that's what kind of a stub area is. It's handy if devices are lower powered, routers are lower powered, or simply do not need to know about every route. A stub area is similar to a standard area, but routers in it are not aware of externally sourced routes directly. And in terms of LSAs, that means that type five LSAs are not permitted in a stub area. Stub areas use a default route uh, to exit. For traffic to exit a stub area, it uses a default route. Now, next would be a totally stubby area. And let's take this stub area concept one step further. In a, in a total stub area, in addition to the lack of type 4 and 5 LSAs, type 3 LSAs, which carry information about internal routes, are also prohibited. Uh, the concept of an injected default route still applies here, just like a stub area. So all traffic leaving the area does so using the default route.
And then finally, let's go over this concept of not so stubby areas. So, you know, this is an interesting, uh, I guess you could say concoction because not so stubby areas can connect to non OSPF networks um, that are not a part of this autonomous system and they, and they can receive routes from those non OSPF networks or networks that are not participating in the autonomous system. And it will receive those routes through redistribution. And then it can um, turn those type seven LSAs and kind of, you know, basically it's gonna mask them and, and make them appear as type five LSAs and then begin sharing them onto the network. So there's, there's your ideas of networks in, in areas, but all areas in an OSPF autonomous system must be, as you know, physically connected to the backbone area. Well, what if you can't do that? You know, what if you uh, what if you can't connect an area to uh, area zero? So let's draw out this concept of a virtual link. Let's imagine we have our a company on the East Coast, and we have in this company we've deployed OSPF already. So we have our backbone area zero. And then we have other areas that have to obviously connect into this backbone area. So let's say we have an area one in the Boston area and then an area two, let's say in Florida. But let's focus in on area one. So in the Boston area, we have area one in Boston and we acquire another company in that area. And it's easy enough for us to connect this new company into our Boston resources. So uh, we're gonna connect them into our Boston router very simply, the problem is, is that even though this company that we've acquired, maybe they're already running OSPF and we convert them to OSPF area three to work within our autonomous system, we still need to meet the requirement of OSPF where an area must connect into area zero. So OSPF allows for what is called, as you know, the virtual link. We will create this virtual link between area three and area zero it's passing through area one, and this allows us to meet that design requirement of OSPF. So route to area three and area zero see this as a direct connection and things will work just fine thanks to the virtual link. So there are many different OSPF router types that you need to be aware of. There's the area border router, which connects one or more OSPF areas to the backbone area. There's the ASBR, or autonomous system boundary router, which will be located between an OSPF autonomous system and a non-OSPF network. And then you have your backbone router, which is pretty straightforward, a router with at least one interface connected to area zero. And then another easy concept, an internal router, a router with all interfaces in one area. Let's draw this out real quick, let's just to drive it home. So uh, let's draw out our area zero. And in area zero, you know already is the backbone. So a router within area zero is a backbone router. And then we connect to another area. Let's say area one. This is an, this is an area border router. Pretty straightforward concept. There's your ABR. And let's say we have another area we're connecting to. There's another ABR. but we are also connecting an ASBR here because we have a non-OSPF network that we're gonna be injecting routes from into our OSPF process. So we are injecting routes in through an ASBR, converting type seven LSAs to type five, and those are being forwarded onto the network. And then you have, last but not least, internal uh, routers, which have all interfaces in the same area. Pretty straightforward. So in order for two OSPF routers to communicate, they need to go through this process of exchange states. So you need to understand a basic concept of what these are. Here's the following states. There's the init state where a hello packet has been sent by a router, it's waiting for a reply. Then the establishment state where there's the discovery of that hello and then the election of a DR and multi-access networks. The X start stage where 
a master-slave relationship is started between two routers. The router with the higher router ID becomes the master and starts the exchange, and as such is the only router that can increment the sequence number. Then there's the exchange state, where the slave acknowledge, acknowledges the master's packets, and this information in this state is only LSA headers, and, that does, and, and it describes the contents of the entire link state database. Then there's loading, where there's a request for more information. In this state, the actual exchange of link state information occurs. And then there's full synchronization. And in this state, routers are fully adjacent with one another. All the router and network LSAs are exchanged and the router's databases are fully synchronized. Now, a designated router in OSPF is a key concept that you need to know because on multi-access networks, a designated router will establish adjacencies with all other routers on the multi-access network, learn all of their routes, and then share all of their routes with all the other routers. And then the, the BDR, the backup designated router, will fill in should the DR fail. And you can set the DR and the BDR manually, and actually you, most, you, you should do it this way. You should set it using the priority command in OSPF. So understanding OSPF priority is key because you can manually set who the DR is and who the BDR is. Now, it's easy to talk about this and look at a look at a PowerPoint and you may not fully appreciate how important this concept really is. So let's actually draw it out. So on a typical multi-axis network, let's say we have five routers and you want to establish adjacencies in OSPF to share routes between them. If they did it that way where they're all neighboring with one another and communicating with one another, you're going to see that all of these adjacencies are going to add up pretty quickly. And that's going, to, that's going to tax the resources on the routers themselves, but it's really unnecessary. We can share this information in a much more efficient manner. So what we're going to do is we elect a DR in OSPF. Again, it has this built in within the, the OSPF design itself, where multi-access networks, you can elect a DR. And then the DR establishes a, a, an adjacency with all the other routers on the multi-access network. It learns all of their routes and then shares all of their routes. So now we just have four adjacencies required. Now, if the DR fails and those adjacencies fail, the BDR would take over. Now, regarding link state advertisements, what you really need to know, at least just for now in OSPF, is that a link state advertisement is a packet that contains all relevant information regarding a router's links and the state of those links. Now there are many different types and I've listed the key types for you here. And we're gonna dig into detail in these different types as we get into the labs. But just for now, know that these are, these are informational packets that have information on a router's links and the state of those links. So now that OSPF has gathered all this information, it needs to know what to do with it. It needs to choose the best path. So it puts all the information in a topology table. And then OSPF, the metric for OSPF is cost. So cost is 10 to the power of 8 divided by bandwidth. And lower costs are preferred. So the best way to understand cost is actually for us just to draw this out to see how it works. So let's draw out a six router network. And let's say we have router one, which ultimately wants to communicate with a network off of router six. And it will have two choices, two paths it can possibly take. It can go via router two or via router four to this network, we'll say 192.168.10 network slash 24. which is hanging off router six. Now, router one then calculates using OSPF the cost for each and every link in this path. And it's gonna do the same uh, for the path from router two and three to six. And then what OSPF is going to do is add up the entire cost to get to router six. So from going via router four, that path has a total cost of 20. 
and going via router 2, that path has a total cost of 25, and we know that OSPF uses the lower cost to make its decision on which path to take. So the total cost of 20 wins out, and we will choose router 4. Now that being said, let's say a new network is introduced that has higher bandwidth links. And even though we have more routers or more hops through this network, let's say there are four hops. If the cost is low, and for this case we'll say five, five, one, one, and one. If the total cost here is just 13, even though there's more hops, OSPF is gonna choose this path because it's more efficient. So that's cost basically explained. That's cost in a nutshell. So here's what you've learned. You received an overview of OSPF, and then we got a bit more granular to the level you'll need to know for the CCDA exam, including administrative areas, virtual links, router types, designated routers, neighbor exchange states, link state advertisements, and best path selection. I'm confident after watching this video, if you know this information well, you're going to do excellent on the OSPF portion of your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about ISIS design. Specifically, you're going to learn about ISIS operations, areas, addressing, packet types, network types, and metrics. So let's begin. In recent years, the ISIS routing protocol has become increasingly popular with widespread usage among service providers. It is also a very flexible protocol that's been extended to incorporate leading edge features such as MPLS traffic engineering. The ISIS routing protocol is a link state protocol as opposed to distance vector protocols such as IGRP and RIP. ISIS protocol is an intra-domain OSI dynamic routing protocol. ISIS uses a two-level hierarchy and it's used to support these large routing domains. A large domain may be administratively divided into areas. From a high level, ISIS operates as follows. Routers running ISIS will send hello packets out all ISIS enabled interfaces to discovered neighbors and establish adjacencies. Routers sharing a common data link will become neighbors if their hello packets contain information that meets the criteria for forming an adjacency. Routers may build a link state packet LSP based on their local interfaces that are configured for ISIS and prefixes learned from other adjacent routers. And a shortest path tree is calculated by each IS and from this SPT the routing table and from this the routing table is built. Next let's talk about areas and the routing domain within ISIS. So an ISIS routing domain is similar to BGP autonomous system. A routing domain is a collection of areas under an administration that implements routing policies within the domain. First, let's talk about the backbone. ISIS does not have a backbone area like OSPF Area 0. The ISIS backbone is a contiguous collection of level 2 capable routers, each of which can be in a different area. Now speaking of areas, within ISIS an individual router is only in only one area and the border between areas on the link that connects the two routers that are in different areas. And the border between areas is on the link that connects two routers that are in different areas. This obviously is in contrast to OSPF. So as you've already heard, ISIS has a two level hierarchy. Contiguous level two capable routers from the backbone both level 2 and level 1 routers live in areas. Routers can be level 1, level 2, or both level 1, level 2. Within the Cisco iOS software, the default configuration is both level 1 and level 2 at the same time. This allows ISIS network to run with minimal configuration in more of a plug-and-play fashion. Level 2 capable routers connect all areas within a routing domain. 
level two routers advertise their own NSAP address to other two other level two routers in the backbone. And all level one routers and hosts in an area must have an NSAP with the same area address. A level two router may have neighbors in the same or in different areas, but it has a level two link state database with all information for inter area routing. Level 2 routers know about other areas but will not have level 1 information from its own area. A level 1 and level 2 router may have neighbors in any area. It has two link state databases, a level 1 link state database for intra-area routing and a level 2 link state database for inter-area routing. Next let's talk about NSAP addresses. An NSAP describes an attachment to a particular service at the network layer of a node. Similar to the combination of IP destination and IP protocol number in an IP packet. An NSAP address has two major parts, the IDP or initial domain part and the DSP, the domain specific part. The IDP consists of a one byte authority and format identifier, that's the AFI and a variable, variable length initial domain identifier, the IDI. And the DSP is a string of digits identifying a particular transport implementation of a specified AFI authority. Everything to the left of the system ID can be thought of as the area address of a network node. The big difference between NSTAP style addressing and IP style addressing is that in general, there will be a single NSAP address for the entire router. All ISs and ESs in a routing domain must have system IDs of the same length. All routers in an area must have the same area address. All level two routers must have a unique system ID domain wide and all level one routers must have a unique system ID area wide. All ESs in an area will form an adjacency with a level one router on a shared media segment if they share the same area address. If multiple nets are configured on the same router, they must all have the same system ID. Next, let's talk about packet types. There are four types of packets. Each type can be level one or level two. First, there is the intermediate system to intermediate system hello packet used by routers to detect neighbors and form adjacencies. Then there's the link state packet. There are four types of LSPs, level one pseudo node, level one non pseudo node, level two pseudo node, and level two non pseudo node. Complete sequence number PDU. CSNPs contain a list of all LSPs in the current database. CNSPs are used to inform other routers of LSPs that may be outdated or missing from their own database. This ensures all routers have the same information and are synchronized. And then finally, partial sequence number PDU. PSNPs are used to request an LSP and acknowledge receipt of an LSP. Next, let's talk about network types. The types of networks that ISIS defines include point-to-point -point and broadcast networks. Point-to-point -point networks, such as serial lines, connect a single pair of routers. A router running ISIS will form an adjacency with the neighbor on the other side of a point-to-point -point interface automatically. The DIS is not elected on this type of link. The basic mechanism defined in the standard is that each side of a point-to-point -point link declares the other side to be reachable if a hello packet is received from it. Next, there's broadcast networks such as Ethernet, even Token Ring. These are multi-access and they are able to connect more than two devices. All connected routers will receive a packet sent by one router. On broadcast networks, one IS will elect itself the DIS. The DIS is responsible for flooding and it will create and flood a new pseudo node LSP for each routing level that is participating that it is participating in that is level 1 or level 2 and for each LAN to which it is configured and connected a router can be the DIS for all connected LANs or a subset of connected LANs 
depending on the configured priority or if no priority is configured, the layer to address. And then finally, NBMA networks such as Frame Relay or ATM or X25 can connect multiple devices but have no broadcast capability. All other routers attached to the network will not receive a packet sent by this router. Special considerations need to be taken in account when configuring ISIS over these types of networks because ISIS considers these media to be just like any other broadcast media such as Ethernet or Token Ring. In general, it is better to configure point-to-point -point networks on WAN interfaces and sub-interfaces. Next, let's talk about ISIS metrics. Cost is the default metric. It is supported by all routers. While some routing protocols calculate the link metric automatically based on bandwidth, such as OSPF, or bandwidth and delay, such as EIGRP, there is no automatic calculation for ISIS. Using old style metrics, an interface cost is between 1 and 63. All links use the metric of 10 by default. The total cost to a destination is the sum of all costs on an outgoing interface along a particular path from the source to the destination. And least cost paths are preferred. The total path metric was limited to 1023. This small metric value proved insufficient for large networks and provided too little granularity for new features. The Cisco IOS software addresses this issue with the support of a 24-bit metric field, the so-called wide metric. Now metrics can have a maximum value of, as you can see right here. Deploying ISIS on the IP network with wide metrics is recommended to enable finer granularity and to support future applications such as traffic engineering. So you have learned quite a bit about ISIS. You've learned about ISIS areas and router types, the NSAP address, as well as packet types, network types, and metrics. All this information will be needed on your CCDA exam and I'm confident if you've studied this video well, you're going to do very well on your exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we are going to cover BGP design. The first thing we're going to do is do an overview of BGP and then we're going to get a little bit more granular and we'll talk about BGP path attributes, BGP AS path, eBGP versus iBGP, public versus private ASNs, BGP updates, and how BGP advertises routes. All this information you will need to know to understand how to properly design BGP and do well on this portion of the CCDA exam. So let's go ahead and begin with an overview of BGP. BGP is an exterior gateway protocol that uses autonomous system numbers. It uses TCP 179 to communicate between neighbors. And it really is a protocol that requires manual configuration for almost everything. It doesn't really do anything unless you tell it to do it, which I really like about the protocol. Now, it uses path attributes, which are key in decision-making on choosing best route. So path attributes define information about a path, but also this information can be used to help decide upon the best path. And we will draw that out in a minute here so you can understand that better. Now, regarding BGP path attributes, there are some that you absolutely have to know and memorize. The first is weight. Weight influences a best route for the local router, and it can, obviously it's manually configured. Local preference influences the best route for all routers in an autonomous system, so this is a shared attribute. AS path lists the number of autonomous system numbers in the path, and this can be manipulated. Origin is a value implying if the route is from an IGP or an EGP. 
and then finally the med which can influence the best route for routers in another AS so you can influence traffic flows into your AS by sending out the med uh, to other uh, other routers so here you can see we have two routers that are in autonomous system 700 and then upstream we have another router in autonomous system 140 and autonomous system 87 so here you see there are four hops but as far as BGP is concerned it's just counting AS's so it counts one two three AS's the AS path is 700 140 and 87 why is this important to know because here's another flow that has two routers in AS 700 and then one router in AS 87 now according to this path there's just two AS's that would be the preferred path it's critical to understand that BGP is concerned about AS path and not so much about hop count AS path is a key attribute to understand now internal versus external BGP IBGP is something you would run basically interior to your company it's BGP connectivity within the same autonomous system in this routers do not update AS path normally they should never have to because you're running the same autonomous system and in IBGP things should always be meshed routers should always be fully meshed and there are ways you can get around this and we'll talk about that in a little bit now EBGP is external connectivity to other AS's and routers do update the AS path in those cases so let's say we have an autonomous system 200 and in our company we're running IBGP full mesh between all routers and let's say we have connectivity to two upstream providers one is autonomous system 301 and the other provider is autonomous system 450 now between ourselves and our providers we are running EBGP because it's two different AS's and internally we are running IBGP because we are communicating between the same AS now configuration between IBGP and EBGP is, is quite similar the main difference is you're choosing to communicate with the same AS or a different AS now let's say we want to communicate to a web server over the internet and we have a certain amount of hops now let's say one of those paths through AS 450 takes us through quite a few more hops but it takes us through fewer AS's so let's just say for example we go through AS 900 and then AS 100 so that's 450 900 and 100 those are the three AS's we traverse in order to reach that route now let's say on this flow through autonomous system 301 we go through fewer hops but more AS's now even though there's fewer hops because there are more AS's we're not going to prefer this route there are five AS's in this path that is not going to be preferred to the other path which has only three AS's so we're going to choose that path we'll choose the three AS path now let's say we're running a web server inside of our company and we're running IBGP between these three routers and we're connecting to two upstream providers using eBGP and let's say we have users on the internet who are trying to get to this web server we can manipulate the AS path attribute in BGP to make them prefer one path over the other and the way we do that and let's say our autonomous system is 50 we can manipulate the AS path attribute um, by adding to the AS path on one of our links so for example the users know that they can reach the web server via 
one AS. Well, we're going to increase that on the top router and we're going to manipulate it manually and add our AS over and over again to the AS path attribute. And the users, as far as BGP is concerned, that now is a longer path. And therefore, the users will prefer the bottom path because it's only one hop, one AS hop. Now, if that router were to fail, users would then prefer the other path. So you see you can manipulate traffic flows that way. Now, you need to understand the concept of public and private ASNs, and this shouldn't be foreign to you because you understand public and private IP addressing. So autonomous system numbers are chosen from this pool, and you can use them um, for private use or public use as need be, but you should be aware of that chart. Now regarding BGP updates that we receive from neighbors, you can receive from your provider a default route only, which many people do, or you can receive a full BGP routing table. That is literally every route that's available on the internet, or you can receive just partial updates. And that is maybe the provider knows about certain routes via a better path than most other providers. You can just receive a partial update from your provider. So you should know that you can receive those three different types of updates. That should be known for your CCNP route exam. Now regarding advertising routes, advertising BGP routes can be done four ways, either through the manual network command, redistribution of BGP into IGP, or propagation of existing BGP routes, or again manually using the aggregate address command. Maybe the best way to explain these is to simply draw it out. Now imagine we have a router with an iBGP connection and an eBGP connection to an upstream provider. So there's our eBGP connection, here's our iBGP connection, and we're autonomous system, let's say 400. So on a router, we can advertise in four different ways. We can manually specify the network we want to advertise by literally typing it in, network 10.10.10.0 or uh, network uh, 198.110, and we can forward that via IBGP and or eBGP. The other way is we can learn routes via BGP and redistribute that route into, let's say, an interior routing protocol. Let's say if we're running OSPF, we can take the, the routes we learn from our eBGP neighbor and redistribute them. The other way is to simply pass the routes we're learning from our eBGP neighbor via BGP internally to our IBGP neighbor. So that's just forwarding the, the information on. And finally, we can again manually set an aggregate address on the router and that's a manual configuration to aggregate some of the routes. And again, that can be advertised out either way. So the rule of synchronization in BGP, you should simply know this, that BGP will not advertise a route unless it knows about that route via an IGP. That's what you really need to know for the exam. Now you can disable this by typing no synchronization on your router and then it will simply forward routes that are not in the IGP. So here's what you've learned. You received an overview of BGP and we dug in a little bit on BGP path attributes, AS path, eBGP and IBGP, public and private ASNs, BGP updates, and then the advertisement of routes. All of this you will need to know for your CCDA exam, and if you master this material, I'm confident you will do very well on this portion of your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, we'll be covering IP version 6 routing protocols. So here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn about IP version 6 routing protocols, um, an overview of them, and how to enable them. To support IP version 6, all of the IPv4 routing protocols had to go through adaptations. Each had to be changed to support longer addresses and prefixes, and the actual messages used to send and receive routing information have changed in some cases as well. 
using IPv6 headers instead of v4 headers. But in particular, like their IPv4 versions, each version 6 IGP uses v6 multicast addresses. Those are just a few of the changes, but even with those changes, each IP version 6 IGP has many more similarities than differences compared to their respective version, version 4 cousins. Let's start with RIP. The overall operation of RIP Next Generation closely matches that of RIP version 2. Routers still send periodic full updates with all routes. No neighbor relationships occur. The continuing periodic updates also serve the purpose of confirming that the neighboring router still works. The big difference between RIP version 2 and RIP Next Generation configuration is that RIP Next Generation discards the age-old RIP Network command and replaces it with an Enable Interface subcommand. Finally, RIP Next Generation allows multiple RIP Next Generation processes on a single router. So an iOS requires that each RIP Next Generation process is given a text name that identifies each RIP Next Generation process for that one router. And there's another difference compared to RIP version 2. Let's go ahead and jump into our lab. In our lab, we're going to be working on router 2 and router 4. And we're going to go ahead and log in and enable RIP. Let's take a look at our interfaces on router 2. And we're going to be working with serial 00 and loopback 1. Now, the first thing we'll do on router 2 is we're going to go ahead and assign IP version 6 IP addresses. So on interface 0, 0, 0, even though it has an IP version 4 address, we obviously can still add an IP version 6 address. And again, we're going to shorten that so it's a lot easier. We're going to use the, uh, the ability to shorten that address using the double colon. And then the loopback address we'll place in a different subnet. So we're going to use 2012 and 2017. Well, let's go ahead and enable RIP next generation on router 2. And before we can do that, we need to enable version 6 routing. See, by default, a router will route version 4, but not version 6. So we do that by typing in IPv6 unicast routing. And then we can enable our routing protocols. So next, we go to each interface we want to enable RIP on. So first, we'll go to interface serial 00. We simply type IPv6 RIP, and then we need to give it a process name. The, the, the RIP process, and we can run multiple, uh, multiple processes on this router. Um, we don't use number. We will use actually a name, and you can name it pretty much anything you want. For simplicity's sake, we'll just say our process name is routing RIP. IPv6 RIP, routing RIP, enable. So we've enabled it on interface serial 00. We will go ahead and do it on loopback one as well, inserting it into the same RIP process. Now RIP is still not running on this router until we enable it globally. And we do that via IPv6 router RIP, and then the process name, which we have chosen as routing RIP. Now we will verify that it is running on router 2. So IPv6 protocols, there it is. And you see the interfaces as well that are inserted into the RIP process. Now, that being said, we're not learning any routes uh, because we are not, um, we've not established any neighbor because we haven't learned any routes from any other IPv6 RIP routers. So on router 4, we're going to go ahead and assign IP addresses to the appropriate interfaces. This on serial 01 is the point to point. So we will end this IP address with a dot two, sharing the same subnet. And then we will insert loopback one into RIP ultimately. And we're gonna go ahead and assign it 2018. So it's different than router two. Router two's IP address was 2017. 
And then we're going to go ahead and enable RIP on this router. And again, we need to enable unicast routing for version 6. <coughs> we need to insert the interfaces into the RIP process. And again, we'll use routing RIP as our process ID. And here we've enabled it. And let's do the same on loopback1. And it's as simple as typing up arrow now. And then finally, we will enable it globally. And now you will see when we do show IPv6 protocols that it's enabled on router 4. And now we can take a look at IPv6 RIP. And this shows what interfaces is, are participating, the administrative distance, and update intervals. And here's our routing table. So we are learning the route from router 2 which begins in 2017. So that is actively being advertised via RIP. And so we have version six, that is RIP next generation up and running between router two and router four. It's rather straightforward. And on router two, you will see the loopback from router six in his routing table as well. So pretty straightforward. Next, let's talk about EIGRP. Cisco originally created EIGRP to advertise routes for IP version 4, IPX, and Apple Talk. This original EIGRP architecture easily allowed for yet another layer 3 protocol, IP version 6, to be added. As a result, Cisco did not have to change EIGRP significantly to support version 6, so there are many similarities that exist between version 4 and version 6 versions of EIGRP. That being said, there are some differences, and I've listed what you really need to know for the CCMP route exam. So let's go ahead and enable EIGRP between router 2 and router 4. So we already have IPv6 up and running. Let's go ahead under interface serial 00, enable EIGRP. IPv6 EIGRP, we're going to use the process ID of 10. And under loopback1, we will also use the process ID of 10. And then, very simply, we just need to enable EIGRP globally. And we do that via IP version 6, router EIGRP, process ID 10. And again, we have to do a no shut. And if we look now, we, under IPv6 protocols, we can see EIGRP is running and the interfaces that are participating. Pretty straightforward. But again, there's no communication with any EIGRP neighbors. So let's go ahead and you'll see here the topology table for router 2, which just shows the local routes. But again, this idea of successor and feasible successor should look familiar to you as it is in IP version 4. So now on router 4, we are also going to go ahead and enable IP or EIGRP. And again, we're going to use EIGRP process ID 10, enable it under each interface that we would like to participate, and then enable it globally. Once we do that, the neighbor relationship between router 2 and router 4 will come up over this point to point link. And we will see our neighbor right here. So again, you can see we have hold time, up time, looks, looks very familiar to IP version 4. Uh, it should look very familiar. So in many ways, we're kind of slaying the beast. Once you get your hands on IPv6, it actually begins to look pretty familiar. Let's look at our topology table and we will see what we've learned, not only locally, but from our neighbor.
And then finally, let's take a look at our EIGRP routes. And there is the loopback from router two, which we are learning on router four via EIGRP. Again, pretty straightforward. Now regarding OSPF, in order to support IP version six, an IETF working group took the OSPF version two standard and made changes to the protocol to support version six, resulting in the new protocol named OSPF version three. To migrate to IPv6, routers run OSPF version 2 for v4 support and version 3 for IPv6 support. Finally, let's go ahead and enable OSPF between router 2 and router 4. So on router 2, again, we're using serial 00 and loopback 1. We're going to place loopback 1 in a different area than serial 00, though. So in interface serial 00, we're going to make that area 0. So IPv6 process ID 10, we're going to insert it into area 0. And loopback 1, we're going to insert into area 24. So this is not done like IP version 4, obviously. There's a pretty big difference here. You're enabling it under the interface itself. Now we do need to enable OSPF globally still though. It, it may not be identical to version 4, but it does need to be enabled globally. So we do that by IPv6 router OSPF, the process ID, and that is it. Now let's go ahead and enable it on router 4 as well. And we're going to do the same. It will be for serial 01 and loopback 1. So again, under both interfaces, we enable OSPF via the IPv6 OSPF process ID. We're going to insert the point-to-point -point interface in area 0. And the loopback interface will assign to a different area, which is will create area 34. And then we enable OSPF globally. Again, process ID 10. And let's go ahead and take a look at our OSPF routes. And there we have learned via OSPF the loop back from router 2. We can look at our OSPF neighbors. There is router 2 as our neighbor. Again, this should look pretty familiar to a version 4. Uh, version 6 OSPF support It does not look all that different than version 4. And here you see the LSAs. You can see the similarities between OSPF version 2 and version 3. There's quite a few of them. And understanding the concepts of version 4 will certainly help you in understanding how version 6 works. So here's what you've learned. You've had an overview of each of the version six routing protocols that you'll need to know for the exam. And then you've seen actually how to enable them in the lab. I wish you the best of luck in your studies. Thank you. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about security threats and risks. Security is a large portion of the CCDA exam, so you'll need to know everything in this video. It is important to be aware of the different types of attacks that can impact your systems on the network. Security threats can be classified into three categories. Reconnaissance, gaining unauthorized access, and denial of service. The goal of reconnaissance, reconnaissance is to gather as much information as possible about the target network. Gaining unauthorized access obviously refers to the act of actually attacking or exploiting the network or host. And then denial of service these aim to overwhelm the resources on the network such as memory, CPU, 
and bandwidth and thus impact the target system and affect the devices on the network negatively. Reconnaissance network tools are used to gather information from hosts attached to the network. And they have many capabilities. They can determine the operating system, identify file permissions, uh, trust relationships, and user permissions as well. Here are some of the popular scanning tools that are used. Kismet is an 802.11 wireless sniffer and IDS system, and it can collect traffic from any 802.11 network. It does this by detecting wireless networks even when they are hidden, and then it can collect packets from those networks. NetStumbler is another wireless network scanner, and it can discover and scan networks even if the SSID is not being broadcast. And then arguably the most popular is NMAP or Network Mapper. And it's designed to scan large networks or it can actually be used to scan a single host. It's an open source utility and it's used for network exploration and security audits. Now there are different types of scanners such as vulnerability scanners and they determine the potential exposures that are present in the network. Here are some of the more popular tools used for vulnerability scanning. SAINT, which is Security Administrator's Integrated Network Tool, is a vulnerability assessment application. MBSA, Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer, is used to scan systems and identify whether patches are missing from Windows products. And Nessus is designed to automate testing and discovery of known vulnerabilities. It's an open source tool that runs on a variety of operating systems. Next, let's discuss unauthorized access. Hackers use several techniques to gain system access. One approach is when unauthorized people use usernames and passwords to escalate the account's privilege levels. Some system user accounts have default administrative username and password pairings that are common knowledge. In some environments, there are passwords that are well known, and I'll give you one example. Uh, I was at a large uh, Fortune 500 company, and we did a security audit, and we ran a password scanning tool, and we found over 50% of the passwords were easily cracked within minutes because those passwords were set to the name of the company. Obviously, it would be rather easy to gain access to whatever system you would like if half the company is using the same password, which can be easily guessed. Needless to say, they fixed that problem with better security policies. But unauthorized access isn't just about setting the appropriate password. It can also be obtained through the use of social engineering. Actually, most confidential information, such as badges and usernames and passwords, can be uncovered simply by walking around an organization. In addition to social engineering, hackers can obtain account information by using password cracking utilities or capturing network traffic. These automated software tools are very powerful, and as long as you have network access in any way, they can easily be run, and you can easily obtain the information you need if security is not properly implemented. Next, let's talk about security risks. To protect network resources, processes, and procedures, technology needs to address several security risks. Important network characteristics that can be at risk from security threats include data confidentiality, data integrity, and system availability. Let's talk about that now. Data confidentiality should ensure that only legitimate users can view sensitive information. Data integrity 
should ensure that only authorized users can change critical information. And system availability should ensure uninterrupted access to critical network and computing resources. In addition, the use of redundant hardware and encryption can significantly reduce the risks associated with all these three, system availability, data integrity, and data confidentiality. Next, let's discuss targets. Given the wide range of threats, just about anything on the network is vulnerable and is a potential target. Individual hosts are usually the number one thing that hackers are looking to access, but they're especially susceptible to worms and viruses. Other high value targets include devices that support the network. So obviously this would be routers and switches, possibly even firewalls. DHCP servers and DNS servers certainly, and management stations such as SNMP or even IP phones. Next, let's talk about loss of availability or denial of service. DOS attacks try to block or deny access to impact the availability of network services. Here are some common failure points due to DDoS attacks. A network device, a host, or an application fails to process large amounts of data sent to it that then crashes or breaks communication ability for that device. A host or application is unable to handle an unexpected condition that was sent to it and therefore there's resource depletion or failure. And nearly all DOS attacks are carried out with spoofing or flooding methods. Now that being said, Cisco provides you many tools to deal with this. And here they are for you now. DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, unicast reverse path forwarding, access control lists, and rate limiting. If you study this chart and know it well, you will most certainly be prepared for the CCDA exam when it comes to how to manage against denial of service attacks. When attackers change sensitive data without authorization, it's called an integrity violation. So for example, an attacker might access financial data, change it, or delete it. It's important to use restrictive access controls to prevent integrity violations and confidentiality attacks. And here are some ways you can enforce access control and reduce risks. You can separate networks using VLANs and packet filtering firewalls, restrict access with operating system based controls, limit user access by using user profiles, and then use encryption techniques to store your data. The security policies an organization employs use what are called risk assessments and cost benefit analysis to reduce security risks. The following figure shows the three components of risk assessment. Control refers to how do you use the security policy to minimize potential risks. Severity describes the level of the risk to the organization. And probability is the likeness that an attack against the assets will occur. A risk assessment should explain what assets to secure, the value of those assets, the loss that would result from an attack, the severity and probability of an attack against the assets, and how to use a security policy to minimize the risks of the attack. In many cases, security costs can be justified by describing the loss of productivity or revenue that could occur during security incidents. A risk index is used to consider the risks of potential threats. The risk index is based on the risk assessment components, which are severity of loss if the asset is compromised, probability of the risk actually occurring, and ability to control and manage the risk. One approach to determining a risk index is to give each risk factor a value from one to three, one being the lowest risk and three being the highest, so, for example, a high severity risk would have a substantial impact 
on the users or the organization. Medium severity risks would have an effect on a single department, and low severity risks would have limited impact. The risk index is calculated by multiplying the severity times the probability factor, and then dividing by the control factor. The following is an example of a risk index calculation for a typical large corporation. So here's what you've learned. You've received a really good introduction to security, and I know there's a lot in this video actually, but yes, it is just an introduction still. You've learned about network attacks, reconnaissance scanners, vulnerability software, secu security risks and targets, denial of service, uh, preventing breaches, and performing risk assessments. All of these um, were basic introductions, but at the level you will need for your CCDA exam, uh, there again is plenty to learn after this, but this lays a solid foundation for you moving forward in your studies. Good luck. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering security policy and process. In this video, you're going to learn about network security elements, and then we're going to dig a deep dive into security policies, including their purpose, the development of security policies, and the security policy lifecycle. So let's begin. To provide the proper levels of security, and increased network availability, a policy, a security policy, is a crucial element in providing secure network services. It's an important concept to understand, not just for the CCDA exam, but to function in today's environments where security is so crucial. Business requirements and risk analysis are used in the development of security policy, and it is often a balance between ease of access versus the security risk and cost of implementing the security technology when making decisions. In terms of network security in the system life cycle, the business needs are a key area to consider. These needs define what the business wants to do with the network. Risk analysis is another part of the system life cycle which explains the risks and their costs. So business needs and risk assessment feed information to formulate the security policy. The security policy describes the organization's processes, procedures, guidelines, and standards. Finally, an organization's security team needs to have the processes and procedures defined. This information helps explain what needs to happen for incident response, security monitoring, maintenance, and compliance. As you can see here, the consideration is prefaced with a question, and then you can see what aspect of security preparation and policies and procedures can deal with that consideration. It's key that you memorize this chart for the CCDA exam. RFC 2196 says, a security policy is a formal statement of the rules by which people who are given access to an organization's technology and information assets must abide. So when you are developing security policies for an organization, RFC 2196 can serve as a guide for developing security processes and procedures. The basic approach of creating a security policy is to identify what you are trying to protect, determine what you're trying to protect it from, determine how likely the threats are, implement measures that protect your assets in a cost-effective manner, and then review the process continuously and make improvements each time a weakness is found. One of the main purposes of a security policy is to describe the roles and requirements for securing technology and information assets. The policy defines the ways in which these requirements will be met. There are two main reasons for having a security policy. First, it provides the framework for the security implementation, and then it creates a security baseline of the current security posture. 
Here are some questions you might ask when developing a security policy. What data and assets will be included in the policy? What network communication is permitted between hosts? How will policies be implemented? And how will the latest attacks impact your network and security systems? A security policy is divided into smaller parts that help describe the overall risk management policy, identification of assets, and where security should be applied. There are other documents which concentrate on specific areas of risk management. The acceptable use policy. This document defines the roles and responsibilities within risk management. Network access control policy. Defines access control principles used in the network and how data is classified. Security management policy explains how to manage the security infrastructure. And then incident handling policy defines the processes and procedures for managing security incidents. If you look at this chart and memorize it, uh, you'll do excellent on this portion of your CCDA exam. As requirements change and new technology is developed, the network security policy needs to be updated to reflect those changes. So here are some steps that are used to facilitate the continuing efforts in the maintenance of security policies. Secure, monitor, test, and improve. Secure means identification, authentication, ACLs, VPNs. Monitor, intrusion, and content-based detection and response. Test is assessment, vulnerability scanning, and security auditing. And improve is for data analysis reporting and intelligent network security. Today's network designs demonstrate an increased use of security mechanisms and have become more tightly integrated with network design. Trust and identity management is a part of the safe security reference architecture and is crucial for the development of a secure network design. This management of trust and identity defines who and what can access the network, when, where, and how that access can occur. If you take a look at the following diagram, it shows the main three components of trust and identity, identity management are trust, identity, and access control. So let's talk about each of these three. Trust is the relationship between two or more network entities that are permitted to communicate. Domains of trust are a way to group network systems that share a common policy or function. Network segments have different trust values depending on the resources they are securing. Therefore, domains of trust can be applied. These types of security controls can be applied to network segments as it is important to consider the trust relationships between segments. Here's an example of domains of trust. You have your internet, um, internet access edge, and then your DMZ, and then your internal network. Each of those are separate domains. Obviously, on the internal network, you just want the appropriate internal users. In the DMZ, you're allowing a blending of the two. And on the internet, obviously, you just are expecting for there only to be exterior users on that portion of the network. So how you apply security will greatly depend on the domain of trust you are trying to protect. Identity is the who of a trust relationship. These can be users, devices, or organizations, or, or a combination of all of the above. Network entities are validated by credentials, and authentication of the identity is based on the following attributes. Something the subject knows, such as a password. Something the subject has, such as a possession. And something the subject is, such as a human characteristic, fingerprint, retina scan, etc. The first two are the most likely and the most popular ways of securing something you know and something you have with you. Most companies are now expecting two-factor authentication. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about network security elements, and then we dug into the security policies in detail, at least enough for you to know for your CCDA exam. Uh, digging into the purpose, development, and life cycle of security policies. If you know what's in this video, I'm confident you'll do well in this portion of the CCDA. Good luck in your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about Cisco Safe. Specifically, we're going to do an overview of Cisco Safe, and then we will talk about securing the individual modules of the Enterprise Campus. So let's begin. The Cisco Safe, or Security Architecture for the Enterprise, blueprint provides to network and security designers guidelines for implementing security mechanisms for the Cisco campus design. The SAFE blueprint follows the enterprise composite network modular approach presented throughout this entire video series. All of the SAFE strategies are applied to each module and component of the enterprise architecture model's design. From a network design standpoint, the SAFE blueprint is a security architecture that covers the following aspects attack mitigation policy, enterprise-wide deployment, secure reporting and management, authentication and authorization, IDS, and ongoing support for emerging technology. The policy for attack mitigation ensures that possible attacks and threats to the organization can be identified and defines the countermeasures that will be used against those attacks. The SAFE blueprint is usually applied in an enterprise-wide deployment, not just to an isolated component. It also provides methods and mechanisms for ensuring that the reporting, management, and auditing are accomplished in a secure fashion. It includes secure authentication and authorization with strong encryption and digital signing techniques, including public key infrastructure, PKI. It also includes intrusion detection services, for critical resources and networks. The SAFE Blueprint provides ongoing support from Cisco for all the emerging technologies it provides. The SAFE Blueprint allows you to apply a systematic approach to security from a modular standpoint. Risk at the internet connectivity block would include the following. Reconnaissance tools, port scanning tools, IP mapping tools, mail relay, distributed denial of service, and malware, including malicious code, viruses, Trojan horses, and worms. In order to secure the internet connectivity block, the SAFE Blueprint recommends the use of firewalls, router access lists, and network IDS to mitigate the risks presented already. You should also consider hardening the network devices and servers in that particular block. You can also build DMZ networks, to isolate specific devices from the network infrastructure. For many organizations, the e-commerce block may get its internet connectivity through the internet connectivity block, or it may have its own connections to an ISP. Regardless of this aspect, the risks and guidelines for the e-commerce block are very similar to the internet con connectivity block recommendations. According to the Safe Blueprint, in this block you should protect high-profile e-commerce servers as this is where you will also encounter the defacing of web services technique. The e-commerce block is also vulnerable to denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks. Countermeasures in the e-commerce block involve using access lists, filtering, and firewalls that protect the database, applications, or transaction servers. The servers should be hardened by using only the necessary applications and ports. Ensure that the e-commerce applications are secure by frequently updating and patching them. Cisco IDS should also be used, and the e-commerce block should be placed into a dedicated DMZ zone to isolate it from other blocks of the network. The VPN and remote access block is often connected through the internet connectivity block to various internet service providers, so you should use common techniques for securing it. However, because you will be using VPN technologies, some unique security mechanisms can be implemented. Because remote access and VPN networks often use the public internet or PSTN as their carrier, you should be aware of possible spoofing techniques that will allow an attacker to impersonate a legitimate client and get remote access or VPN access to the enterprise network. The network becomes vulnerable to spoofing if the attacker is able to steal credentials or guess the authentication key. 
In order to secure the remote access block, you should carefully implement VPN technologies using dedicated equipment, which includes advanced security mechanisms. You can use the IPsec protocol to assure proper authentication, authorization, and encryption, and IDS and firewall equipment can be used as well. In order to secure the WAM block, according to the Safe Blueprint, VPN techniques are used to ensure point-to-point -point secure connections. You should also use strong cryptography methods such as triple DES or AES to provide the confidentiality and integrity of the data packets. In addition, use authentication with all the WAN peers and harden the WAN routers to ensure that only the necessary protocols and ports are used. Additional security measures including using filtering techniques based on Cisco access lists and on network devices. The network management submodule must be secured and it's especially vulnerable to inside attacks. The written security policy should describe the procedures that apply to this submodule, and a best practice is using AAA services. These are usually based on RADIUS or TACX servers that will provide authentication. Other possible problems might involve administrator impersonation for individuals who might want to get administrative level privileges that will provide them access to all the other blocks in the Enterprise Campus module. In order to mitigate these threats, you should use strong encryption techniques and SSH instead of Telnet for remote administration. In the server farm block, the main goal is to protect the servers using strong and secure operating systems and applications. The servers should be periodically verified to ensure that they have all the proper updates and patches and that they are hardened. The server farm block can include firewall policies that will assure proper access control, as well as switch ACLs that will only allow certain traffic to flow at the data link layer. IDS should also be used in this block to ensure connectivity to other campus blocks. The access layer block is the place where the end hosts and the lower end access switches are located. In order to secure them, you should use HIDS HIDS technologies, in addition to the standard hardening techniques, which will only allow the necessary application, services, and ports to run. If the access layer block also includes complex IP telephony integration, special measures must be taken to secure the VoIP infrastructure. So here's what you've learned. You've received an overview of Cisco SAFE, and then you've learned about securing the individual modules of the enterprise campus. All this information you will definitely need to know for your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372. And in this video, you're going to learn about security management. Specifically, you're going to learn about security threats and risks, security targets, security policies, and then threat defense. So let's begin. The CCDA candidate must understand the reasons for network security, including the systematic approaches to managing security. Cisco invented a concept called self-defending network, which describes the network infrastructure and the services used in order for the network to respond to attacks. First, let's talk about security threats and risks. Efficient security mechanisms must address organizational threats and mitigate risks successfully. The network designer should create a secure environment for the organization by doing everything he can to prevent attacks, while ensuring that the security features have minimal effect on end user productivity. A network security implementation must mitigate multiple factors and accomplish the following. Block outside malicious users from getting access to the network. Allow only system hardware and application access to authorized users. Prevent attacks from being sourced internally support different levels of user access using an access control policy, 
and safeguard the data from being changed, modified, or stolen. The next thing we will concern ourselves with are the targets. What are the targets on the network? And this helps you develop a good security policy and posture. Targets on the network include the following. Any kind of network infrastructure device, such as a switch, router, security appliance, or wireless access point. Network services, such as DNS, ICMP, DHCP. Endpoint devices, especially management stations that perform in-band or out-of-band management, and network bandwidth, which can be overwhelmed by denial of service attacks. The security policy is a small part of a larger network security system lifecycle that is driven by an assessment of the business needs and comprehensive risk analysis. Risk assessment may also need to be performed using penetration testing and vulnerability scanning tools. The security policy should contain written documents that include the following guidelines, processes, standards, acceptable use policies, architectures and infrastructure elements used, and then granular areas of security policy such as internet use policy or access control policy. The most important aspects covered by the written security policy and procedures are identifying the company's assets, determining how the organization's assets are used, defining communication roles and responsibilities, describing existing tools and processes, defining the security incident handling process, and then a steering committee will review and eventually publish this security policy after all the important documents have been finalized. Some of the best practices for protecting the network infrastructure through trust and identity include the following. Use AAA services with the Cisco ACS server. Use 802.1x port authentication. Logging using syslog and SDEE. This is a protocol used by Cisco IDS and IPS sensors to send information to the management stations. Using SSH instead of Telnet to avoid any management traffic crossing the, the network in clear text. Using secure versions of management protocols such as SNMP version 3, NTP version 3, and SFTP. Harden all network devices by making sure unnecessary services are disabled. Use authentication between devices that are running dynamic routing protocols. Use the Cisco one-step lockdown feature on network devices to harden them. Use ACLs to restrict management access, allowing only certain hosts to access the network devices. Use IPsec as an internal encryption method or external VPN solution. And then use Cisco Network Admission Control Solution, which ensures that network clients and servers are patched and updated in an automated and centralized fashion. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about security threats and risks, security targets, security policies, and threat defense. All of these you will need to understand, not only for your CCDA exam, but also to support your own network. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about traditional voice systems. Specifically, we're going to do an overview, and then we'll dig into a PBX, a telephony signaling, public switch telephone network numbering plan, and then PSTN services. So let's begin. The network designer's role in voice solutions is very important because, regardless of the infrastructure vendor, voice transport scenarios often suffer from poor planning and implementation. Most large organizations choose their voice architecture, including PSTN and PBX solutions, 
based on the financial stability of the manufacturer, the support level they offer, and the competitive pricing of the hardware, software, and maintenance components. Cisco is one of the main providers of emerging integrated voice and video solutions. When human voice is transported digitally over a network infrastructure, a process of analog to digital conversion takes place. The most common conversion mechanism is PCM, pulse code mod modulation. This is the process of digitizing analog voice signals as you see here. During the PCM process, the following things occur. Excess noise is filtered so the only basic human voice frequency is captured. A process called PAM or pulse amplitude modulation is used to sample the analog signal. The signal is digitized and transposed into a series of ones and zeros. This process includes quantizing the signal and companding, that is compressing and expanding the signal. PSTN and PBX are traditionally the main processes of providing voice services throughout the industry. PSTN is a network that provides residential telephony ser services, while PBX provides telephony services to users within an organization. PBXs are business phone systems that offer the following features. Call forwarding, call transferring, call parking, conference calls, music on hold, call history, and voicemail. Most PBXs are digital devices that are used in the private sector and are miniature versions of phone switches. They can scale to thousands of phones within a company. A downside of PBX technology for, from an administrator point of view is that it is generally difficult to configure and maintain and each vendor has a unique configuration process so special training is required when working with a new PBX solution. PBX systems also connect and link to remote offices and branch offices that include their own PBX systems. One of the advantages of using such a technology is that phone calls between the same business phone systems are free because the entire infrastructure is owned by the company. Call savings are also included from the fact that the company does not use the entire trunk to the PSTN. Usually the number of phones in an organization is much greater than the actual trunk size or the overall call volume to the PSTN. PSTN is composed of a group of digital devices used in the public sector offered by telecommunications companies. PSTN switches are used to connect residential telephones to business users. PSTNs generally use open standard protocols for control and transparent communication between telephones, circuits, switches, and PBX systems. PSTNs can even link to other PSTNs, PBX systems, or telephones. As in PBX systems, PSTNs aggregate T1 and E1 circuits but they can scale up to hundreds of thousands of phones. PSTNs connect business PBX systems using switches located in tele telecommunication companies' premises. The following figure is an example of an organization with multiple locations that use a voice system based on PBX and PSTN technologies. The headquarters location has a PBX that connects to the PSTN on the outside as well as many phones and fax machines inside the network. The connection between the local PBX and the PSTN can be based on one or more T1 or E1 lines. The internal network can support a greater number of phones than the number of phone calls supported by the T1 or E1 line. The reason for this is that not everyone will use the telephone at the same time and some of the phone calls will be between internal phones. The regional office location also uses a PBX system to connect to the PSTN and it aggregates a few user phones. The branch and remote offices do not use a PBX system because they use very few devices. 
which do not need special features and they can connect directly to a PSTN switch. The branch and home office users can have phone conversations with users at the headquarters or regional offices because they are all connected to the PSTN. If the headquarters or the regional office were located on the same campus, the PBX systems could have been connected directly through a PBX tie trunk without any link to the PSTN. The connections from the internal phones to the local PBX system are also called station lines. The connection that connects the PSTN switches is called a PSTN switch trunk. Voice systems also use different kinds of signaling between system nodes, such as the following. Signaling between the internal phones and the PBX. Signaling between the PBX and the PB PSTN switch signaling between PSTN switches, and signaling between PBX systems. Trunks generally use a special type of signaling called Common Channel Signaling, CCS, that can be divided into the following types of signaling. E1 signaling, DPNSS signaling, ISDN signaling, QSIG signaling, and SS7 signaling. The way PSTNs use their numbering plans defines the fundamental basis for routing voice calls through the PSTN switch matrix. The North American numbering plan is also known as NANP or the 1 plus 10 plan. The format for this numbering plan is as follows, where N is any number between 2 and 9 and X is any number between 0 and 9. The number is split into the following three parts. The first group of numbers represents the area code. The second group of numbers represents the prefix. And the final four digits re represent the line number. The way phone numbers are represented determines the way they are routed across the PSTN. And this is similar to the IP address representation scheme that determines IP routing mechanisms. PSTN offers a wide variety of services to organizations. The most important services are as follows. Call center services, which represent a combination of automated systems and individuals that take inbound calls for a wide variety of customer service needs. Centrex solutions, these are specialized business solutions that can be outsourced to different organizations that cannot afford investing in their own solution. Virtual private voice networks, PSTN emulate, emulates PBX to PBX connections in order to form a private network of PBX systems. Interactive voice response, this technique allows automatic response schemes to be applied when, customer, when customers call special numbers. And finally, voicemail. Voicemail systems allow callers to record voice messages. So here's what you've learned. You've received an overview of traditional voice systems. You've dug into detail about the importance of PBX and how it works. We talked about telephony signaling and then the public switch telephone network numbering plan and services. All of this information will be very helpful for you in your CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video, you are going to learn about integrated voice and telephony systems for the CCDA exam. So obviously, we will focus in on the design aspect of video and voice. We will specifically look at the deployment models, and then VoIP control and transport protocols, and then finally, because it's likely you will be asked, we will cover H323 protocols. So let's begin. Network designers must be aware of the following IP telephony deployment models. Single site design, multi-site centralized WAN call processing design, 
multi-site distributed WAN call processing design, internet IP telephony design, and call manager express deployment. The single site deployment model is used by enterprises that own a single large building or a campus area with no voice technologies being transported on the WAN links. A single call manager node is deployed at the enterprise campus server farm block. The main component of a single site IP telephony solution is the call manager node. This is actually a server platform that can be installed on a wide variety of hardware devices. The Cisco IP telephony application server is a high availability server platform purchased by the company to be used as a platform for the Cisco call manager solution. Cisco offers a compatibility matrix that helps customers choose the appropriate hardware platform that will be used with call manager implementation. The call manager application system brings enterprise telephony functionality and offers advanced features to various telephony devices such as IP telephones, media processing devices, and voice over IP gateways. Other components of the single site IP telephony design are IP telephones and switches that have inline power functionality, power over Ethernet, used to power the IP phones. Voice enabled routers are also present in the design and they are usually located in the same physical location with all the other devices presented previously. Next, let's talk about multi-site centralized design. Centralized IP telephony is a low-cost design for medium-sized enterprises that have one large location and multiple remote sites. The central location hosts the Cisco Communications Manager server in all the important applications. The remote locations host only voice switches and IP telephones. This design allows remote site IP telephony functionality to be controlled from a central location without the need for a dedicated call manager at each location. All the features are managed from the centralized site. The call manager node is deployed only at the central location and includes a multi-server cluster redundant architecture. The remote site IP phones register with the call manager from the main site. The PSTN connection is also hosted by the central site and the voice enabled router is connected through the WAN to each remote location. The remote site office uses IP connectivity to connect to the central site through the WAN connection and to access all the IP telephony services. Since the IP phones convert voice to IP, the remote site router does not have to include any special capability. However, the router located in the central location must be a voice enabled router because it also connects to the PSTN. Remote sites may use voice enabled gateway routers with survivable remote site telephony functionality that allows them to function even if the connection to the central site is down. Next, let's talk about multi-site distributed design. The multi-site distributed architecture is a solution used by large enterprises that have several large locations. This design involves deploying several call manager clusters for redundancy, which can include one cluster per site or several clusters only in the large sites. Intercluster trunks are configured to establish communications between call manager nodes. This deployment model is similar to the multi-site centralized deployment type with IP phones and voice enabled switches installed at every site. This solution is very flexible and allows voice application services to be deployed in a single location or in every location that has a call manager cluster. Internet IP telephony is another design type commonly used and it involves connecting the central and remote sites through an ISP. This ensures end-to-end -end IP telephony across all sites. In addition, there is no PSTN connection at any of the enterprise sites. The central site still hosts the call manager node and application servers, but regular routers are used in all network locations because of the lack of connectivity to the PSTN. All the inter-site links are plain IP connections. Another difference from the centralized IP telephony design 
is that all the enterprise sites have their own call manager node. For proper voice traffic to cross between sites, the ISP must ensure a proper connection with low latency and delay. This can be enforced through a strict SLA when signing the Internet Connectivity contract. The Call Manager Express deployment provides companies with the Express version of Cisco Call Manager, Unity, and Contact Center solutions. Call Manager Express and Cisco Unity Express can be installed on routers to provide limited functionalities of the communications manager solution. PSTN connectivity can be offered by a dedicated gateway router or by the CME router to further reduce costs. Cisco Call Manager Express supports a limited number of users as opposed to the enterprise level solution that can scale up to tens of thousands of users. This is a lower cost solution for small branch offices. Network designers should understand the protocols that are used for VoIP control and transport. The most important protocols are DHCP, which is used to establish IP configuration parameters for IP phones, DNS, which obtains IP addresses for the TFTP servers that will provide the configuration files, TFTP, SCCP, which is the skinny call control protocol used for call establishment, RTP, which is used for voice stream or voice station to station traffic and ongoing calls, RTCP, which is used for VoIP call control, MGCP, which is used for call establishment with gateways, H323, which is another call establishment protocol, and SIP, which is session initiation protocol, which is an alternative multimedia framework to H323. Now, referring to H323, that is implemented in terminals such as IP phones, workstations with soft phones installed, gateways, gatekeepers, and other conferencing software. The H323 standard uses the following protocols to ensure its functionality. Q931 for call setup, H225 for signaling, H245 for control, and H255 for registration, admission, and status. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about the deployment models for voice and video, and then VoIP control and transport protocols, and then finally H323 protocols. All of these are fair game on the CCDA exam. And if you know this video well, I'm sure you'll do very well on this portion of the exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about integrated video systems. Specifically, we're going to do an overview of multimedia traffic design, then we'll talk about video formats, and then finally video design considerations and challenges you may face, but certainly all of this information you'll need to know for your CCDA exam. So let's begin. Video traffic has the same requirements and design consideration as voice traffic. Voice and video applications can be grouped in the multimedia traffic category, and in many cases they should be treated similarly by network devices. This involves ensuring the necessary bandwidth and providing low delay, jitter, and packet loss. Media applications underwent a significant development process regarding IP networks resulting in many different combinations of audio, video, and data media. Video streams can range from low-definition webcams to high-definition enterprise-level video conferencing systems. As demand for quality video increases, network infrastructure requirements must also increase. Companies might have another source of media streams on their network in the form of unmanaged 
not business critical applications. In response to the explosion of media content and applications, network designers must revise their media application provisioning strategy. Without a properly selected strategy, the network infrastructure might not support all the multimedia traffic that is demanded by users, and the network could easily become congested. Common high-resolution video formats include 720i, 720p, 1080i, and 1080p. The numerical value of the format represents the number of rows in the frame. High-definition video uses a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which results in 1,920 columns. The most common video formats and typical bandwidth usages are summarized here. And you would do well to pause the video at this point and study this, make sure you memorize it for your CCDA exam. Now we, we reviewed at a high level how video impacts the network, but let's get a little bit more granular so you can understand how it specifically applies to network design. And to do that, we need to get a bit more granular on the technical details of video and what you need to take in account when designing for video. There are three types of video solutions, H323, Cisco Unified Video Advantage, and Cisco Telepresence. With H323, multiple third parties offer H323 video conferencing systems which can be used to set up a video conference over an IP or ISDN network. The Cisco Unified Video Advantage product uses a PC, video camera, and a Cisco IP phone as a video conferencing station. Now when a voice call is placed between two users running the Cisco Unified Video Advantage product, a video call can automatically be started with a video appearing on each user's PC. Finally, the Cisco Telepresence, this solution uses CD quality audio and high definition video displayed on large monitors to create lifelike video conferences. Now, due to the bandwidth intensive and latency sensitive nature of video, consider the following when designing or troubleshooting a video network. Like voice, video packets need to be allocated an appropriate amount of bandwidth and treated with high priority. The following are QoS metrics that Cisco recommends for various types of video applications. One-way delay should be between 150 millisecond and 500 millisecond maximum. Now please note for Cisco Telepresence it should be closer to 150 milliseconds maximum. Uh, Cisco Unified Video Advantage can be around 200 milliseconds and video surveillance can be up to 500 millisecond maximum. Now regardless for jitter and packet loss, regardless of whether or not it's Cisco Unified Video Advantage, Cisco Telepresence, or video surveillance, all three platforms should be no greater than 10 millisecond maximum regard with regards to jitter and 0.05% maximum packet loss. Now if you're going to design for video, you're going to have to understand the basics of multicast. The complete multicast topic itself is beyond the scope of this video, but certain things you simply will need to know for the exam and you can count on the fact that you're going to need to understand that there are three versions of IGMP. However, only two versions are in wide-scale wide deployment. First is IGMP version 1. When a PC wants to join a multicast group, it sends an IGMP report message to the router, letting the router know that it wants to receive traffic for a specific group. Now, every 60 seconds by default, the router sends an IGMP query message to determine if the PC still wants to belong to the group. There can be up to three, a three minute delay before the time the router realizes that the receiver has left the group. The destination address of this router query is 224.0.0.1, which addresses all IP multicast hosts. 
Now there is also IGMP version two. Version two is similar to version one, except that version two can send queries to a specific group and a leave message is supported. Specifically, a receiver can proactively send a leave message when it no longer wants to participate in a multicast group, allowing the router to prune its interface earlier. In an environment with a version two router and a mixture of version one and version two receivers, the version one receivers respond normally to version one or version two. However, a version two router must ignore any leave message while version one receivers are present because if the router processed the version two leave message, it would send a group specific query, which would not be correctly interpreted by a version one receiver. If you're going to effectively troubleshoot video, you need to understand the concept of distribution trees. To combat the issue of receiving duplicate packets, Cisco routers perform a reverse path forwarding check to determine if a multicast packet is entering a router on the appropriate interface. An RPF check examines the source address of an incoming packet and checks it against the router's unicast routing table to see what interface should be used to get back to the source network. If the incoming multicast packet is using that interface, the RPF check passes and the packet is forwarded. If the multicast packet is coming in on a different interface, the RPF check fails and the packet is discarded. Multicast traffic flows from a source to a destination over a distribution tree, which is a loop-free path. Now there are two types of distribution trees. A source distribution tree, this creates an optimal path between each source router and each last hop router. And then there's a shared distribution tree. This creates a tree from a central rendezvous point, or RP, to all last hop routers. Now please note, Cisco routers can use the Protocol Independent Multicast Protocol, or PIM, to construct IP multicast distribution trees. PIM's protocol independence means that it can run over any IP network, regardless of the underlying unicast routing protocol. So here's what you've learned. You received an overview of multimedia traffic design. We talked about the unique video formats and then design considerations you need to take into account whether preparing for the CCDA exam or actually designing video for your own network. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to receive an introduction to wireless LANs. Specifically, we're going to do an overview of wireless LANs, talk about wireless LAN components. We'll talk about the 802.11 standard in the OSI model, how it fits in the OSI model. Then max sublayer coordination, how that applies to wireless, 802.11 frame types, and finally, wireless LAN standards. So wireless LANs provide network connectivity almost anywhere. Surely you use wireless LANs. If, if you're in technology, surely you're using them, whether it's your mobile phone or your laptop, whether you're at a coffee shop or at your place of business doing BYOD. Wireless LANs typically can be implemented at much less cost than traditional wired LANs. The wired infrastructure is, of course, based on the 802.3 standards, but a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and, con and to connect devices. So as you surely know, a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and connect devices. Wireless LANs are defined by the 802.11 standards. Now, some additional advantages of wireless LANs over wired LANs include the following. Monetary cost, uh, flexibility, uh, that you allow users to roam in places where they normally cannot or uh, use their devices in places they always wish they could. Load distribution and finally redundancy. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but using these wireless access points, um, multiple wireless access points, 
in one area can provide redundancy and load distribution at a much more affordable cost than wired LANs. Now, there are, there are certain components that make up wireless LANs, and let's start with the client, uh, specifically you or any of our customers. Uh, clients are basically an appliance that interfaces with the wireless medium. Now, again, that could be a mobile device, it could be a laptop, it could be a tablet, it could be a PC, but it's basically a device that operates as an end user device. An access point functions as a bridge, basically, between the endpoints and the existing network backbone. So the access point is what the endpoints are actually communicating with. And as they roam, they may change access points throughout the building, but the access points are actually what are getting them access to the network. As you can see in this picture, access points come in many different shapes and sizes. These are just a few examples of access points. The distribution system plays a key role in communications between the customer who's trying to get on the wireless network and the major wireless LAN components that are actually switching routing the traffic. The distribution system allows for the interconnection of the APs of multiple cells. Think of your organization. If you have one area that's considered a lab and it's a wireless lab, and that ultimately needs to communicate with marketing on the eighth floor, there's, you're going to need a distribution system to communicate between those two locations. The wireless distribution system allows you to connect multiple access points. So with wireless distribution systems, APs can communicate with one another without wires in a standardized way. Now that being said, distribution could be wired or integrated. But this capability of communications between access points is absolutely critical in providing a seamless experience for roaming clients and for managing multiple wireless networks. It can also simplify the network infrastructure by reducing the amount of cabling required. Another concept you need to understand is the basic service set. The wireless architecture divides the system into cells, referred to as basic service set and it's controlled by a base station or more commonly an access point. Now an extended service set is a set of connected BSSs. And then there's the independent basic service set, which is a wireless network consisting of at least two endpoints and no distribution system. So let's draw this out so we can get a better understanding of what we learned thus far. So. In any wireless implementation, you're going to have endpoints that need to connect. So for example, here's a laptop that is connecting to the wireless network. It connects to the wireless network through an access point. The access point is sending out the radio waves which are being received by the laptop. The laptop endpoint then connects onto the wireless network assuming it has the proper security configurations, and it can then reach the network. Now, access points can communicate not only with laptops, but again, mobile phones. And you can think of this as a basic service set. Now, let's say in a different area, we have another access point, which is also serving customers or users. And this again could be a server, it could be a workstation, could be a printer. But regardless, it's servicing endpoints. It's a different implementation, different part of the building or a different building altogether, but this is another basic service set. So how do these two basic service sets communicate? Well, they use, as you, as you have already learned, they use a distribution system. These two DSs can uplink in many ways via wireless, or in this case that we're looking, here's a wired connection. This is the distribution system that is allowing these two separate wireless implementations or basic service sets 
to communicate. Now, if we look at the big picture, both of these basic service sets and the distribution system, the big picture, this is the extended service set. This includes all of the wireless equipment and any equipment used to connect the wireless equipment together. The IEEE 802 standards define two separate layers for the data link of the OSI model. As you know, then these two layers are the LLC and the MAC sublayers. The 802.11 standards cover the operation of the MAC sublayer and the physical layer. The 802.11 frame consists of a 32 byte MAC header, variable length, and a frame check sequence. There are two types of coordinated functions used to ensure collision free access on a wireless network. First, distributed coordinated fun coordination function. The MAC sublayer technique employs the well-known CSMACA to avoid collisions. It's used to manage access to the radio frequency medium, and it's composed of the following two main components, interframe spaces and random back off. And then there's point coordination function, and the PCF is used by the AP to coordinate communications with the wireless network. The 802.11 standard uses three main types of frames. Control frames to control access to the medium, management frames to enable stations to establish and maintain communications, and then data frames sent by any endpoint. And they, these contain higher layer protocol information or data. Now there are many 802.11 standards, but you should definitely know of these and you probably already do know many of them. These standards have been rolled out over the years and you've been on many of these networks, um, whether it's in your home or at your local coffee shop or at work. The initial 802.11 standard was serviced up to two megabits per second. At this point, we're at the 802.11 N standard, which theoretically can provide up to 600 megabits per second of bandwidth. So here's what you've learned. You, we've, we've done a wireless LAN overview. We've talked about wireless LAN components and how the 802.11 standard works with the OSI model. We've talked about max sublayer coordination and how that applies to wireless, 802.11 frame types, and fi finally, wireless LAN standards. Good luck with your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about the Cisco Unified Wireless Solution. Specifically, you're going to learn about access points, lightweight access points and lightweight access point protocol, wireless LAN controllers, discussing both the modes that it operates in and the interface types, and then mobility groups. So plenty to cover, and let's begin. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network concept includes the following elements. Wireless clients, this includes laptops, workstations, etc. Access points, this provides access to the wireless network. Network management, this is accomplished through network wireless control system. It's a centralized management tool that allows for design and control of wireless networks. Network unification. The wireless LAN system needs to be able to support wireless applications by offering unified security policies, such as quality of service and RF management. So the, the WLCs, or wireless LAN controllers, offer this unified integration functionality. And then network services. Wireless network services are also referred to as mobility services and include guest access or voice services, location services, and even threat detection and mitigation. Standalone access points are also known as autonomous access points. They're obviously very easy to install, but the thing is they can be difficult to manage in large deployments. They're not as desirable as the lightweight access points 
from Cisco because they must be managed individually. In addition, different parameters must be configured manually on each device, including SSID, VLAN, and security features. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network introduced the concept of lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers, that's LWAPs and WLCs. These two types of wireless devices divide responsibilities and functionalities that an autonomous access point would normally perform on its own. This technology adds scalability by separating the wireless LAN data plane from the control plane into a split MAC design. Lightweight access points focus only on the actual RF transmissions and the necessary real-time control operations, such as beaconing, probing, and buffering. Now, wireless LAN controllers manage all non-real-time tasks, such as SSID management, VLAN management, um, access point association management, authentication, and quality of service. When using lightweight access points, all RF traffic they receive must first go to the wireless LAN controller device that manage this, manages the specific access point. This changes the way in which traditional wireless LAN communication works, even for hosts associated to the same access point. The RF communication between lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers is handled using the lightweight access point protocol. The lightweight access point tunnel can operate in either layer two or layer three mode. In layer two mode, the access point and wireless LAN controllers share the same VLAN, subnet, and functions with the lightweight access point, receiving 802.11 frames and encapsulating them inside Ethernet toward the wireless LAN controller. When the lightweight access point tunnel operates in layer three mode, the lightweight access point receives 802.11 frames and encapsulates them inside of UDP toward the wireless LAN controller. So this implies that the wireless LAN controller can be anywhere as long as it is reachable by the access point. The Cisco Lightweight Access Point Protocol can operate in the following six modes. Local mode, REAP or Remote Edge Access Point mode, Monitor, Road Detector mode, Sniffer mode, and Bridge mode. Every 180 seconds, the access point spends 60 milliseconds on channels on which it does not operate. During the 60 millisecond time period, the access point performs noise and interference measurements and scans for intrusion detection events. The REAP mode allows the lightweight access point to reside across a LAN link and still be able to communicate with the wireless LAN controller and provide the functionality of a regular lightweight access point. REAP mode is not supported on all lightweight access point models. Monitor mode is a special feature that allows lightweight access point enabled APs to exclude themselves from dealing with data traffic between clients. Instead, they act as dedicated sensors for location-based services, rogue AP detection, and for IDS. In RD mode, the lightweight access point monitors for rogue APs. The, ro the goal of this rogue detection of APs is to see all the VLANs in the network because rogue APs can be connected to any of those VLANs. Sniffer mode allows the lightweight access point to capture and forward all the packets on a particular channel to a remote machine that is running packet capturing software. And finally, bridge mode typically operates on outdoor APs that function in a mesh topology. This cost-effective high bandwidth wireless bridging connectivity mechanism includes point-to-point -point or multi-point bridging. Wireless LAN controllers have the following three components, wireless LAN, interfaces, and ports. The wireless LAN is the SSID network name. Every wireless LAN is assigned to an interface in the wireless LAN controller, and each wireless LAN is configured with policies for RF, QS, and other LAN attributes. The interfaces are logical connections that map to a VLAN on the wired network. Every interface is configured with a unique IP address, default gateway, and physical ports. Wireless LAN controllers support the following five interface types. The management interface, which is used for in-band management or connect connectivity to a AAA server. An optional service port interface for out-of-band management that is statically configured. The access point manager 
interface used for layer 3 discovery and association. Dynamic interfaces, these are the VLANs designated for wireless LAN client data. And virtual interfaces used for layer 3 security authentication, DHCP relay, and management of mobility features. One of the main features of a wireless LAN solution is the user's ability to access network resources from different areas. End users most likely move from one location to another, so designers should scale the wireless network carefully to allow for client roaming. Wireless roaming can be divided into the following two categories, intra-controller roaming or inter-controller roaming. Intra-controller roaming occurs when a client moves its association from one AP to another AP controlled by the same wireless LAN controller. Inter-controller roaming can operate in either layer two or layer three mode. In layer two, inner control roaming moves users from AP to AP and from WLC to WLC, but they remain in the same subnet. Layer three inner controller roaming is more difficult to implement because users can move from AP to AP and WLC to WLC from subnet to subnet as well. In this scenario, the wireless LAN controllers must be configured with mobility groups. Now, speaking of mobility groups, you may be tested on the following communication ports for mobility groups. The Lightweight Access Point Protocol Control, UDP 12223. Lightweight Access Point Protocol Data, UDP 12222. Wireless LAN Controller Exchange Unencrypted Messages, UDP 16666. And Wireless LAN Controller Exchange Encrypted Messages, 16667. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about access points, lightweight access points and lightweight access point protocol, wireless LAN controller modes and interface types as well as mobility groups. This gives you a good foundation for the wireless portion, at least for unified wireless solutions in your Cisco CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering wireless LAN design. We're first going to learn about redundancy and the importance of redundancy in wireless design. Then you'll learn about RF groups, and then we'll also talk about mesh design. So let's begin. Wireless LAN controllers can be configured for dynamic or deterministic redundancy. For deterministic redundancy, the AP is configured with a primary, secondary, and tertiary controller. This requires more upfront planning, but allows for better predictability and faster failover times. Deterministic redundancy is the recommended best practice. N plus 1, N plus N, and N plus N plus 1 are examples of deterministic redundancy. With N plus 1 redundancy, a single wireless LAN controller acts as the backup of multiple wireless LAN controllers. The backup WLC is configured as the secondary WLC on each AP. One design constraint is that the backup WLC might become oversubscribed if there are too many failures of the primary controllers. The secondary WLC is the backup controller for all APs and is normally placed in the data center. With N plus N redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. For example, a pair of WLCs on one floor serves as a backup to a second pair on another floor. The top WLC is primary for AP1 and AP2, and the secondary for AP3 and AP4. The bottom WLC is the primary for AP3 and AP4, and secondary for AP1 and AP2. There should be enough capacity on each controller to manage a failover situation. With M plus M plus 1 redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. Plus, a backup WLC is configured as the tertiary. M plus M plus 1 redundancy functions the same as M plus N redundancy, plus a tertiary controller that backs up the secondary controllers. 
The tertiary WLC is placed in the data center or network operations center. Here is a summary of wireless LAN controller redundancy. It would be good to memorize this in preparation for your exam. Next, let's talk about radio management and radio groups. The limit of available channels in the ISM frequencies used by IEEE 802.11b G and N standard presents challenges to the network designer. There are three non-overlapping channels, channels 1, 6, and 11. The recommended best practice is to limit the number of data devices connected to each AP to 20, or not more than seven concurrent voice over wireless LAN calls using G711. An RF group is a cluster of WLC devices that coordinate their RRM calculations. RF groups are formed with the following process. APs send out neighbor messages over the air. The message includes an encrypted shared secret that is configured on the WLC and pushed to each AP. APs sharing the same secret are able to validate messages from each other. The members in the RF group elect an RF group leader to maintain a master power and channel scheme for the RF group. Similar to performing an assessment for a wired network design, RF surveys are done to determine design parameters for wireless LANs and customer requirements. RF site surveys help determine the coverage areas and check for RF interference. This helps determine the appropriate placement of wireless APs. The RF site survey has the following steps. Define customer requirements such as service levels and support for VoIP. Determine devices to support. Obtain a facility diagram to identify the potential RF obstacles. Visually inspect the facility to look for potential barriers to the propagation of RF signals. Identify user areas that may be intensively used, such as conference rooms, and areas that are not heavily used, such as stairwells. Determine preliminary AP locations, which need power, wired network access, cell coverage, and overlap, not to mention channel selection, mounting locations, and antennas. Let's talk about wireless mesh for outdoor wireless. Traditionally, outdoor wireless solutions have been limited to point-to-point, point-to-multipoint -point bridging between buildings. With these solutions, each AP is wired to the network. The Cisco Wireless Mesh Networking Solution eliminates the need to wire each AP and allows users to roam from one area to another without having to reconnect. The wireless mesh components are shown here. The WCS, the WLC, the RAP and the MAP. The following are Cisco recommendations for mesh design. There is under 10 millisecond latency per hop, typically two to three millisecond. For outdoor deployment, four or fewer hops are recommended for best performance with a maximum of eight. For indoor deployment, one hop is supported. For best performance, 20 MAP nodes per wrap is recommended. Up to 32 maps is supported per wrap. Throughput, one hop, 14 megabits per second, two hops, seven megabits per second, three hops, three megabit, and four hops, one megabits per second. As you can see here, you have five primary design items, number of APs, placement of APs, power for APs, number of WLCs and placement of WLCs. The following points summarize wireless LAN design. An RF site survey is used to determine a wireless network's RF characteristics and AP placement. Outdoor wireless networks are supported using outdoor APs and Cisco wireless mesh networking APs. Campus wireless network design provides RF coverage for wireless clients in the campus using LWAPs. Each AP should be limited to 20 data devices and a data wireless LAN. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about wireless redundancy, RF groups, and mesh design. All are key points on the CCDA exam that you will need to know and be able to answer, not only on your exam, but of course if you support wireless in your own network. Good luck in your studies.